Grab your coats and protect yourself from the cold and choose your waifus. <laughs> Imagine if suddenly your city froze, the temperature dropped by 80 degrees Celsius, and over 90% of the world's population died frozen. After weeks of freezing, those who survived in their homes have water and electricity cut off. With nothing to eat and no way to stay warm, everyone starves. Our protagonist is the only one who prepared for the end of the world and has a comfortable life. And for those who can afford his price, he can provide a little food. His price is steep. <laughs> boy. But not everything started well. The truth is, in the year 2050, a star explosion caused Earth to enter an ice age. Zhang Yi worked at a Walmart warehouse and thus managed to stockpile a lot of food. In the apocalypse, the girl he liked broke into his house with a group of neighbors and stole Al his food. She admits she tricked him into opening the door. On his deathbed, Zhang Yi swore that if he could find her in hell, he would get his revenge. For some reason, he returns three months back in time before everything happened. Surprised, he swears not to be a sucker for the girl anymore, to take revenge on those who deserve it, and to see his neighbors suffer, and to enjoy it as well. There are three months left until the extreme cold arrives. His priority is to stockpile everything he needs before the end of the world and build a safe house. As he pondered how to start his plan, a bright light passes through his eyes, and, instead of blindness, he discovers he can send things to a different dimension, like a game inventory. His idea is to accumulate here an entire supermarket of food, so he never has to worry about food and drink for years. Thinking about all the good food he won't be able to eat in three months, Zhang Yi goes to a luxury restaurant to stuff himself, spends 50,000 Korean wons, and puts it all on his credit card because in three months Al his problems will be over. The girl Fang Yu Ching, whom he had been in love with for years and never got anywhere with, and who betrayed him in his past life, along with her friend, sees that he went to a luxury restaurant. Her friend says she's lucky because this loser does everything for her, and he must be rich now. Fang Yu Ching, in my last life, pretended to be innocent and virginal, and in the end, stole everything I had, even your arms, right now. I want to kill that bitch right here but that would land me in jail. I have to wait until the end of the world to do something. Zhang Yi flashes his bank card and asks, do you want to go shopping at the supermarket? He uses them both to carry everything and show that he now has money, and they accept happily in hopes of making some profit. They ask, why so much food? And the protagonist says, you never know when an apocalypse might happen, and it's good to be prepared. The two opportunists complain that he's not carrying anything and that they're doing him a big favor. Now Zhang Yi owes them a luxurious dinner like the one he had before. Laughing coldly inside, Zhang Yi looks forward to the time when it's his turn to treat them very well. I'm looking forward to that too. At the market exit, his aunt Lin with her grandson says, you can't eat all of that alone. Give some to your aunt. After saying this, the five-year-old grandson steals his shopping cart. Zhang Yi takes it back. Sorry, I'll eat it all by myself. The child starts throwing a tantrum, cursing at Zhang Yi. I'll punch your teeth out if you keep this up. The kid starts crying immediately. Aunt Lin asks what he's doing, an adult fighting with a child, and says she'll buy the chocolate. She'll transfer the money later. He shows his QR and says not later, now his old lady, pass it over now or go to the market to buy it. He leaves, leaving Aunt Lin angry. Arriving home, Fang Yu Ching winked at him, and the two told him not to forget about them. I slammed the door in those bitches' faces. After sending the two away, Zhang Yi put Al the purchased food in storage space to see if it spoils over time. He still has a lot to do, building an impenetrable fortress with heating devices and medical supplies. It would also be great if he could get some weapons. There are three months left until the Ice Age. By then, he has to sell everything he has as quickly as possible and get more. The next day, looking at the storage space, he checks the freshness of the food and discovers that living creatures cannot be stored, but the food remains as fresh as when he stored it. Knowing this, Zhang Yi picked up his phone and contacted the best local restaurant, ordering 500 full meals for delivery. He explained that he would be hosting a three-day, three-night feast, so he needed so much food. His next step was to find his property deed and go to the bank to mortgage his apartment. Considering that after the apocalypse, money would become worthless paper, Zhang Yi decided to take out a loan with his apartment as collateral. In three months, he would make the payment for this loan. The manager warned that the interest rate would be a bit high, but upon hearing this, Zhang Yi rubbed his hands together, indicating that it didn't matter if the interest rates were high. He got 9 mil ion and would pay 30 mil ion in three months or lose his house and car. Next, he went to the best security company. A business manager approached and asked if he needed help. Zhang Yi shared his idea of building a safe house for the apocalypse. The business manager presented various plans for the protagonist to choose from, but he was not satisfied with the ones presented. He declared that the house should be reinforced with aviation materials. The balcony should use bull-et-proof glass, in addition to adding an air filtration system 
and a 360-degree blind spot-free monitoring system. The front door should be made of the same material as bank vault doors. Additional why, he asked the manager to find a way to obtain some weapons. The business manager was surprised by these renovations and the need for weapons. He could get everything except the weapons. Zhang Yi concluded that this would turn the house into a fortress. The final plan cost 8 mil ion, and after paying the deposit, he asked them to start the work immediately. Next, he needed to obtain some weapons for self-defense. He Khaled the owner of a hunting club and managed to get some crossbows as weapons. As soon as he returned home, the 500 full meals he had ordered also arrived on several trucks. This caught the attention of many people in the neighborhood, as they were delivery trucks from a five-star hotel, which would cost at least one mil ion or so. After some time, Zhang Yi's house was Phil Ed. Wasting no time, he put everything into storage space. Basical why, he wouldn't need to worry about food for years of his life. The next day, the security company workers came to start building the safe house. This scene attracted the attention of many neighbors, who mocked Zhang Yi, asking if he had taken the wrong medication. However, he didn't care because he believed that when the end came, they would find out who was the joke. Next, Zhang Yi went to the manager of the company where he works, and bought a portion of the medicine supplies, offering double the market price to have priority to buy everything, even what was already sold to other companies. Then, he transported these things home, little by little. His recent stockpiling activities also caught the attention of Fang Yuqing, who asked if something was about to happen, mentioning that she had been thinking a lot about him recently. The protagonist didn't want to respond to Fang Yuqing's fake concern, leaving her angry. Zhang Yi, the suck-up who used to do everything she asked, suddenly started ignoring her. His best friend simply laughed at the situation. She stated that if something big was happening, the country would definitely notify everyone. All she has to do is win over the nouveau riche Zhang Yi so they can benefit. After weeks, Zhang Yi's safe house was successfully built. The company also installed Ed Surveil Ant's systems on every floor of the building. Zhang Yi was very pleased with the service. Now only one last batch of supplies was about to arrive. Several trucks of drinking water arrived successively. One of the delivery drivers was his uncle Yu, who lives in his neighborhood. He seemed curious as to why his nephew ordered so many gal ons of drinking water. In his past life, Uncle Yu was one of the few good people to Zhang Yi, so he whispered to his uncle, the weather this year is going to be very cold, you should stock up on supplies to prepare as soon as possible. Hearing this, Uncle Yu didn't want to believe, but upon seeing Zhang Yi's serious face, he couldn't help but take it seriously. Get back to work, you lazy bum. In the following weeks, Zhang Yi spent his days spending his money, stocking up more and more supplies, and training with the bow and arrow every day. With only three days left until the extreme cold, the weather was already abnormal. The final moment arrived. Zhang Yi, at his job where he is the stock supervisor, made tea and invited Al, his call eags for a drink. After they drank, an hour later, they all passed out. After turning off the surveil ant's cameras, it's his time to calmly steal Al the resources from the Walmart warehouse. Fuel, food, and equipment. He quickly empties the warehouse. One of the boxes caught his attention, cold resistance equipment that had recently been purchased by the company. They could withstand temperatures of minus 100 degrees. To complete his perfect plan, Zhang Yi also took a special sleeping tea and joined his coal eggs. Two hours later, he is awakened by his employee saying they are screwed, the warehouse was robbed, they took everything. Upon hearing this, he pretends to be surprised. How did all the warehouse products disappear? The manager callous him asking about the warehouse supplies theft, knowing that the entire warehouse was emptied at once without leaving any clues, and even the cameras didn't see. The manager immediately accuses the supervisor of planning this crime with more people. Zhang Yi, nervously smiling, says he's not competent enough for that. Everyone is taken to the police station to give statements, but nothing is found out. How could they find out that the warehouse was teleported? After the interrogation, the police officer says not to leave the city under any circumstances as everyone is a suspect. Maliciously, Zhang Yi says he won't even leave the house. This incident on December 10th made news in the city. No one can believe that tons of supplies disappeared without a trace in less than three hours. It was also on this day that heavy snowfall began in the sky. Zhang Yi knew this was the beginning of the cold apocalypse. Three days later at home, when the shockwave from a supernova explosion brings catastrophe to the entire planet. The temperature starts dropping rapidly overnight. Looking at the heavy snow through the window, Zhang Yi says that this time the story will be different. The people in the apartment owners group were nervous, as it was the first time they had seen so much snow in the city. Observing everything in the building group, Zhang Yi knows that for many people, this was the first and also the last time they saw snow. In his past life, the heavy snowstorm lasted for three whole months and the temperature kept dropping, causing many people who had not stocked up on food beforehand to freeze to death. On the second day of freezing weather, 
the heavy snow at the residential area entrance had already accumulated to a height of one meter. Even if people turned the heater to the maximum, they still trembled from the cold inside the house. However, Jang Yi, who had prepared several pieces of heating equipment beforehand, was comfortably warm and comfortable. After a good sleep, Jang Yi was awakened by the noise of the phone. It was a call from the naughty Yu Ching asking if Jang Yi knew about the temperature drop when he stocked up supplies every day in the last few months and why he didn't even inform her who likes him so much. Now she's freezing cold and eating instant noodles. Hearing this, Jang Yi laughed and hung up the phone on her face. The damn girl got angry on the other side. She then shamelessly sent a text asking for food, and it wasn't even that way. Reading the message, Jang Yi decided to troll a bit. He sent her a photo of a steak with wine which she immediately recognized as top quality Wagyu and a very expensive French wine. At that moment, the urge to have some became strong and he asked her to eat it with him and drink wine too. Jiang Yi's response was, if she wanted, she could go to the market and buy it herself. Despite her anger, she calmed down because she needed to please Jiang Yi to be able to go to his place too. After that, he just ignored her and went back to enjoying his meal. It was then that on the building's surveillance cameras, on the iPad screen, he saw the show, Aunt Lin, who was the building manager, saying not to panic and not to fight over food. The extreme weather would last at most two or three days, and the neighborhood committee would help everyone through this. Aunt Lin warned that excessive hoarding of supplies is prohibited and would be reported to the authorities if discovered. However, one person spoke out against it, questioning how she could be sure that the heavy snowfall wouldn't last long. The surrounding residents also wanted to know, stating that if they didn't stock up on supplies now, Aunt Lin would be responsible if they ran out of food. Aunt Lin then stated that the neighborhood committee would take responsibility for this issue, then pointed to Jiang Yi to divert attention just to tell him not to cause trouble. He didn't care about the threats and went back to his super safe house. A week passed and the snow outside kept falling. Aunt Lin asked the building group for Jiang Yi, who is young, to clear the snow from the building's door. He says it's useless to clear because it would be like trying to dry a river with a bucket. By refusing Aunt Lin's request to clear the snow, Zhang Yi suggested she ask the rich people in the neighborhood for help. She was furious and clearly just trying to pick a fight. Angrily, she said that on behalf of the neighborhood committee, this is an order and whoever opposes the orders will be blamed by the neighborhood committee for the problems. Questioning why Aunt Lin didn't call the rich people in the neighborhood to do the heavy lifting. He proposed that Aunt Lin ask Chen Zheng how to clear the snow. Chen Zheng is a construction boss. He has employees for that, and Xing Song is a rich guy and can afford to pay if he doesn't want to help like everyone else. The authority of Tia Lin in the group was shattered, and upon reading the messages, Lin, cursing, decided to call both members of the group to clean the snow together, tagging them in the chat. Upon seeing the message, Chen Zheng immediately got angry with Tia Lin and with Zhang Yi for acting as if he owned the place. Xing Song sent an audio message in the group, saying he was busy working hard, and sent a photo to show how busy he was. Tia Lin was furious with the rich guy's response but didn't question anything. She just accused Zhang Yi of causing this confusion. Zhang Yi didn't bother and ignored the rest. Tia Lin was so furious that she called Zhang Yi personally to complain. He threatened her that if she kept talking nonsense and bothering him, he would kill her. Trembling with fear, she hung up and didn't say anything else in the group. While he was eating, a loud noise came from the front door, and Chen Jing outside shouted, You were acting all high and mighty in the chat, putting others against me in the group. I'm going to kill you now, punk. Zhang Yi grabbed his bow and went to the door, while Chen Jing was kicking. Magically aiming through the door opening, he asked about who would kill whom first. Zhang Yi hit Chen Zheng's shin with an arrow. Through the peephole, he saw the arrogant guy on the floor, groaning in pain nonstop. No one would imagine that a silly and naive boy, an honest person, would have the courage to react like this. Chen Zheng didn't know that this was just the beginning of Zhang Yi's revenge. With the cold temperature, Chen Zheng could die if not treated in time. He would slowly die from infection and weak would die from the cold. Struggling to reach the elevator, he didn't imagine that this kid he had seen three times in his life would do this to him. The truth is that Zhang Yi wanted to kill him at once. Realizing this, he got scared, grabbed the phone, and called an emergency. But because of the snow, any assistance was impossible. So he treated himself, taking advantage of the cold and numb leg. He removed the arrow himself, then picked up the phone again to threaten in the owner's group, telling Zhang Yi to watch his words. Chen Jing will kill you. Fearlessly, Zhang Yi responded confidently, come here again and I'll kill you. This conversation left the curious ones in the chat group horrified. After all, 
no one in the region would have the courage to go against Chen Zheng. This was the first time someone directly confronted the guy. Furious, he grabbed the phone and called all his employees. In no time, a herd of people, each holding their own weapon, arrived at his house. Baldi led them all to Zhang Yi's door. Zhang Yi, you offended our big bro. Today is the day of your death. Attacking the door that was supposed to be made of wood, his sword broke, and he flew, spinning away. Scared, Baldi said that this door is made of pure metal. How many enemies does this kid have? His house is more protected than a bank. Watching the security cameras, Zhang Yi said they seemed weak and must be hungry. The group of people, angrier and angrier. Zhang Yi had the idea of grabbing a water hose and turning it on from the kitchen tap. The workers outside saw the door opening passage, not understanding anything because it wasn't an arrow, so there was no danger. The hose sprayed cold water on all of them. A bunch of them fell to the frozen ground. Only a few managed to escape. This scene left Zhang Yi quite satisfied. In this freezing cold, cold water is more dangerous than weapons. In Chen Jing's house, three of them who escaped, huddled together, trembling with cold. He angrily asked, what happened? An entire group couldn't catch a boy. The three explained that Zhang Yi was very clever. He put a burglar-proof steel door in the apartment. He sprayed cold water on all of us through a hole in the door. Chen Jing said he can't hide there forever. Put some men to guard his door day and night. When he needs to leave the house, get him and bring him. At the building's entrance, Uncle Yu led some people to clear the snow at the residential area's entrance, planning to dig a path to the supermarket to restock food. But they realized that, as Zhang Yi said, they couldn't dig as fast as the snow fell. After a while, they gave up and prepared to return. Watching this, Zhang Yi said that human power can't beat one of this size. Even though the television is reassuring all citizens that the country is winning the snow disaster, Zhang Yi is the only one who knows that 95% of the global population froze to death in this snow disaster. His lifelong passion sends a message asking if he's okay. If she didn't know the truth, she could be here with him in luxury. Zhang Yi says he's fine. She says she's out of food and reminds him that he bought a lot of stuff. Give me some, and later I'll invite you to dinner here. Slyly, Zhang Yi sends a photo of a lobster and says it's already being served for dinner. Seeing this, she gets annoyed, thinking that's why he's single. His chances with her are over now. Her best friend takes the opportunity to send a message too, saying, you made Fang Yu Chin sad now. Seeing this message, Zhang Yi says that this little drama is weak. The best friend gives up, saying that the snow won't last long. Why can't he help his lovely neighbors? He might even win Fang Yu Chin over. That would be great for him. Zhang Yi ignores and responds with just an oh. This pisses off the other bitch too. This loser suddenly turned so Alpha Sigma Red Pill? Yu Ching gives up trying to figure out why his loser attitude changed so suddenly. They have the idea that if this loser isn't served anymore, they can use another one with less money. Yu Ching called another loser, Zhou Ping. He came running and brought a big bag of supplies, saying it's all the food he has. Before Yu Ching could fool another sucker, her friend slammed the door in his face. From the bitch's expression, she didn't even care. She was just thinking about getting revenge on Zhang Yi for ignoring her. With this additional bag, five days passed, and the snow kept increasing. While eating a piece of chicken while waiting for the real drama to begin, all the buildings were in the dark with the electricity cut off. Soon, neighbors started coming out of their homes, asking each other if they had electricity. Now, with water and electricity cut off, the heaters no longer work. It was getting cold enough to die inside under the blankets. Before finishing the chicken, Zhang Yi was picking his teeth and turning on the generator he had bought before, or stolen, because he also did that at the warehouse. Neighborhood committee member Aunt Lin is trembling as she holds her grandson. She never expected the snowstorm to last so long. A message arrives in the group that only she has. Someone saying that this is a global snowstorm that occurs once every 100,000 years. We could be on the brink of a mass extinction event. Several important cities in the country have already been affected. Everyone must stock up on more supplies. Reading this, Aunt Lin was shocked. She never imagined the snow disaster would be so severe. Then she thought of a plan. She needs to make all residents give up their food before they receive this news. Aunt Lin posts a message in the owner's group saying not to worry. This disaster is temporary. Workers are currently repairing the water and power interruptions. The authorities have issued an order. Because of these extraordinary circumstances, the neighborhood committee will manage all property owners. Those who do not cooperate will be arrested and interrogated by the police. Seeing this message, everyone becomes dissatisfied, especially Chen Zheng. But even if he is influential, if it's a police order, he has to obey. Meanwhile, Tia Lin continues in the group chat. Due to the seriousness of the snowstorm, the neighborhood committee has decided to collect all supplies from each owner and distribute them equally to everyone to help overcome this crisis. Upon seeing this message, Zhang Yi remembers that she did the same thing in her past life and stole food from all the residents. Tia Lin's mistake was sending a message privately to Zhang Yi saying, 
My nephew, you work in the warehouse. I saw you last time buying three truckloads of stuff. You must have stocked up a lot of food. It's your turn to do your part. Zheng Yi, angry, immediately replies with an audio message. You armed bitch. Liar guys. He says he ate too much and ran out of supplies at home. When she collects from the building, come share some with me. Hearing this audio made the old lady almost have a heart attack from anger. How could he have ruined everything so quickly? But realizing that she and her grandson are in dire straits and depend on Zhang Yi, the lady calms down and responds kindly. This is an order from the organization. You have to obey. After the snow passes, I will report your good deeds to the organization. If Zhang Yi hadn't died the last time in his life, he would have believed her. So he responds, picking his teeth. Aunt, I'm not lying. I have nothing to eat at home, and I'm hungry. How about you send me some instant noodles, please? Upon hearing this, Tia Lin couldn't hold back and replied to Zhang Yi. Refusing to surrender your supplies is the same as going against the organization. I will definitely report you all. Zhang Yi dismissed her and said she was nothing. This made Tia Lin so nervous that she slammed her phone against the wall, furious with Zhang Yi just like her. After not getting any advantage, Tia Lin focused on the other owners. If she could deceive some of them, it would be enough. Two days later, with Tia Lin lying, several owners sent their supplies to the old lady's house. Seeing this situation, Zhang Yi thought that everyone was stupid, believing in someone in this post-apocalyptic world. After so long, the whole world must be in chaos. Not enough food. People could only wait to starve to death or hunt for food. Many owners began tagging Tia Lin in the chat, asking about the supplies that were supposed to be distributed equally. Many of us have no food at home. I want food, or I'll eat you, Tia Lin. The crooked trustee responded to the demands, mocking, you idiots. These supplies were obtained through my hard work. Why should I give them away? At that moment, her phone rang and, seeing that it was Chen Zheng, she began to sweat cold. What do you want with an old lady? Chen Zheng said coldly. Tia Lin, you really tricked and took everyone's supplies to your house. She pretended to be innocent, saying it was the arrangement of the community committee and that she was just doing her duty. Chen Zheng then said that this is perfect. Ten of them are waiting for her to distribute the supplies. Hearing this, Tia Lin tried to argue, saying, These supplies have not been sorted yet. Some owners have not yet handed in their supplies, so we cannot start distributing them yet. So, all right, Chen Zheng, along with his starving companions, stormed her house. There is no more law in this chaos, and he smacks the old lady in the face. Today, he will be the justice. Meanwhile, Zhang Yi watched everything on the surveillance cameras, calmly eating a sausage. He also had the idea to record the action at Tia Lin's house and share it in the building group chat. Seeing that they were going to take all the food and leave nothing behind, she tried to stop Chen Jing. Some of the supplies here are the ones I personally stocked. Without these supplies, how will she and her grandson survive? Chen Zheng said, fuck it, and kicked the old lady, the grandson, in shock, grabbed a bread knife to defend his grandmother, and he stabbed a guy's dick. After feeling the pain, the worker kicked the boy in the chest, while others laughed at him. Chen Zheng didn't show concern for this, and even said that this is what she deserves for deceiving us. We are just delivering justice. Through the residence group, watching everything, they also applauded and enjoyed it. You old leer, that's how you deal with scammers. They thanked Chen Zheng. Seeing these messages, Zhang Yi said that these idiots don't understand the real problem. Today, Chen Zheng invaded old lady Lin's house. Tomorrow, he may invade yours. But since all of this doesn't represent a risk for Zhang Yi, he says he doesn't care. His steel door will never fall to these guys. After a while, Tia Lin was asking for help in the residence group. Does anyone have hemostatic drugs, wound medicine, and antibiotics? My grandson was shot by Chen Zheng. Dr. Xiaohu urgently needs these medicines for the grandson's surgery. Upon hearing this, Zhang Yi's eyes widened. Dr. Xiaohu was a kind doctor in his past life. Here we see why his eyes are turned in different directions. Tia Lin made an appeal for medicine, promising gratitude to anyone willing to provide it. But all she received was a lull from the residents. No one wanted to believe or help. Zhang Yi, seeing this, just thought it must be karma. Outside, the snowstorm lasted for over a week, paralyzing practically everything with snow, covering the entire ground floor. Even if the boy was saved by the doctor, would he live without food? Many people have heard from the news that this was a global snowstorm that occurs once every 100,000 years. The whole world was almost buried in the snowstorm. In some northern cities, the temperature dropped to less than 100 degrees C. Many residents who tried to evacuate to the south ended up freezing to death on the way. In the residence group, Tia Lin started asking for help again. My dear grandson has been hungry for two days. He's just a child. Are you going to sit there and watch him die? She was willing to pay for the supplies. Seeing this, 
the residents started selling packs of instant noodles for $2,000, and then they helped her grandson. Zhang Yi, as always, watching everything, found it amusing. People don't understand the apocalypse in front of them. Soon, they will have to eat money. As a rich person and knowledgeable about things, Xing Zong started buying food from everyone who sold it for a lot of money. He knew very well that you can't eat money in this apocalyptic world. A single mother made an appeal for help in the group as well. Her daughter was about to starve to death, and she hoped everyone could help her. Zhang Yi says that this woman in his past life, with her daughter, survived for a long time, so it's all good. It had been 10 days since the freezing. Zhang Yi, as always, was at home, enjoying the comfort. At this moment, the phone rang. Seeing who it was, he chuckled. He opened the video call and said they seemed thinner, so are they eating well? The sight of the chicken made both of them drool instantly, and they asked why he still has so much food at home. And with this cold, why is he sweating? Mockingly, he says he has a fireplace at home. It's very warm, and he jokes that he's even thinking of going for a run outside to get some fresh air. Yu Ching, drooling over Zhang Yi, saying he's amazing, asked to take a bath inside with him. Without thinking twice, he rejected the invitation and even made a joke. The girl instantly became angry at Zhang Yi's words. It's okay if you don't want to help, but mocking them is not cool. So, is that how it is? You still think I'm a loser? Zhang Yi asked. If you want food, go find your rich boy. And he hung up the call. On the other end, Yu Qing got so pissed off that she threw her phone on the ground. Her loser wasn't a loser anymore. Her best friend still praised Zhang Yi. This guy is awesome. It's her loss for not enjoying the stuff at his place right now. He's better than the rich boys they used to hang out with. The two ended up in a fist fight because the girl wouldn't accept being called dumb. Meanwhile, the government stopped hiding the news of the snow disaster and issued a TV announcement. To meet everyone's electricity needs, power supply would only be available at night, and even then, the voltage would be sufficient only for low-power devices. Currently, all major power plants are shut down, and electricity is scarce. Everyone should use only their cell phones and a lamp or two. No electric showers. Everyone now knows that the ice disaster has no end date. After fighting for 10 minutes without losing their friendship, Yu Qing and her friend decided to be more direct. Yu Qing picked up the phone and called the loser, Zhou Peng, telling a story about how Zhang Yi wanted to tarnish his purity just because he had food. Zhou Peng, pissed off upon hearing this, said Zhang Yi was a scumbag and needed to be taken down. Seeing that Zhou Peng was furious, Yu Qing went further and misled the loser into going to rob Zhang Yi's house now. In no time, the three of them were at his door, each with a kitchen knife hidden knocking. Watching everything through the cameras, Zhang Yi saw the ultimate loser and knew none of them had any idea about the cameras. They knocked and asked to exchange the medicine they had for food. Angry at their attempt to trick him, Zhang Yi decided to be aggressive. Grabbing the hose to spray water on them and end the problems, he changed his mind when he saw the accumulated trash can. His idea was obvious, but magically, I don't know how. He with the hose sprayed sewage on the three, leaving everything full of garbage and saying that's the food they deserve, they can eat. Zhou Peng, furious, struck the door but didn't scratch it. His hand was hurt. Laughing it off, Zhang Yi said through the speaker that the door is made of steel and they can't open it. After a while, Zhang Yi gave up on them and went to sleep. However, he suddenly woke up to the sound of a gunshot. Even though he knew that sooner or later the law of the jungle would be put into practice, the sudden shot still startled him. Checking the surveillance camera images on the tablet, he realized that Chen Zhang and his employees were going from house to house, stealing supplies. Many met the same fate he had in his past life during the apocalypse. He even sent photos of what he could do to the building groups and claimed that he now controlled all the buildings. Watching the situation through the surveillance cameras, a new group was formed where several residents denounced Chen Zheng's actions in the chat, stating the need to go against him soon. Zhang Yi was also added to the group and read the messages, having fun with it all. A retired veteran proposed leading an attack against Chen Zheng, receiving support. The veteran uncle suggested that they needed young volunteers to ensure security and weapons. A woman in the chat immediately sent an audio asking, Aunt Lin stole from them the other day. Can we trust uncle and give him weapons? This divided the residents into two groups, with half wanting to go after Chen Zheng and the others just not trusting uncle. Watching the discussion in the group chat, eating something sometimes, and watching through the cameras as Chen Zheng stole more and more houses, Zhang Yi decided he should do something to take this guy down because anyone who goes against him will just end up taking a bullet to the head. That's not fair to everyone. The next morning, a resident who opposed helping the veteran go after Chen Zheng called for help in the residents group. Her door was being forced open, and she would be next. It didn't take long before she was dragged out, and what had to happen happened. 
Yu Ching and her friends, nervous, realized they needed a plan to be the next ones to be broken into. The girl's idea was to spread the news that Zhang Yi had a stockpile of supplies and gather everyone to join forces to take over his house. They added him to the new group so he would know, but Zhang Yi didn't care and said it's okay. They argued that he should join forces with the four to protect themselves from Chen Zhang. Zhang Yi's response was simply to leave the group. This change in Zhang Yi's attitude left Yu Qing and the others astounded. How could this loser from just three months ago now be so firm? They began discussing how to break into Zhang Yi's house and steal his fortress. The smart glasses guy says to open the door. His friend here knows how to pick locks. They decided to try to break the lock and placed umbrellas so they wouldn't get showered with water or garbage again. Zhang Yi, watching through the surveillance cameras, activated the high voltage defense feature. The clever lock picker had just admitted that this lock couldn't be opened. The kid practically exploded in shock and died. Seeing this, Zhang Yi felt no remorse for killing these guys. The smart guy with glasses pointed to the door, cursed Zhang Yi as a damn monster, and told him to get out now. Hearing this, he just laughed, grabbed his crossbow, and aiming through the door, hit the left arm of the smart guy's man squarely. The other two went to help the injured and were also hit, the loser and another crazy guy. Yu Qing and the others fled and returned home from where they came. The three hit by arrows were lying on the ground, groaning in pain. One of the girls slapped the slut Yu Qing's face and said it was all her fault. She didn't mention that he had crossbows at home, his crossbow. She argues that she didn't know. Last time, he just sprayed water and garbage. Zhou Peng, the loser as always, defends the slut. Besides, the smart guy remembers that the most important thing is to take care of the wounds. They called, and Dr. Zhou Kier came to check the wounds of the injured people. Surprised, she explained that, with the wounds so deep and without professional equipment, they have less than 20%. Furthermore, the iron arrow was rusty, and without antibiotics, it's certain death. The girl, who is a relative of one of the dumb kids, cries at the news and says that Zhang Ye, Zhang Yi is very cruel and did it on purpose. Until now, Dr. Kuti doesn't know who this is. Zhou Kier leaves the warning. Get medicine soon. If they remove the arrows now, it's over for them. The smart guy with glasses, at this point, must have gone crazy and said Zhang Yi must get the medicine for them. Yu Qing, thinking for once in her life, remembers that Zhang Yi suddenly changed a lot and started stocking up a lot of stuff at home. She tells the others that Zhang Yi does have medicine because she saw him stocking it before. Furthermore, no one here harmed him. They just wanted to rob his house. But since they failed, and only they got hurt, it's his fault. From the corner, their joke here, listening to everything, just thinks she doesn't know this guy, but they deserve to die anyway. The other girl blames Yu Qing for everything, and forces the slut to figure out how to convince Zhang Yi to give medicine to everyone. This time, even the loser agreed. Without the medicine, he would die too. The plan now was to try to call him, which he answered easily. She is crying on the phone and says the boys are dying, and if he can help, Zhang Yi just asks why he should. Everyone has to die sooner or later. The crazy guy's sister takes the phone to say it's his duty to help because he injured the guys and they were rusty. Zhang Yi then says that he used arrows like that just for them to die anyway. To add insult to injury, he even says he won't help, but Yu Qing can come live with him. At that moment, the girl takes the phone back and says yes, he's yours from now on. Do whatever you want with her, says Zhang Yi. Her blood-sucking friend says to take her too. Zhang Yi says, just come, you can come now. He starts running right away to go. Her friend tries to pull her, and she just gets a push. Get away from me, you bitch, the cousin of one of the boys says, then gives her another slap in the face and calls her a schemer. As always, the slut looks at Zhou Peng, too much of a loser, and asks for his help. He has to make them let her go and be happy with Zhang Yi. She also says that Zhou Peng is a good man, but he's poor and weak. Zhang Yi's brother is the one who can make her happy now. The kid even falls in pain now. She bolted, trying to go to Zhang Yi's house, but the others stopped her. The reason is that everything is her fault, so Yu Qing doesn't have the right to thrive alone. Dr. Zhou Kier reminds them again that without medicine, it's certain death and leaves. One of the injured kids, the smarty there, says they should go ahead with the plan to spread the word that Zhang Yi has plenty of food. The smart one says that when Chen Zhang and the others take Zhang Yi's house, they can get medicine. Yu Qing is against doing this to Zhang Yi's brother. The other girl makes it clear that if she opens her mouth, she'll lose her teeth now. Zhou Peng is against hitting the bitch, but says to her that this plan is the only choice. They posted in the building group the photos and videos that Zhang Yi sent. He really has a lot of food. Seeing the message, Chen Zheng drools and says, That's perfect. I can get revenge for the leg. In the residence group, people asked Zhang Yi to distribute his supplies to everyone. Others asked for just one meal. Aunt Lin asked for food, and another mother in the group, 
asked him to be her son's godfather. Seeing these requests, Zhang Yi sends an audio message to the group. I'm eating those listening. He really said he wouldn't feed animals and wouldn't help anyone anyway. Ignoring them all, Zhang Yi looks at the snow falling outside the window and thinks, staying home every day is boring. It would be nice to use the snowmobile store to take a ride around. Suddenly, the phone receives a message from Dr. Joe Keir. She says her medicine and food ran out, and if he wants to negotiate. In her previous life, she died because she gave her last food to a mother with a hungry baby, and she starved to death. Zhang Yi remembers her as a good person, but says that the smarter the woman, the more dangerous she will be. Zhang Yi doesn't want to leave anything to chance and end up dying again. He replied, I can provide supplies, but you need to trade something for them. Seeing the message, Joe Keir says he can give her food for participating in a consultation with her. Look how cute she is, thinking she doesn't even know this guy. And now, Zhang Yi says instead he can provide medicine and food, but she needs to do him a favor. Zhang Yi needs her to be his spy and inform him of the resident's plans. The deal is that, accepting it or not, it's her choice to follow the crowd and die like everyone else or stand by his side. She wonders for a moment if this is right, but decides to accept. The first step is taken, guys. Our Zhang Yi has a lot of food, but lacks food, doesn't he? Then the smart guy with glasses sent a final threat. Zhang Yi, where are you? Last chance, are you going to deliver the supplies or not? Seeing the message, Zhang Yi trolls in the group, saying that his food just ran out. The wounded smart guy threatens him, and soon, Chen Zhang makes a group without Zhang Yi, planning to join together to steal everything he has. Zhou Kier and Uncle Yu are in the group and decide to warn Zhang Yi about it. With that, Zhang Yi is sure that Dr. Zhou Kier was cooperating with him. Zhang Yi tells her that he has plans to defend himself, just don't be with the herd. It was 2.30 in the morning when a group of armed people marched home, shouting that they had to kill the selfish one. They hammered the door with all their might. Seeing this through the security cameras, Zhang Yi turned on the high-voltage device. Those who were close were electrocuted and died. What a pity. The others were scared and wanted to flee. However, as soon as they turned around, they were blocked by Chen Zheng and his gang. He ordered them to continue breaking the door, or they would die. To motivate the residents, the smart one with glasses said that now, they have to kill Zhang Yi to avenge the neighbors he just killed. Besides, inside there's a fireplace and plenty of food. Encouraged, the residents grabbed a wooden log and continued trying to break down the door. Zhang Yi, after some time drinking wine, decides to help them. He took out his sound system, played action music, and said that this was to motivate them. Listening to the music and with more anger, 20 minutes later, the door was only scratched, and the guys were fainting from hunger and exhaustion. The residents, who didn't even know the door was made of steel, were puzzled. One of them goes there to inspect with a magnifying glass and says it's the same material as bank vaults. A door like this, not even a tank could knock down. Zhang Yi, on the other side of the door with his crossbow ready, only aimed well at the throat. The guy was agonizing there, and the other neighbors ran, shouting that he had weapons. Somehow, Zhang Yi hit the people who weren't even facing his door. The technology mysteries that, behind the door, Zhang Yi felt no guilt for it, just self-defense. The smarty with glasses who survived after calming down says he has a plan. The door is steel and thick, but the wall is still made of cement bricks. The neighbors seemed to understand and started hammering the wall next to the door. Cracks began to appear in the wall, and then a metallic sound with an impact occurred. The guy with glasses lost fear of the arrows on the side of the door and went to check. The walls are also lined with steel. Everyone was shocked. Why on earth would someone put steel in the walls? Someone who knew this situation was going to happen, they tried to break several other places in the walls, and every corner had metal. They went to the apartment above and below his, and as expected, there was metal everywhere. This miserable man has an impenetrable fortress. Without tools, it was impossible to drill through the walls. The neighbors realized that Zhang Yi must have known about the apocalypse to have built such a complex fortress. Everyone was in despair, saying that Zhang Yi was selfish and only thought of himself. Two residents looked at each other hungrily, and for a second, thought about eating each other. But it passed. One of the neighbors says he remembers that his apartment's balcony is made of glass. This idea made everyone excited again. Using wooden planks from the neighboring apartment to his, Zhang Yi sat calmly while everyone together gathered on the balcony. Unfortunately for them, the glass was bulletproof, and they couldn't even scratch it. To help them warm up because it's very cold outside, Zhang Yi took a Molotov cocktail and threw it into a hole in the wall, which soon fell from the ceiling on their heads. In the element's view, it was one second of terror, and then many of pain, catching fire completely. In agony, he jumped from the balcony, the fire spread, and everyone else was also protected against the cold, while Zhang Yi watched everything. The others tried to go back to the apartment next door. However, the others didn't let them, for fear of burning themselves too. They fell off the planks, and any of those who didn't fall took the opportunity to warm up a little. After a while, 
the repentant residents returned to his balcony in front of the glass, begging for food. As in his past life, they ate. He doesn't even feel sorry for them. Hess shows them warm pasta to see them drooling. He even puts it on a table right in front of them. Zhang Yi then told them that for whoever brings Chen Zheng's head, will receive food for a week. Hearing this, everyone looked eagerly at Chen Zheng in the neighboring apartment. Even those who were behind him heard Zhang Yi's words. Killing Chen Zheng means food and drink for a week. Chen Zheng even locked the door with everyone's gaze. But before he could get closer, his men and the gun in his hand stopped him. At this point, Zhang Yi put the reward notice in the owner's group. Anyone who could kill Chen Zheng would receive a week of food. The next morning, the skinny ones were waiting to ambush their food. Even if he had a pistol, they could surprise him. Chen Zheng and his loyal followers were attacked from behind, but the result was that both were lying on the ground. The boss ordered them to be stored as food, and one of his men saw that the boss was wounded in the back in this attack. Chen Zheng called Zhou Kier to come treat his wound. Soon she was doing the dressing and said it wasn't for free. Chen Zheng says she can eat with them. Seeing what the soup everyone was about to eat was made of, she says she prefers to starve to death. Chen Zheng at least says that she would be the last person to become food in this building. Ignoring this nonsense, she tried to leave. However, Chen Zheng said that only after he was healed could she leave. She sat in the corner of the room while the men resumed discussing their plans to get Zhang Yi. Man, look at how far human beings go in extreme situations. If Chen Zheng hadn't been injured and still needed her, I bet he would force more things, you know? She, after hearing the plans, said she was going to the bathroom, but she was actually there to tell Zhang Yi what she heard. Later, Chen Zhang's men went to the neighboring apartment to get food and steal. They let them in and didn't imagine the food was for them. With a blow to the head of the couple, they killed them, but to make sure, they hit more. Chen Zhang tells our doctor that he can't have predators around his house, as they might try to hunt him down. Zhou Kier is starting to see how things are. In the house where the friends of the slutty Yu Ching are, they had to remove the arrows without any medicine. Everyone has serious infections. Maybe the cold is taking away some of the pain. Zhou Peng asks his cousin to try to convince Zhang Yi one more time, but she says it's useless. There's no way. Days go by, and Zhang Yi only eats and sees Chen Zheng afraid of being ambushed again. As he eats more and more, Zhang Yi calls Zhou Kier to ask about her situation. She says Chen Zheng went crazy. Everyone's food ran out. They're invading houses every day to kill everyone and search for food. Besides keeping the dead for later, she hasn't eaten anything for days and asks if he can save her. He thinks for a moment that she's very useful for being a competent doctor. In the post-apocalyptic world, doctors are treasures. So, Zhang Yi says she can come to his house after doing one last thing. A while later, Zhou Peng goes to pound his door, desperate. He says his love, Yu Qing, is starving. He went to Zhang Yi's door, asking for food for the girl who used and rejected him. Zhang Yi also says that tetanus is already advanced in him. Medicines won't work anymore. As he walks back home, he remembers he never even held Slutty's hand. So instead of waiting for death, he ran to Yu Qing's room, kneeled down, and asked her to marry him. She, disgusted, threw him away. The loser grabbed her by the neck, saying they'd get married in hell then. She slapped him in the face, saying she belonged to Zhang Yi. Zhen Peng then says he'll have to go to hell to get her. Then we go back to Dr. Zhou Kier. She told the men she would make a decent meal for them today. They won't even notice it's not regular meat. Pleased, they thought she forgot about pride. She tells them she doesn't want to die as much as they do. After helping a little, she says she'll take care of the rest alone. Putting something in the soup and stirring well, she had to make an effort not to vomit right there. Sometime later, she served everyone. The soup looked really nice, everyone said. To gain their trust, Jo Kier also served herself a bowl of soup and went back to her room. Hoping her medicine would take effect, she put a whole vial of sleeping pills in it, and in minutes everyone was asleep. Relieved it worked. She sent a message saying everyone was asleep. What should she do next? Zhang Yi's order is to take everyone to the balcony, he was watching everything from the other side. Feeling cold, she asks if he intends to kill them. Hearing this, he threw a rope and said, it's more or less that, she should tie everyone to the balcony railing. She says he could at least help, but he says she's the one being tested here. Tying everyone to the railing, she grabbed Chen Zheng's gun. Worried, he warned her to remove the magazine and throw the gun at him. She even tried to bargain if she should trust him, but with the argument that it's her only choice, Zhou Kier obeyed and threw the gun at Zhang Yi. After receiving the gun, he examined it confirming it was the same one Chen Zheng used. Then he went back to the room, grabbed a water hose, and from there, he threw water onto the balcony, without even warning Zhou Kier. She entered the apartment while the water was falling, and in a short time, Chen Zheng and everyone else woke up screaming. Looking at their hands and feet tied together, he realized he had been drugged. All he could do was curse Zhang Yi a few times. After a few sprays of water, Chen Zheng turned into a popsicle. 
Dr. Joe Keir, too weak even to stand up, calls and says it's all done. After a few minutes, our beautiful doctor was at Zhang Yi's door, observing through the cameras. Even though everything has gone well so far, he wanted to make sure there were no risks. She should open the heavy door and enter while he pointed the gun. She finally entered and fell to the floor. Just the warmth inside the apartment was good enough. Approaching from behind, Zhang Yi says it's not over yet. He has to make sure they're not hiding anything from each other. He has to be sure of that, and she knows how to do it. Blushing, she knows what she has to do. Zhou Kier takes off everything and remains only in her underwear. Now that he can see she's not hiding anything, Zhang Yi says it's perfect now, leading her to the room where she must take a shower and change her dirty clothes. When he heard the sound of the shower, he took all the items from the medical kit and confiscated them. It was always better to be cautious. A pleasant time later, Zhou Kier dressed in pajamas, came out of the bathroom, a sight that moved Zhang Yi. He asked her to sit down and dry her hair. He says he let her go because she's valuable to him. If she doesn't obey the rules, he won't show any mercy. Her room will be that one. From now on, you'll live there. Without my permission, you're not allowed to wander. She was aware of the consequences. Zhang Yi says that in this chaotic world, the best thing she did was join him. To reinforce the trust between them, Zhang Yi decides to reveal his secret and ensure Zhou Qi's loyalty. In this house, she can see that there is no food. The reason he is so prepared for everything is that he has a power nobody knows about. He took bread from the dimensional storeroom in front of her. If she betrays or kills him, she will no longer have food and will starve to death. Seeing this, he understood how Zhang Yi was living so comfortably. She ate and even cried with emotion, almost choking with such haste. Now that she is clean, without hunger or thirst, Zhou Kier will be responsible for all household chores. Before she could accept, the scoundrel interrupted, asking what else she could offer. Being an intelligent person, she knew what he wanted. Zhang Yi's eyes even widened with the sight. Besides companionship and help with the tasks, now they would be a couple. Like any couple, they would have their moment of exercise together, and our beautiful doctor, Zhou Kier, would have plenty of food. The next day, looking at Zhou Kier still sleeping, Zhang Yi says she must have been very tired from last night. Having a woman around when they can't leave the house anymore is very pleasant. She dressed and they went to have breakfast, a life with more luxury than before the apocalypse. Zhang Yi threw one of the special cold coats to her. Going outside, Zhang Yi said she still has work to do. He handed her the baseball bat, even though she helped freeze the guys outside. Now Zhou Kier must go there and destroy the frozen bodies, without explaining why she went there without hesitation and started to bash the popsicles. Meanwhile, Zhang Yi filmed all the hard work of the doctor. Not caring about being filmed, she continued to hammer. The purpose of the recording was to send it to the residence group and show everyone that Chen Zheng, the guy who was terrorizing everyone, is now in pieces. The people in their homes didn't even think to criticize or ask why the doctor was there. They just praised and celebrated. Pleased with how things turned out, Zhang Yi received a call from Yu Qing. Zhang Yi says he didn't know she was still alive. The girl with a crazy look says she heard about Chen Zheng's death and is now ready to be his woman, and that he must be with Zhou Qi because he thought she was dead. Her friends behind her were ready to kill the girl, and they both heard the screams from the other side. Zhang Yi took advantage of this to mess with her mind even more, sending a picture of Zhou Qi saying that she was his fiance. When she saw the new message, she broke free from the two girls and ran to the phone just to see Zhang Yi and his girlfriend. The girl went insane, saying that she loves Zhang Yi more than anyone. However, Zhang Yi threw it in her face that she doesn't matter, and who he loves is the one with him now, and hung up. The poor girl's friends didn't even want to hit Yu Qing anymore. Their anger was at the girl going to live with Zhang Yi and them getting screwed, but now they're screwed together. Satisfied with how much she suffered, Zhang Yi asks his little girlfriend if he was too cruel. She says that whether he was or not doesn't matter. He has his reasons. She also heard of him for the first time when she went to help the two girls and how they seemed crazy. If Zhang Yi did what he did, it's right. A person in the building in front decided he couldn't take it anymore and decided to fulfill his dream of jumping from the building, but that didn't even impress the two. Shortly after Zhang Yi's phone rang, on the line was his uncle Yu, happy. Zhang Yi says it's great to know he's okay. He survived everything thanks to the supplies he saved from Zhang Yi's warning. Furthermore, now he is with Shi Lemay, the single mother from before. Her son is sick, and they need medicine. Of all the people, Uncle Yu was the only person Zhang Yi would help, so he told him to come get the medicine later. After telling Zhou Qi about his uncle and having his juice, someone was knocking on the door. Checking the security cameras, he saw it was his uncle and Zi Limei. That's all they had. He didn't even open the door. He threw the medicine through the opening in the door onto the floor. His uncle thanked him for the help, but the woman wanted more than that. She knows he has a fireplace and asked to come in. Her baby needs to warm up. At this point, Zhang Yi says it's screwed. He didn't want to hurt Uncle Yu, but above all, safety comes first. He lied that the coal ran out 
and now he and his girlfriend have seven or eight coats to keep warm. Uncle didn't want to bother Zhang Yi anymore, but the woman insisted more and more on coming in because they couldn't if Zhou Qir the doctor was with him. Zhang Yi's argument was that she's engaged to him, and that's why she's here. She blushed all over, hearing that. Finally, Uncle Yu got tired of hearing it and said that's enough. Just the medicine was great, they still have food. After sending them away, Zhang Yi was even tired. This woman in his past life survived for nothing. Since this conversation tired him out, he went to rest on his girlfriend's lap and have a great view. Zhang Yi thinks that Zi Limei being around could even mess up his plans. It's no wonder that when they returned home, uncle came to ask why she was abusing his nephew's trust. She even says it's all for the baby's best interest, but uncle reminds her that he owes his nephew. If it weren't for him telling him to save food before the apocalypse, he would have nothing. Instead of agreeing, Zi Limei claimed that Zhang Yi didn't give medicine to help. Everything was for him to collect favors later, saying that Zhang Yi is a selfish man. Uncle hearing this shouted that everything has limits. He may be old, but he's not stupid. If she badmouths him again, she'll be alone. The smart woman let the subject drop. <laughs> the following morning, people from another building dug a tunnel under the snow to Zhang Yi's building. Everyone they encountered was seen as enemies, and the first unlucky one received a single shot and flipped over. They were aware of the sturdy door and brought dynamite to open it. One of them lit it, ran, and the damage from the explosion was done. The absurd noise of this explosion woke Zhang Yi up, and he quickly went to check what was happening. Through the cameras, he saw construction workers who lived nearby. They came to check, certain that the explosion would destroy the door, but nothing happened. Angry at this attempt to take what he had, Zhang Yi retaliated maliciously. A grenade simply solved their cold problem. After warming them all up, Zhang Yi used his Glock and put several to sleep. His bullets were running out because his ballistic supplies were few, and this confirmed to him that people from other buildings must know about his stockpile and are coming after it too. These explosions and shots left our lovely doctor frightened. After all, there's only one place in the world where it's normal to hear these noises every day. Embarrassed, she disguised it and went to do her job. Now it was clear to Zhang Yi that he should take action. In the residence group, everyone was asking about the noise from before. Zhang Yi, smart as always, said it was residents from another building who tried to blow up his house and were soon going to rob the others, but he kicked them out of the building and some from this life. Everyone thanked Zhang Yi for this. He called his uncle to get more information. This group that came now is from building 26 and is led by someone named Huang Tian Fang. The uncle's information is that he did the same thing Chun Zheng did in this building, overturned the residents, took control of the place, and also stole food. Zhang Yi made it clear to his uncle that he overturned many, so they will come back for revenge and try something, so they must unite the neighboring residents and defend themselves. Then, speaking only with Zhou Kier, Zhang Yi said that the neighbors, if given the chance, will stab him in the back. She must take on the mission of gathering information about the other buildings groups together with Uncle Yu. Only two days passed, and now she was dressed as a maid and reporting everything her intelligence service found out. Stop looking in the wrong place and pay attention. Zhou Kier explains that the strongest groups dominating the neighborhood are the group from Building 26 that came here two days ago, and another group from Building 21. Still, a group from two other buildings must have strength, but they haven't done anything yet. With just this, Zhang Yi deduced that the residents of the other buildings have already turned on each other instead of uniting and are no longer a threat. Grateful for the good work, he tells her to continue collecting information, and for some reason, she blushes, perhaps thinking something else would happen. The same group from Building 26 returned to the building, and this time they started overturning people from the other apartments in the building, and left the message that until Zhang Yi leaves, all the building's residents will die. Soon, this news spread and disrupted our couple's exercise. The building's residents were demanding that Zhang Yi take action. Seeing this, that anger returned. He sent texts and audio messages saying that everyone's life means nothing to him, and they must defend themselves alone. Shortly after, Zhang Yi called his uncle, saying that now it's his turn to shine. In the building group, he said that the gang from Building 26 is only 20 people. If they join forces, they can fight against them. Speaking, everyone agreed that they had to do it. He also said in the chat that he hasn't been eating well for days. The only one who is young, strong, and well-fed is Zhang Yi. He is the only one with the strength to lead everyone. With this, Zhang Yi sent a message in the chat that he can help everyone face the rival building as long as everyone follows his orders. Everyone said they accept following orders that don't endanger their lives. Calm in his home, eating better than us. Zhang Yi says they'll have to take the risks. Yes. Otherwise, they should just wait for the group from Building 26 to come and kill everyone. With Uncle Yu on one side encouraging them to agree to follow Zhang Yi, they accepted to obey. To motivate the hungry, he mentioned that there are vehicles that can travel 
outside in the snow. If they confront the group from Building 26, he can fetch food for them. All the neighbors agreed to obey everything, even the most dangerous things, hoping not to be killed by the neighbors, and mainly to gain food. Now everyone agrees to put Zhang Yi as the leader of the building. Now that everyone sees him as a savior, Zhang Yi will make his first exploration outside. With his special cold vests and clothes, he won't have any problems. When Zhou Kier was about to say she would go with him, Zhang Yi said no. She should never leave the apartment, and he trusts her 100% to stay here without him. But as soon as he leaves, the scoundrel snaps his fingers and makes all the supplies in the apartment disappear. He descends to the fourth floor of the building, and through a window there, he manages to jump outside. So, the snow is already four stories high. Anyone who tries to walk here, ignoring the cold, would sink into the snow somewhere and perish. Fortunately, he had stored a snowmobile in his dimensional space. Someone in one of the buildings saw the scene. I don't know if they saw him pulling a snowmobile out of nowhere, or just saw him riding it. Sometime later, he reached where he wanted to go, the Tianhui City Police Station. Breaking the glass, he entered without difficulty. His goal is to get more weapons and ammunition. Deeper into the police station, he found the officers on duty, without warm clothes or heaters. The first night of freezing was the last for them. Zhang Yi shows his respect for the officers, and says they were once the heroes who protected the city. As he covers the bodies, he finds the keys to the place. With them, he can open everything here, even the weapons room. Upon entering the place, it's heaven for many people. There are all kinds of weapons and ammunition to choose from. He just put everything into his dimensional loot space. Zhang Yi says that now he needs to get food for his cannon fodder. He returns to his snowmobile and walks to where the shopping mall should be. Digging into the ground, he found the ceiling of the place. Breaking the glass and walking through the place, he stole everything that could be useful. In the supermarket, all the fruits were frozen solid by the cold, as were the meats, but this would serve those who don't even have land to eat. He threw into the bags what could be salvaged and returned to his snowmobile. Upon returning to his building, the leader of Building 26, watching him manage to go out and get food, was green with envy and eager to steal that snowmobile. Furthermore, all the residents of the building who heard the noise of the snowmobile also saw it. Uncle Yu saw that his nephew managed to return with more food. He was delighted. Zhang Yi made it clear to everyone that it was extremely difficult to go outside in such cold weather and find food buried in the snow. Uncle Yu shouted, calling Zhang Yi a hero. With this spoiled food and the gun in hand, he ordered that everyone who chooses to take food must be ready to obey his orders. The residents of Building 26, as expected, came after, saying to hand over the food or their lives. His first order was that right now, they will steal their food, go there, and eliminate them. Everyone who makes a kill will receive food for five days. Just hearing that they could get five days worth of food, everyone went crazy and attacked the gang member from Building 26. They couldn't understand how the weak and fearful people suddenly went so crazy, they were overwhelmed. Zhang Yi and his fiance watched everyone defeat the enemies and celebrate their victory. Some who survived fled back to Building 26, and the wounded on our side, Jo Kier knew she could save them, but she knew she would need to spend medicines and food just out of kindness. She also gave up, because she knew Zhang Yi wouldn't allow it. I ask here now, do you think Zhang Yi is a villain or just an anti-hero or, I don't know, just does what it takes to survive? Because from now on, he starts to use all people in a very cunning way. He gathers everyone and congratulates them. Those who were MVP and had the most kills received their bonuses. This was premeditated to encourage everyone to strive for him. One by one, they obeyed the guy with a gun in hand and owner of the food. No one had happiness on their faces. But when it was the turn of someone Zhang Yi saw slacking off, he scorned and kicked a candy to him. He complained that this wasn't fair because he would only receive that. Zhang Yi questioned if he had the courage to complain still. The guy did nothing and just stayed behind, shouting and attacking. Those who received less food and were sad are now happy to know that there are worse off people. Trying to argue, Xu Hao said there were many people fighting and he couldn't find a way to join the fight. Zhang Yi made it clear he didn't care, only results matter. Angrily, Xu Hao insisted that Zhang Yi was treating him specially. So Zhang Yi gave the order and two neighbors held the discontented guy. He just shouted, asking what happens to those who disobey the boss's orders. After making, it clears what happens to those who complain. The guy taken as an example had the candy in his hand. Zhang Yi stepped on it, grabbed the candy and the poor guy's hair, and made it clear that work equals food. No work equals no food. He ordered Zhou Kier to store the rest of the supplies, since everyone had taken their shares. In the middle of the crowd, he heard a familiar voice. Fang Yu Ching and her bloodsucker friend were dragging themselves underneath. They said they hadn't gotten their food yet, and if big brother Zhang Yi hadn't forgotten about them, Zhang Yi, humble as always, said he hadn't forgotten about them. Zhou Kier stored the food, because there wasn't enough for the two of them. Fang Yu Ching, crying, asked why he didn't like her anymore after all these years. With a slap, he told her to get away. He never liked her, and is now engaged to the wonderful Zhou Kier. One of the women said that she was a gold-digging slut. Zhang Yi agreed,
agreed, saying she always deceived rich boys to take their money. The guy, who had just been humiliated, said she had used him many times before. Then the other men said that if they had known she was selling herself before the apocalypse, they would have taken advantage too. After being humiliated so much, she fled. For some reason, two men grabbed the bloodsucker friend and dragged her somewhere else. By their expression and covering her mouth, I imagine they went to feed her. For her, Xu Hao, for telling about Fang Yuqing, received something better to eat and now swore he would do better for the master. After the show, Zhang Yi began to organize the building's fortification. In the building, there are 47 people in total. Now, excluding Zhang Yi, Zhou Kier, Uncle Yu, and his wife, Shi Li Mei, the people form six groups of seven people each and take turns guarding the building's stairs 24 hours a day. When enemies arrive, they should shout, make noise, and alert everyone. Uncle Yu, being a former army veteran, will organize all the groups. Back in the comfort of home, Zhang Yi was studying something, and Zhou Kier asked, if it starts to snow now, what will happen? As he took his weapons out of the dimensional loot storage, he said, they're in winter. They'll be stuck for at least a month until the snow melts. Besides, in the apocalypse, the biggest danger isn't the weather, but people. Now, with this WAP weapon, he has a chance to fight enemies without leaving home. He noticed through the scope of the weapon that some people were heading to the garage of his building. They're definitely going after the snowmobile that Zhang Yi pretends to leave there, but actually puts in the loot storage. Uncle Yu called Zhang Yi saying the defense team was properly organized and asking not to take seriously what Xi Lemay said last time they went to get medicine. She's a chatterbox after all. Zhang Yi said he didn't care but asked if uncle wanted to raise someone else's child. In difficult times, strong men are very valuable, and he could get any woman he wanted. But realizing uncle's discomfort, Zhang Yi said Xi Lemay is also a good woman, and if that's the case, he should knock her up too. However, uncle said that in an apocalypse, one shouldn't think about that, and now he'll go back to work. Zhang Yi told Zhou Kier that these matters of children should be thought about calmly. In the tunnel they dug, some people from Building 26 came back secretly, planning to make hidden thefts. The first of them almost got a beating. The guard shouted enemy attack, and a brawl started on the stairs. The group from Building 26 didn't count on the fact that now Zhang Yi's building was so well protected, and the survivors fled. Outside, enjoying the good life, Zhang Yi saw the enemies fleeing and said he was really in the mood to shoot some, taking his WAP from the loot storage. Through the scope, he could see perfectly, with an absurd calmness, even knowing the result of pulling the trigger. One of the fugitives got a shot right in the head, and the others, realizing what it was, ran even more frantically. Zhang Yi thought to himself, this feeling is great, and decided to enjoy it more. All the shots were precise, aiming at the head and the clock. With seven capsules on the ground, there were seven bodies in the snow. With this, he was sure he had sent a message to all the neighbors of the buildings. Zhang Yi, leader of Building 25, has a rifle, and there's no way to confront him. Now they must follow his orders. The next day, Zhou Kier brought food, saying she was practicing her cooking. Additionally, she asked about the noise on the balcony last night. Without hiding anything, Zhang Yi said he shot and killed seven people. The woman's reaction was simply to say that Zhang Yi is amazing. Zhang Yi even asked if she wasn't curious why he used an AWP to do it. Zhou Kier said it's none of her business, and it doesn't matter what he did. She's with him, and it's better than dying outside. In other words, she doesn't care what he does to others outside. Zhang Yi even praised her, saying she's smart and doesn't have unnecessary curiosities, and he likes that. Meanwhile, on the other side, residents of Building 26 looked at the bodies in the snow. One of them is related to the boss, worried because they didn't get any food and now lack men to carry out their plans. Tian Fan got irritated and ordered to bring the bodies of David, his relative, and the others to have more food. Meanwhile, Zhang Yi decided to go out for another round. Everyone respects him now, and of course, they're very scared. Scared. With headphones on and Uncle Yu on the line, Zhang Yi is now sure the building is safe. Meanwhile, the leader of Building 26 could only stew in bitterness. If he could get that motorcycle, he could go out to get cigarettes and food. Those who went before to look for the motorcycle didn't find it in the parking lot and were shot. Zhang Yi rode the motorcycle until he reached where he wanted to go, the district of machines and imported cars. The warehouses were so large that they hadn't been covered by snow yet. Breaking the roof, he descended with a rope and put everything in his infinite loot storage warehouse. Now these luxury cars have no value, but at some point, they might. The next step was to go to a gas station. He needs it for his generators and machines, including his snowmobile. Unfortunately, for him, the station was completely buried in snow. It was impossible to dig 10 meters. Frustrated that his plans didn't work out for the first time, he threw himself into the snow and thought about how good it would be to have gasoline for all his stored machines. It was thinking about that that he remembered he also had a giant excavator stored. With the little fuel he has, he can dig and dig in the snow. It didn't take long until he managed to clear a path to the gas station. Inside 
Inside the place are the warehouse tanks of the station. Luckily, the fuel isn't frozen. All he needed to do was seal the tanks and store them intact in his loot storage space. For a moment, he realizes that with this and his excavator, he can dig and retrieve everything buried, and no one will be able to stop him. Meanwhile, in the building, a neighbor's child had a high fever. Joe Kier went to attend to the child, but couldn't do much because Zhang Yi always keeps the medicines. Uncle Yu brought leftover medicine from his girlfriend Zi Lemay's son. He comforted the mother that everything will be fine. The child's fever decreased. However, Joe Kier reminded the mother to keep an eye on his condition. They had barely stepped away when they heard a scream. Aunt Lin attacked the baby, and in the impulse to protect her son, the mother intervened and got shot. Joe Kier managed to grab the baby for a few seconds. Aunt Lin went crazy, saying that because they didn't help her grandson, he didn't survive, so no one has the right to have children here anymore. The lovely Joe Kier, determined to save the child, ran with him through the stairs. Aunt Lin managed to grab the doctor's leg. Like the mother, she protected the child with her body. Aunt Lin was determined to kill everything in her path. Uncle Yu kicked Aunt Lin and threw her down the stairs. He arrived just in time to save the boss's wife. He wouldn't forgive himself for failing to keep everything safe in his absence. Aunt Lin was furious with all of them. Uncle Yu made it clear that Zhang Yi eliminated Chen Zheng, and that's why everyone is safe. Additionally, Zhou Kier recounted that after Chen Zheng was gone, she begged Zhang Yi to give medicine to her grandson. However, when she went to deliver it, she found out that Aunt Lin herself had killed her grandson to eat him. Leaving the old woman screaming in denial, the men who came with Uncle Yu said that she must pay for her evil deeds, and they can help. According to them, fat burns well, and it's been a long time since they had a good bonfire. <laughs> Returning to Zhang Yi, outside the house, he slept in a tent at the gas station, and now he's going out for more exploration. With his excavator, he went to the city's military post, and by digging, he gained access to the military base. However, all the military supplies were taken. All he thought was that the military leaders, with all the equipment, are the ones who will try to take power from the surviving society. If that's the case, he should arm himself to protect himself even from these people. While digging for something else, he broke a wall of the camp. To our surprise, not everything was taken by the army army. An absurd amount of weapons and ammunition in this place went straight to his loot storage. After so long away, he returned home on his snowmobile, and this time without bringing back food. The neighbors noticed he was without food, and immediately started complaining. Zhang Yi countered that even for a whole day this time, he couldn't find anything. But if they want, they can go back to having to go outside to find their food and not follow him anymore, and he calls them ungrateful. Zhang Yi realized that by not bringing back food for one day, they felt unfairly treated, because his work of defending the building wasn't being paid off. Off. Even though he said the discussion was over, some of the residents approached, suggesting that he could take some of them next time to search, and that way, he could rest more. Not only Zhang Yi, but we didn't even notice this strange guy with a hand hidden behind his back. Zhang Yi made a hand gesture, and the next moment, the rebel took a hit to the head and fell to the ground. The others who were with him apologized, but Zhang Yi made it clear that there is no forgiveness. He shot everyone, and at least four of them went to sleep. The rest fled through the window. The noise caught the attention of Uncle Yu and Zhou Kier, who ran their work Hurriedly, he simply said that they were traitors, and he responded with mercy. Uncle Yu simply said they were so comfortable they forgot their place. Zhang Yi then went home, as if what happened now didn't matter at all. Zhe Li Mei stayed there, thinking that this mercy he mentioned is just to warn others. With no one questioning what happened, they go home while Zhang Yi thinks his cannon fodder is running out. In the comfortable home, Zhang Yi asked Zhou Kier if anything had happened while he was away. She recounted that Aunt Lin had gone crazy due to her grandson's death and attacked a mother, but that was already resolved. Additionally, someone from another building called Chen Ling Yu wanted to discuss something with Zhang Yi, but she didn't say the specific details, just that she wanted to cooperate with him. Not knowing what this person could offer, Zhang Yi didn't care. He has everything he needs, and those people outside can only wait to die of cold and hunger. Curious if he was just going to ignore the woman's request, he asked for his information, and what Zhou Kier knows about this person is that Chen Ling Yu owned a cosmetics company and now completely controls Building 9. The only surprise to Zhang Yi for this is how a woman had the power to take control of an entire building. Out of curiosity, Joe Kier says he should talk to this woman, so he already had messages from her and the leader of another building on his phone. He went straight to Chen Ling to ask what she wanted. She wanted to speak by voice, and Zhang Yi immediately said he didn't have the patience to speak. It will be by text. On the other end of the line, Chen Ling only thought that this person who took down Building 26 has a snowmobile and a rifle is tough. She says they heard about him and know he has a snowmobile. He asks what they have to offer. Basically, there's 76 workers who can use his snowmobile 
snowmobile to search for food too. In summary, she wants the snowmobile and for him to provide food for them beforehand so they have the strength to search more with his snowmobile and he should know that soon all the people in the neighborhood could turn against him. So it's smart to have allies. Discontented now, he asked what happens if he refuses. He had never seen beggars ask for food with threats. Chen Ling was calm and made it clear that currently, Zhang Yi is a target for all the neighboring buildings. It's only a matter of time before everyone unites to attack them all together if he doesn't cooperate. In this situation, he asked for time to think about it. Hanging up the phone as he looked at the other buildings, he knew his home was impenetrable, but if everyone united, they could bring down his building in an extreme situation. While he was thinking of a way out, another person was calling him on the phone now. This time it was Li Jian, who also asked to cooperate. His building 18 had been pacified, and everyone cooperated with each other, distributing resources among themselves, and his focus is on maintaining people's humanity. He is willing to help building 25 to enter into conflict with the others, and any service he has, in exchange for just a few supplies. Zhang Yi asked Zhou Kier what things are like in building 18. Her information is that she indicated that Li Jian unified all the residents of the building after the apocalypse, but his resources for so many people wouldn't last long. He replied that he needed to think too. Soon he saw that several other people had messaged him. Zhang Yi went to Zhou Kier to show that he might have to kill them all. At this moment, the doctor's mind was that she made the right choice in joining Zhang Yi. This time he asked his girlfriend for advice, but the strange thing is that at the same time, he put the jubilee on the line and asked what was better, to cooperate or to destroy them all. Then she couldn't even answer properly because she couldn't concentrate. You know what I mean. Sometime later, he asked her to cut a bulletproof vest for him to put on his legs. His plan now was as follows. In the group of residents of his building, he told them that the neighbors threatened him to hand over the snowmobile or they will attack the building. If he does that, everyone in the building will have to go look for their own food from now on. Soon, everyone turned against and ready to follow Zhang Yi to go against the other buildings. It didn't take long for Zhang Yi to be placed in a new group with only the leaders of the neighboring buildings. There, they made it clear that if Zhang Yi refuses to follow all the terms, they will become public enemies of all the buildings. They made all the demands, letting everything happen as they wanted. He had the brilliant idea, decided to cooperate, and set up a meeting with all the leaders. His idea was to eliminate all the leaders. The rest of the residents without leaders won't be able to organize against him. With a meeting place set, he went down, arranged with his followers from the building, and to encourage everyone, he gave them quality food, saying they need to be strong and energized to defend their home. One of them asked if they could hope for peace. Zhang Yi says not only that, but if everything goes well, there won't be any more food problems for anyone here. Motivated, everyone is now idolizing their savior and willing to do anything for him. Exiting through the tunnel and not through the windows, Zhang Yi and all the residents went to the designated place. Even from afar, he noticed something strange. There were so many people here, so he ordered Uncle Yu and the rest of the residents to come too, and he will stay behind hidden with his rifle. At the negotiation field, Uncle Yu and the residents stood in front of all the leaders of the neighboring buildings and their groups. One of ours said they didn't seem to want to negotiate. The other completes saying, they seem more like they want to destroy them. With so many of them attacking each other, they wouldn't stand a chance. However, Uncle Yu stated that their goal is to make Zhang Yi cooperate. Attacking us wouldn't help with that. The building owners of 26, 5, 21, 9, and 18 were confident. Zhang Yi might be intimidating, but against so many people, he doesn't have the power to face them all. One of them says he doesn't see Zhang Yi, so he must be scared after seeing our numbers. The situation is totally in their favor. Tianfang shouts for him to show up soon for negotiation. Uncle Yu warns that the leader will only meet with the leaders, so they should come this way. Chen Ling and the others disagree, and ask if they aren't afraid of death. Realizing how things were going, Zhang Yi called Uncle Yu, warning them to stay away from the other groups. Uncle Yu, clever as always, told them to wait a moment and had his group retreat. With this distance, Zhang Yi whistled to get everyone's attention. In the open field, nobody knew exactly where Zhang Yi was, nor where the grenade he threw into the midst of the other building groups came from. Behind the leaders, a massive explosion occurred, resulting in a hole where everyone nearby was obliterated. Uncle Yu put the phone on speaker behind the leaders and asked if they had any questions for him. Wang Chang, in shock, asked why so much violence. Zhang Yi questioned over the phone, why more than a thousand people for a negotiation? Already heading back into his building, he said there were five minutes left until the appointed time. If they didn't agree to come talk to him at building 25, it was over. Chen Ling spoke for everyone that they would accept it. Already in one of the apartments, Zhang Yi was content. With just one blast, more than 20 people were gone. This will convince him, and now he only has 20 of them left. Sometime later, all the leaders rushed up the stairs of the building to reach the designated place. As there are no elevators, they are all tired. He only asked if everyone was there, confirming that they were. The meeting began. The residents in the room calmly laid out their conditions as before, of how he should cooperate. Unsatisfied with this, he drew his Glock and placed it on the table. Instantly, everyone was shocked, so Zhang Yi said it was just bothering him on his waist. Continue. None of them wanted to ignore this and said,
said that if they flip, the others will join forces against him. Thus Zhang Yi took the lead in the discussion. First point, he doesn't agree with their demands. Providing food for so many people is impossible for him. The most he can give is 10 meals per day for each building. How they use them is up to them. Chen Ling was indignant. This is too little. Only in her building, there are 76 people. Zhang Yi then made it clear. It's either this or war. With no way out, Tian Fang took the lead, saying that Chen Ling doesn't represent everyone. They want to accept, but it won't convince everyone to cooperate if they're left without food. Zhang Yi cocked his glock, asking if this is really too little for them. Li Jiang, the most peaceful of all, took the lead, saying he wants to talk. It's always better than a shot to the head. At this point, Zhang Yi put his foot on the table, saying that food isn't infinite. Even if they search, they'll eventually run out. He pulled a bunch of seeds out of his pocket and threw them on the table. His point is, they should start planting food to be able to make their own food. Tian Fang quickly questioned, what sense does it make to try to plant in the ice? Using his glock, he pointed out, there's land under the snow, water won't be lacking. His condition is that all buildings must put their men to dig and plant every day, and in return he will give 10 meals to each building. Moreover, he can provide medicines, drinks, and cigarettes. Upon hearing cigarettes, the two smokers forgot everything and said they accept everything if they can take a drag. Zhang Yi took out a closed wallet from his magic pocket and gave it to them to try. While they smoke, he stands aside, asking if they agree. Every day they can get a box of cigarettes. Li Jam wanted to say something, but the smokers stepped in front and said they accept everything he said. They just need to be able to smoke every day. The rest of the three leaders are yet to respond, intimidated by the person with the glock in hand and who has already convinced two of the leaders. One of the leaders pressured the others to accept. The two are already on his side and now want to please him, as much as the others want to discuss better. The two don't give an opening. Meanwhile, Zhang Yi goes to the window and notices that the residents of the buildings are starting to move. His reaction then is to move his glock to the leaders and ask, what's this? Wang Qian, who was already bought, affirmed that all the leaders are here. There's no reason for anyone to attack them. Li Jian then says that if they are attacking, it's on their own accord. Zhang Yi shouts for the others to come in. Everyone here in the room is trapped here. Meanwhile, Zhang Yi takes out his rifle, and somehow no one saw his magic happen. With his scope, he identifies who's leading the others into rebellion. With a perfect shot, the leaders were knocked out, one after the other. Zhang Yi knocked down everyone who was taking the lead. The leaders sitting in the room were terrified to hear what was happening. A few minutes later, and Zhang Yi was calm, saying the situation was resolved. Asking if everyone is okay with the negotiation, soon the two smokers said yes. The rest who didn't want to accept were forced to accept. The last was the honest Li Jin. Now that everyone agrees, tomorrow afternoon, they will start. Leaving the room, he patted Li Qian's things and asked him to do a good job. Meanwhile, he will keep an eye on them. Leaving the building, all the leaders seem nervous, so the residents were curious about what happened. Zhang Yi tells them how he controlled the situation, but had to make a deal to provide about 300 meals for them every day. Not content with this, because why should he give so much food? Zhang Yi uses this. According to him, if it weren't for this, they should fight against over thousand neighboring motors, which would certainly lead to many deaths here, and he could not accept that, so he resigned to so much food for their well-being. Now all the residents of Building 25 cried with so much emotion, Zhang Yi is the only one who could lead and take care of everyone so well. Everyone left, only Uncle Yu stayed there. The old man embarrassed says that things didn't happen as he imagined they would. Zhang Yi took Uncle to a more private place, and there told the truth. The plan was to eliminate the leaders of all the apartments at once, but only the five most influential leaders were sent, so the plan was postponed. If the five leaders had been knocked out, the others would take their place and be more motivated to destroy Building 25. Uncle Yu now, yes, understood why there wasn't so much destruction, now it's because there will be later. He understood and was impressed at how his nephew is so good at calculating things. Now it's a matter of time. The other residents will weaken as the days go by working. 300 meals alone will make them destroy themselves from within, not fight for the little food they will receive. Zhang Yi made it clear to uncle not to tell anyone about this. Returning to his luxury home, his wife was doing yoga. What a difficult life they have. After so much work Zhou Kier wanted to know how the negotiations went. His response was that in the next few days, all he has to do is this. He threw her on the bed and said she shouldn't leave the house for the next few days. Be prepared. After a hot night, the next day it was very cold outside, but still everyone was put to digging as promised. Their mission is to reach the ground 10 meters below the snow, to plant. He just passed by to make sure everything was being done, then went far away to get his snowmobile. The other two leaders said they searched and couldn't find his snowmobile anywhere. Where could he hide it? Zhang Yi's goal today was to find a veterinary clinic. There he knew he could find the poison they use to euthanize animals that are beyond saving, he said. With this amount he has here, he could knock out 300 people since they won't be able to find treatment. He knows that when the time is right, he will use it. Returning home, he made sure to gather plenty of supplies for his building beforehand. Everyone was impressed at how much he got this time. With a phone call he notified the other buildings to come pick up their share of the deal. The leaders sent three 
three people from each building for this, perhaps out of fear of being ambushed. Little by little, the 30 neighboring buildings picked up their first day of meals, and everyone was happy to start seeing food. As he left, he heard the workers saying they were tired from today's hard work, but it was worth it. So without a plan, things are going well. Returning to his comfortable home, his abode was always tidy, and he had everything he needed there, even a hot shower every day. Meanwhile, in the other buildings, Wang Qian saw his subordinate arrive, and the first thing he checked was if there were cigarettes. Everyone behind him quickly expressed that they were suffocating and would die if they didn't get a smoke. Soon, everyone was relaxed, and only then did they think about food. He allowed everyone to start eating, but he didn't calm down until he was sure the food wasn't poisoned. His group was confident they had food, but the other workers in the building were waiting for their share, which never came. That night, the protagonist left his bath peacefully and heard the neighborhood arguments over food distribution while he and his wife were stuffing themselves. The next day, everyone was digging, and as the protagonist prepared for his daily round, he left a warning to be cautious due to the food shortages, causing disputes. After that, he went out on his snowmobile to find more food. After a few hours, he returned with even less food. Zhang Yi told everyone that the search for supplies outside was unpredictable and that they should be content with what they had. His plan was to further accelerate internal conflicts. That same day, the buildings reached the point of throwing residents out to have fewer mouths to feed. While many were falling into chaos, he was cozy at home, listening to music and preparing his equipment. The next day he saw the result, dozens of people thrown out, with the buildings bearing the marks of the disputes. Some asked if they had to dig today too. Zhang Yi coldly walked among the bodies, saying that if they didn't want to end up like those people, then yes. Soon, everyone rushed to dig in the snow, which Zhang Yi observed, but Uncle Yu noted that few people had come to work today. Of course sir, look how many people are down. Only Zhang Yi's team was here today, but tomorrow that would change. It was a message to all the neighborhood residents. Those who didn't work wouldn't get food or cigarettes. The next day, the number of people working was almost normal. Uncle Yu questioned why so many people had returned to work when they knew there wouldn't be enough food for everyone. Zhang Yi implied that they were here to get food anyway, and the bodies from the previous day were slowly disappearing. As he was leaving, Chen Ling approached him to talk. She was dirty and worried, wanting to discuss the current chaos. If things continued like this, with so little food, the residents would end up killing each other. She suggested that the two of them could think of a scientific way to solve the food problem for everyone. They could even consider expanding their territory. If they joined forces, they could create a kingdom in this end of the world. Zhang Yi's look turned malicious. He accused her of trying to deceive people to gain power, and said that because of how she operated, many in her building were dead. Her previous negotiation tactics wouldn't work with him. Zhang Yi pushed her away, saying that people like her die early, and that she shouldn't count on him for anything. All that was left for her was to beg him to change his mind and make her his right-hand person. Strangely, despite everything, there were no casualties in Li Jian's building. Everyone was alive and working, curious about how this was possible. Zhang Yi went to Li Jian to ask how he managed to keep everyone alive and cooperating. The protagonist was insinuating that he was doing something to hide the truth. All the blocks were internally at war over food. Li Jian's response was simple. He said he hadn't hidden anything from his people, let them all know about the deal, and distributed the little food they received equally. Zhang Yi joked that the result of this was everyone starving equally, satisfied with knowing he was about to leave, but Li Jian asked him to wait. He said that Zhang Yi could help his residents. Zhang Yi then suggested that with Li Jian's leadership skills, he could choose only the strongest from his group and have more food. Instead, Li Jian preferred to maintain his honesty and try to protect everyone. In the end, they would all starve together. He left poor Li Jian alone with doubts about whether it was right to think of oneself and abandon others to stay alive. Zhang Yi went to the two corrupt leaders who had no complaints about the food they were receiving. He told them that if they needed anything, they could ask him. In his shadow, one could see who our protagonist truly was. He sympathized with those taking advantage of others and belittled those trying to help everyone and be honest. Other building leaders approached the protagonist later, asking to have the benefits that Wang Qian and Tian Fang had, only cigarettes. Everyone who was doing well with the little food that was coming wanted to have something to smoke too. He said that from tomorrow, everyone would be under his care too and dismiss the men. Other neighbors questioned Zhang Yi, asking why they felt entitled to ask for more things. The protagonist left, saying that certain people could earn more than others, planting a sense of jealousy among the other residents too. Returning home, he lay on his sofa and said it was just a matter of time. Things were going as he had planned, and soon everyone would be lying in the snow, like the others. Now he had to put the second part of his plan into action. Early the next day, he went in search of food. This time, he made sure to get plenty for everyone. With hunger spreading, he used the poison he had saved beforehand. The plan was going very well. Would the leaders not turn against him at some point? They shouldn't accept being dominated by one person. They must be plotting something. Although his absolute power of possessing various weapons made it impossible for them to go against him, Zhang Yi decided it was time to strike. Returning home with much more food
food than before, he asked his uncle Yu and the others to be there to protect him. This time, the leaders came to get their meals. The look of the leaders with whom he had more contact seemed strange. When it was the turn of Building 21, Zhang Yi turned his back to get the food and was surprised. They shouted to attack and drew their weapons. Shots rang out, and someone stepped forward to protect Zhang Yi. Caught off guard, it was the only person he trusted who stepped in front to save him from the shots. Soon, neighbors from other buildings approached to finish the job, confident that he was unarmed. One of them tried to hit him from behind. Not bothering to hide his skills, he simply pulled out a CS machine gun and started firing indiscriminately. No matter the absurd number of people, nothing could resist a nervous trigger finger. The group of traitors tried to run when they lost hope of toppling the protagonist, but even though many were running, they were all toppled with shots to the head. When the ammunition ran out, he pulled out two more pistols. Leaders Wang and Tianfang begged, saying they were not accomplices. However, forgiveness comes from God. The last one left was Chen Ling, and she said she really had nothing to do with it, and it might be true. She also revealed that she had a 13-year-old daughter to take care of. Without mercy, Zhang Yi shot her in the forehead. After taking down everyone, now perhaps with some real guilt, he said he was sorry, but he couldn't let the tigers return alive. Behind him, a sea of bodies. To the protagonist's surprise, someone was alive, Uncle Yu. He took an adrenaline injection from the warehouse, applying it to his chest. Two people from Building 25 were hiding. He shouted for them to help, and they carried Uncle Yu to Zhou Kier. On the way, Zilime saw her injured boyfriend and became worried. Why was he like this? What if he dies? How will she survive? The fact that the woman was only thinking about how she would lose her benefits made the protagonist angry, so much so that he told her to shut up and not worry. The woman's reaction changed. If old Yu doesn't survive, she won't be able to survive alone without protection. She says that if her love dies, he must take care of their child, because she will die too. Zhang Yi, not quite understanding why she was already jumping to conclusions that he won't survive. Does she perhaps want him not to survive? Si Lime starts crying, screaming that no, her husband must live. Tired of hearing her, Zhang Yi goes after uncle. In the woman's mind, Uncle Yu is her winning ticket to a good life, and she can't let him slip away. At the doorstep, he tells them all to go back to their homes, but the woman insists that her husband needs her by his side at this moment. Out of consideration for uncle, who genuinely likes the woman, he thinks about it and lets her stay. As he opens the door to his house, the color of things even changes. The air is warm, and Shi Lime cries tears of joy. This is the place she has been dreaming of living in for so long. While Zhang Yi and Zhou Kier bring uncle inside, Xie Lime goes to the kitchen and helps herself to something to drink, without asking permission, which surprises our couple. Soon the woman returns, all happy, asking if he has powdered milk, immediately arousing anger in Zhang Yi. She then says it's for the baby. Uncle Yu really likes the baby. The protagonist now makes it clear that the focus is on Uncle Yu. He goes to a different room in the house and retrieves a hospital stretcher from the dimensional warehouse. Zi Limi wonders if she just witnessed him perform a magic trick, but he ignores her, asking Zhou Kier if she needs any additional equipment or medicines, anything necessary to save Uncle. Zhou Kier removes Uncle's shirt. The bullet's location indicates internal organ damage. In these medical conditions, saving Uncle seems impossible. Upon hearing Zi Lime, he starts screaming and crying. Angry, he points at her, warning that if she interferes again, there will be serious consequences. She stops and says it's better for her to leave the room. In her mind, there's so much food and clean warm water here. Who would want to stay in this room just looking around? Realizing her intention, the protagonist steps in and makes it clear. She will stay here and help. She only entered because her presence is important to uncle. She will only leave this room when Joe Kier is finished. He leaves the women at home and rushes down to the first floor of the building, calling all the residents. They've been betrayed, and Uncle Yu might not survive, now they must strike. Most neighbors are against it. The other buildings house over a thousand people, and they are few. Zhang Yi points out that they should only watch outside. Anyone leaving the buildings will be attacked, and the rest inside, hiding within the buildings, he will take care of. Those who do not participate will be considered traitors, facing consequences similar to the dead bodies outside. There are warm clothes here for them. Soon the group arrives at the door of Building 21. Residents on the upper floors realize that Zhang Yi is leading their residents. Some who knew Zhang Yi could wield weapons could only stand paralyzed with fear. Most only had melee weapons, and he could magically produce a machine gun and mow them all down. The brave ones are confident that they are safe in the building. Zhang Yi puts everyone to watch the exits and windows, and he enters building 21. Arriving in the lobby, he gathers a bunch of wood and clothes from his storage dimension, places them in the lobby, and then pours gasoline over everything, connecting all the wood and clothes with trails of gasoline. He then lights his lighter, and being all witty, says he'll be kind, and help them warm up in this extreme cold. He throws the lighter into the gasoline. The flames quickly spread through the lobby, and he calmly leaves the scene. Smoke billowed up the floors through the building stairs. Everyone on the upper floors felt terror, screaming to open the windows, or they would suffocate with the smoke. However, many in their homes found that the extreme cold had frozen the windows. Without tools, they couldn't break them. The protagonist calmly exited building
Building 21, pointing to the building behind him, now emitting smoke, and said, The rest of you handle it now. Don't let anyone escape. As the flames grew, many couldn't bear the heat and chose to jump, landing in the snow below. Even if they didn't perish from burns, the fall shattered their spine. One woman had no pity for them as they crawled and caught fire. She simply buried her knife in them. Not even the men around her had such cold-bloodedness. The boyfriend, somewhat nervous, asked if she was okay. When the woman turned, she seemed like a sweet angel, saying that this was work. When anyone else fell and didn't die from the fall damage, she went there and helped the poor soul not suffer anymore. In a few minutes, the entire Building 21 was eliminated. Afterwards, Zhang Yi led his people to Building 26, led by Tian Fang. The residents panicked upon seeing what happened to Building 21. When they arrived, the residents shouted that they were not supporting Tian Fang and were innocent. Laughing, Zhang Yi said it didn't matter, they were all going to burn. A little while later, this building also met the same fate, and along with it, five other buildings were heated against the cold. His thought was that it was enough for one night. He told the residents of another building not to worry. He knew who the truly innocent ones were, and they would be fine. Some saw hope and were happy, but many others shouted that he must be tired after burning down five buildings. Ignoring the shouts, he gave the order that it was enough for today. After enduring the cold for so long, his people said they would stay outside and warm themselves by the fire. Even the fuel for the fire was from there. Then, he went to the bodies of the two who were most loyal to him. It didn't make sense for him to betray them, because they had always been treated well. Curious as to why he took their cell phones to investigate, looking at the conversations, he understood why. After dealing with the buildings involved in the rebellion, Zhang Yi returned home to see Uncle Yu. The steady rhythm of the heart rate monitor indicated that Uncle Yu was out of danger. He happily said that Zhou Kier was indeed the best surgeon in the city. As they talked, Zeli Mei approached, asking for something for her and her baby to eat. Looking disdainfully, he took out a packet of instant noodles from nowhere and threw it on the ground, saying he wouldn't let her starve, of course. But the woman didn't leave it at that and said that wasn't enough. In the kitchen, she saw there were eggs and chicken. At that moment, Zhang Yi almost exploded with anger. Even Zhou Kier was shocked by the woman's audacity. In the apocalypse, complaining about free food, the protagonist, irritated, said it was just instant noodles or she wouldn't eat anything. After that, he left with his girlfriend. They returned to the room. The tired Zhang Yi began to massage her legs. It started there and soon moved to her lips, then back to her legs. Zhou Kier recounted that Uncle Yu's recovery was unusual. During the surgery, his wounds began to heal rapidly. Hearing this, Zhang Yi had a sudden epiphany. He concluded that during the supernova explosion, a gamma ray wave passed through the earth and must have given powers to people under some condition. It could be that Uncle Yu had awakened some ability, like his dimensional storage ability. Accepting that was the case, he wondered why only he and now Uncle Yu were the only ones to awaken an ability. His idea was that the near-death state triggered it. He was dying at the hands of Fang Yuching, and his power saved him, while Uncle Yu was dying from three shots, and his regeneration power saved him. Accepting that was the case, he told Zhou Kier to keep his uncle sedated from now on. He could only wake up at the right time. Zhang Yi went to the living room, and there was Shi Mei looking for something to eat. He threw it in her face that he stored everything, so there's no use looking for anything. He also ordered her to go take care of Uncle Yu all the time and do whatever is necessary. Soon the woman obeyed and went to her husband's room. The next step was to go after another traitor, so he went up to the top floor of the building, with a police shield in hand, shot the lock on the door, and kicked it open. Feng Yuching ran towards him with a knife and hit the shield, losing the knife upon impact and falling backward. Zhang Yi remarked that it had been a long time since he'd seen the girl. Looking at her best friend on the table, he said he understood how someone as incompetent as her managed to stay alive. Lost in anger, madness, and other stupid feelings, she screamed. Why couldn't anyone kill him? It was Zhang Yi's fault. If he had been a loser like he always was, she would have accepted being with him. Zhang Yi didn't want to talk. He immediately hit her leg with a bat, breaking the bone. Then dragging her by the hair, he said he should have done it a long time ago. The cynical girl yelled that no. 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 Fang Yuching regretted it. Not her older brother Zhang Yi. The protagonist let her go from the top floor and watched her fall heavily into the snow, contentedly watching the young and innocent Fang Yuching lying in the snow. The next morning, at his house, Zhang Yi went to check on Uncle Yu in the room. Unexpectedly, his recovery speed was several times faster than that of an ordinary person. In just one day, his bullet wound had healed. Zhang Yi asked Zhou Kier to monitor his condition until he fully recovered to be sure. She then administered a sedative injection to Uncle Yu, as usual. At that moment, Shi Li Mei approached and asked Zhang Yi to go to her house to get her phone charger and the baby's diapers. He looked at Uncle Yu and remembered that people in a coma are said to hear everything said 
bed around them, so he was kind to the woman and said he would do it after he finished something urgent. Leaving the room, Zhang Yi said it was time to eliminate the opportunists. He went outside to set more buildings on fire while saying to himself that this was to eliminate potential threats. Zhu Hao, who had been beaten up before, realizing Zhang Yi was approaching, came forward and said he had valuable information for his older brother. Zhang Yi smiled, thinking he already had practically everything he needed. What else could be important? Big brother Zhang Yi, have you heard of Wang Simon, the richest man in the city? He built an underground shelter called the Doomsday with $200 million. Because Zhang Yi showed interest, Zhu Hao asked to talk in a place where no one could hear. They went to an apartment, and then Zhu Hao spilled the beans. He said that Wang Simon's shelter is in a luxury gated community. Zhang Yi then asked, So what? What's your reason for telling me this? Zhu Hao replied, The point is, there are infinite food supplies there. He wants to be Zhang Yi's helper to rob Wang Simon's underground shelter. The protagonist found this idea ridiculous. No matter what's inside, invading such a secure place isn't worth the risk for him. However, Xu Hao argues that Wang Simon already knows about Zhang Yi and even contacted him to steal his snowmobile. This information only made Zhang Yi angry. He asked Xu Hao how he wanted to die. Frightened, the guy shouted that he wouldn't plot anything against Zhang Yi and actually wanted to help him. To make things even clearer, the protagonist shot Xu Hao next to his head and asked for a good reason to let him live. The guy said that the mansion has plenty of food and he wants to join Zhang Yi to ensure food for himself too. Furthermore, Zhu Hao was friends with Wang Simon, the spoiled rich kid who had everything one could want and still humiliated Zhu Hao in front of girls. He mainly wants to get revenge on Wang Simon. Zhang Yi is very interested in vengeance, so he gives him a chance. The protagonist asks if he knows about the security of the place, how many enemies there are, and similar things. Tell me now. Fearful, Zhu Hao says he will only give the details if they make a deal first. The protagonist smiles and says he'd prefer to crack his head open. Zhu Hao argues that he knows Zhang Yi has eliminated everyone who's no longer useful to him, so he won't say anything even under threat, since the outcome is the same. After these words, Zhang Yi says Xu Hao is smart, so he will accept to negotiate. The guy is happy, but Zhang Yi says there are two conditions first. He needs him to help eliminate someone who has been bothering him every day. He takes Xu Hao to an apartment and tells him there's a secret to share with him. The cunning protagonist takes out a briefcase and leaves the guy scared and confused about what it is, but he admits that joining Zhang Yi will at least ensure his survival, so any risk is worth it. The protagonist takes out a syringe and says he was a professional assassin, and that's how he survived until now. He says it's an assurance. This poison is very common and takes effect in a week. After they take over Wang Simon's shelter, he will give him an antidote. Zhang Yi applies everything and says they will eliminate someone today. Zhu Hao should wait at this person's house right away. When alone, Zhang Yi reveals that it was just saline solution. It was a strategy to reduce the chances of being betrayed. Returning home, he saw Shi Mei with his uncle Yu. He went to the room to tell his uncle that he's happy, he's okay, and from now on, he will take care of the three of them as a family, and they will all live together here. It's a promise. Hearing this, Zi LeMay is very happy and says a promise is a promise. She hands over her baby and says she will bring her and the baby's things from home. Zi LeMay thinks that with the baby and Uncle Yu here, Zhang Yi wouldn't be able to lock her out and kick her out of here. With her baby and phone in hand, Zhang Yi notifies that she left and Xu Hao should handle the problem. While the scoundrel plays with the baby, the mother went to open the door of her house, thinking she would never return here. Her surprise was that someone was inside the house. So frightened, the girl couldn't even try to defend herself. She was hit and then received several more attacks. Satisfied, Zhu Hao sent a message saying the trash was taken out. She really won't be going back to her place anymore, nor to Zhang Yi's house. At home, Zhang Yi tells his Uncle Yu that now he and his wife Shi Mei will also live here, and it will be great. However, Uncle Yu, unlike his wife, says that this is too much. He shouldn't bother Zhang Yi that much. The baby starts crying, and not knowing how to fix it, Zhang Yi hands it over to Chokir. You need to change the diapers. Figure it out, woman. Returning to the room, he went to talk to Uncle Yu again. The uncle says that she's taking too long, and he's worried. Zhang Yi tells Zhou Kier that he'll go look for Zi Mei because she's taking too long. Zhang Yi went to his room to gear up, sent a message to his building group asking all neighbors to gather at apartment 1301. He will distribute rewards and food for everyone. He sends a voice message privately to Xu Hao, telling him not to come if he wants to stay alive. After a while, everyone was happy. All the other buildings were eliminated, and now they can follow Zhang Yi and secure their food. Outside the apartment, the protagonist hears that everyone is there. He doesn't enter, throws two grenades inside, and closes the door. Everyone was happy, and out of nowhere, two grenades appear. There wasn't even time to blink, and everything went up in flames. The door was completely destroyed. Zhang Yi, hoping he had protected himself with the shield, entered the room to check the chaos. Everything was in pieces. One of them who survived, angry, asks why. They all helped him so much. Why kill them? Without mercy, Zhang Yi says that he helped everyone survive, and now they owe their lives to him. He's just taking what's his. After erasing all the residents of his building, the protagonist
Magnus says that now he has killed all his enemies from his past life except for Chen Zhang because of Zhou Kier. Back home, he goes to talk to Uncle Yu and says that there's trouble. Their neighbors rebelled and eliminated Xie Li Mei. They were planning with leaders from other buildings to eliminate us. Zhang Yi says he took care of them, but some escaped. The uncle crying says it's his fault. Frustrated, he punches the bed and makes Zhang Yi think that his power, apart from healing, is super strength. He tells him to calm down. Zhang Yi says he's also to blame for this. This world is very cruel, but he'll get a new woman for him, and she'll be very attractive. Don't worry, this leaves the old man all shy. One last problem for Zhang Yi is the baby. Zhou Kier says he won't stop crying, and nothing works now. With his eyes, he asks if she has used that. She feels embarrassed, saying that's enough. These are only for Zhang Yi's use. The protagonist says he will get someone who can breastfeed the baby. We didn't see if he talked to Uncle Yu about it, because in the next scene, Zhang Yi was going with the baby to Li Jian's building. Maybe this was the only one the protagonist didn't burn. He called for their leader, Li Jian, and told him he needed him. Zhang Yi asks if he's not afraid. Li Jian says he is, but it's also useless to run away from him. Moreover, coming like this with a baby in his arms doesn't seem like he was here to kill them. He asked them to find a mother to take care of this baby. There's food here for a while, for whoever takes the child. Zhang Yi says he won't do anything against him and his building because he truly knows they won't try anything against him. Li Jian, not very grateful, says he will take care of the child. He even runs to a woman, hands over the child and the food, and tells her to take it because everything here is truly shared. Observing how many people are alive in his building, Zhang Yi asks how they will survive when their food runs out. Li Jian says that when there's no food, they will die with dignity. The protagonist says that the food problem can be solved with the things he burned before. Li Jian firmly says no, and despite everything Zhang Yi did to corrupt Li Jian, he never faltered once, so Zhang Yi says he admires him a lot, and Li Jian also says he admires how Zhang Yi has the power to keep those close to him alive. Thinking for a moment, Li Jian wanted to ask a favor of the protagonist, but Zhang Yi stops him and says no. However, he continues, and says that the protagonist used to deliver food to all the buildings before, so now that, there's only one building left why not help them? Zhang Yi just refuses and leaves, but after thinking for a moment, he changes his mind a little. He says that if he helps his people for a while, everything will go wrong, and they'll end up like the other buildings too. Instead, he gives them all the seeds he had. If they manage to plant them somehow, they will be able to rely on themselves and not on others. These seeds are the last thing they received from him. For the first time since the snow apocalypse began, Zhang Yi helps someone without any ulterior motives. Li Jian asks one of his residents if it's possible to cultivate it, and an elderly biologist teacher says it's not impossible, maybe there's a small chance of success. Meanwhile, in his luxury home, Zhang Yi mentions that the neighbor's issue has been completely resolved, and now the goal is to get their hands on a new fortress. After a while, Zhou Kier returns home and asks if he's finished his work. Yes. Taking off her coat, she asks what he wants to eat. Zhou Kier, all innocent, starts preparing in the kitchen, and the mischievous protagonist holds her back and says she should guess what he wants to eat. She feels awkward, mentioning that her uncle is in the next room, but Zhang Yi says the house has soundproofing and thermal insulation. The next day, Zhou Kier, very tired from all the effort, continued sleeping. Zhang Yi sends a message to Xu Hao, come to my house now. It didn't take long for him to arrive. The same person who not long ago was being kicked by others on Zhang Yi's orders was now in his warm house. Out of respect, he sits on the floor and not on the sofa, waiting for the boss. Zhang Yi wants to know about the dealings with Wang Simon. Before Zhu Hao can speak, the protagonist tells him to shut up and give him his phone. Zhu Hao freezes in fear. Why on earth does he want to see his phone? Zhang Yi insists, saying to hurry. He's going to read his conversations with Wang Simon. Hu Hao says it's better not to. Suspiciously, Zhang Yi grabs him by the collar, asking if he's hiding something. After some threats, the guy hands over his phone to the protagonist. Zhu Hao says he cursed Zhang Yi a lot in there, but that's part of the act, so don't take it to heart. He sees that Zhu Hao has passed all his information to Wang Simon, and they discuss joining forces and taking things from Zhang Yi, but Zhu Hao swears that all of this is part of gaining the rich guy's trust. Thinking more deeply about it, Zhang Yi realizes that Wang Simon knows about his weapons, his snowmobile, and bunker in the apartment. He decides to use this to his advantage. The protagonist tells Su Hao to tell everything he knows to Wang Simon's house. If he misses a detail, he dies. After telling everything about his underground bunker, made with rocket materials, with a system of sleep-inducing gases and flamethrowers at the entrance. Basically, the place is an impenetrable hell. The only way in is if those inside let you. So Zhang Yi's focus turns to figuring out how to neutralize the gas and flamethrower system. The plan Xu Hao proposes is for him to pretend to capture Zhang Yi and make Wang Simon let him in. This plan doesn't smell too good to the protagonist, but it seems to be the only choice. About this, he has an idea. If he can use his dimensional space ability in other ways. Zhang Yi, acting all weird, thinks about the possibility 
please. Then he tells Exu Hao to leave, get out of here, and in two or three days, I'll call you. But master, what about the antidote? I'll die without it, Xu Hao says. Zhang Yi says it's no problem because it takes seven days for the poison to take effect. He has time. Zhang Yi slams the door in Su Hao's face. Now he has to figure out what else he can cheat in reality with this power. So he sits back down, thinks about it a lot. Suddenly, he makes a fire inside the house and starts trying to absorb the fire with his ability. If it's like the food that's preserved, it'll be incredible. He absorbs all the fire and doesn't get burned in the process. Then he manages to shoot out the same fire, like a cannon. The guy is so overpowering and it makes him very happy. If this worked, what else could be possible? Thinking about this, he wonders if he could suck someone into the dimensional theft hole. With that in mind, Zhang Yi managed to get one of the residents of Li Jian's building as a guinea pig. He threw a wooden stick in front of the guy and said if he can hit it, he'll get a bread as a reward. Of course, the man was suspicious as to why the almighty Zhang Yi would ask someone to beat him with a stick. Is this guy a masochist? Motivated by the prospect of food, the man jumped in to hit the stick with all his might. As Zhang Yi thought, he managed to suck the guy into the dimensional storage space, and it happened very slowly. After entering up to the last leg, Zhang Yi checked inside the space he controlled. The man was in there, frozen like everything else in there, unable to move and didn't seem to be alive. Checking his body, he realized there was no pulse or breathing. Thinking about it, it makes sense that food doesn't spoil and stays the same as when it entered. Everything in here is frozen in time. Taking the guy out, and to Zhang Yi's surprise, he was alive. He kicked the wood to the side and went to ask the guy how he felt seconds ago. Terrified, he replied that he thought he was dead. He was in a white world with supplies all around. This information blows Zhang Yi's mind. But of course, he tells the man that it was some delusion of his. But in the head of our crazy protagonist, he just discovered that time passes differently inside his dimension and that living beings don't die immediately there. But if they stay too long inside, they can have a mental breakdown and die from it. What wasn't clear to me is if he meant that besides the psychological being affected, living things cannot be sucked as easily as lifeless things. Because he removes some pieces of the man for the simple purpose of testing this, he sends the fingers easily and it works. They can stay in the other dimension. Tell me you smarter ones, how do you think Zhang Yi's power works in the comments? After destroying the guy, he gives him something to treat his fingers. See how nice he is. After thinking for a while, the man is all happy down there, fingerless, insane, but at least eating well. The conclusions were that he can throw objects out of the space. Now people can't be sucked or thrown out. I, with my few neurons, think this guy only entered the dimension because he jumped towards the portal. Now things like fire, he can suck in and project out in whichever direction he wants. With this information, he already knows he can defeat Wang Seaman. He goes to his great guinea pig friend and thanks him for the help. The poor guy didn't complain about anything and thanks for being able to exchange two fingers for food and says he has eight more. Zhang Yi suddenly lands a blow to his jugular and the man falls backward without understanding what happened. Evil Zhang Yi says that he's no longer useful and since he's already had his reward meal, it's time to leave. Strangely, the miserable man, with his vision darkening, is happy to finally be able to escape from this cruel world. Back home, Zhang Yi says he'll find more people from Lin Jian's building to practice real combat simulation for another three days. So, three days of wickedness later, Zhang Yi called Su Hao for a chat. But first, Xu Hao was begging for the antidote. His poison was taking effect faster, he could feel it. Zhang Yi notices that Zhu Hao is eating well now, but the poor guy's appearance is worsening, all due to a fake injection. That's the power of psychology. The protagonist then says, he'll give a temporary antidote that relieves symptoms for some time. Hurry up, please. I can't take it anymore. I'm dying. He applies it and says it'll only last until the operation to invade Wang Simon's underground bunker. After applying it, Xu Hao thanks the master and says the plan can start. He calls Wang Simon to set up a meeting. Something tells me Zhang Yi will do something. Later he packed his things and told Zhou here, he's going on a mission. What's strange to her is that all the neighborhood's problems have been solved. So why? At the right time, he says he'll tell his girlfriend. For now, she should stay in the building. He left food for almost a month for her and Uncle Yu. Worried, our lovely joke here tries to stop him from leaving. It's always dangerous outside. Her man then says he's the danger out there. He gives her a sweet kiss and says everything will be fine. If that's the case, she calms down. Our joke here is a bit naughty, guys. The mission now is to go to the bunker, but unlike what we expected, Xu Hao is tied up behind. Behind. The protagonist explains that they have to keep up appearances. The two walk into the city. After a while, they reach the condominium area, which was the city's richest region. Zhang Yi says since it's the highest place in the city, not even the houses were covered by snow. I didn't quite understand how it works, but the topography of the place makes it snow less. From the entrance of the condominium onward, they go on foot. They won't take the snowmobile to Wang Simon's house. A woman in one of the houses noticed the duo's arrival on a snowmobile. Looking at her empty house without food, she thinks this must be her hope. When they arrived in front of Wang Simon's mansion, it was already dark. In front of the house, Zhang Yi tells Xu Hao 
Wow, to go call the rich boy. Scared of taking a bullet, he goes to the camera to say, Incredible, legendary, rich and handsome Wong Simon. It's me. I came for the meeting to negotiate the snowmobile. On the other side, the rich kid doesn't understand why they're here today, and not tomorrow, which was the agreed-upon day. Furthermore, the snowmobile isn't with them. But anyway, Xu Hao says to brother Wang Simon, please let us in. This is a unique opportunity to get what you want. Wang Simon makes it clear that if they try anything, they'll be eliminated. Entering the mansion, Zhang Yi realizes that the apartment doesn't even compare to this. Zhu Hao goes ahead, afraid of getting a headshot. He says that after that door is indeed his house. They keep walking. The millionaire Wang Simon presses a little button on the computer, and then in the security corridor, defense mechanisms are activated, and gases are injected inside. In the rich kid's cameras, the smoke filled everything, and the screams he heard from the two were of desperation. Upon realizing that everything fell silent, he says it's time to treat the guests very well. What you can't perceive is that within the smoke curtain, Zhang Yi was wearing a gas mask and sucking all the smoke into the dimensional theft space. After a few minutes, the door opens. The plan is to shoot him when he approaches. But to Zhang Yi's surprise, the rich boy didn't come, so he pretended to be unconscious and angry with Xu Ho, who said that only Wang Simon and the beautiful girls lived here. The heavily armed guy knocked on the protagonist to make sure he was knocked out and threw him on the bunk. At that moment, Zhang Yi realized that this person is a famous TV actor and must be Wang Simon's friend. Inside, he threw the two of them on the ground like garbage bags. He tied them up while remarking that the security system was truly incredible. The rich guy remarked that it was obvious, as the bunker cost $1 billion to make. Leaving the two behind, they discussed how Zhang Yi had hidden the snowmobile nearby, so he would go look for it. While the two talked, Zhang Yi released the gas he absorbed in the perfect direction toward the guys. Hey brother Lin, why are you falling? I'm not, but why are you shrinking? As the men fell to the ground, Zhang Yi had already freed himself. Zhu Hao and the two wealthy men were unconscious from the gas, and he was now free. The first thing he did was tie up the two and take their weapons. The guys used gold-plated desert eagles. Zhang Yi applied the law of communism and took them for himself. All the places were fancy and large. Walking through the rooms, one of them had an indoor plantation, now clearly belonging to Zhang Yi. Going upstairs, he found game rooms, in one of which were the beautiful girls, Ex Xu Hao had mentioned, but it was strange that they were all unconscious. In another room labeled dogs and cats, there were the sights they were seeing and tied up cosplayers, clothes strewn on the floor. One of them was awake and crying, begging for forgiveness from Mr. Wang Simon, saying they were wrong. Holding onto her legs, she said they just wanted to go out for a bit and could do anything he wanted if he let them. Without heart or empathy, Zhang Yi kicked the girl and said that now he had an idea of what was happening here with the others. A few shots and the place fell silent. Now in the surveillance room, Zhang Yi said the heart of this madhouse must be here. All the cameras and environments were controlled from here. After walking through the other 200,000 rooms, many of which only opened with a password, he gave up and went back to wake the two rich men up with water in their faces. Are you awake? Not understanding how this happened, the rich guy freaks out. Zhang Yi then makes it clear that a magician doesn't reveal his tricks and now has something more important to discuss. He asks if Wang Simon wants to cooperate with him or not. The answer is yes, as long as he doesn't hurt him. Zhang Yi's condition is to live here with Simon, which shouldn't be a problem in such a big house. Surprised, Wang Simon asks if the protagonist only wanted to live here with them, not kill everyone and take over the place and its girls. He says no, that here is too big to live alone, it would be lonely. Wang, all happy, says that if he wants to be friends, he can. Zhang Yi says that the snow won't last forever, and when it's gone, a poor and unimportant person like him being friends with someone as rich as Wang Simon is the best thing to do. Simon agrees, but internally, he thinks about how Zhang Yi is too afraid to kill him. To release the rich guy, Zhang Yi's condition is for him to teach him how to operate the house's security system, to give him the passwords and everything else. As he has no choice, Simon tells him to promise not to hurt him after he does that. Zhang Yi promises that after that, he will let him go. I don't kill innocents. With no choice, Wang Simon agrees. In the control room, the rich guy teaches Zhang Yi everything, including the passwords and the instruction manual. With all this, Zhang Yi is sure he can control the entire house. If that's the case, brother Zhang Yi can release Simon. He smiles maliciously and agrees. Zhang Yi takes out a knife and cuts Wang Simon's vocal cords. He calmly tells him to breathe slowly, assuring him that the pain will soon fade away. He truly soothes the man, allowing him to peacefully transition to the other world. Simon, now voiceless, wonders why he's saying all this to someone he just deceived. Zhang Yi, as if reading minds, remarks that there's no point in keeping a worthless piece of crap alive. Perhaps it's because of the girls he saw inside. Yeah, that must be it, folks.
After disposing of the two, Zhang Yi cleans up the mess that leaked out from Wang Simon and his friend. His dilemma is what to do with Xu Hao, who helped a lot and everything went smoothly because of him. While contemplating, young Xu Hao opens his eyes and catches sight of the scene the protagonist wanted to hide, him cleaning up the aftermath. However, upon being released, Zhu Hao is simply happy, so that miserable Wang Simon went to hell, well deserved for all he did. Zhang Yi points to a backpack full of food, saying it's his reward for a job well done. Upon hearing the word food, the man rushes over to see and starts eating right there. The issue is that Zhang Yi mentions the house's power won't last long with the generators here, and the food is running out, so that's all the reward he can offer for taking over the bunker. Zhu Hao, upon hearing this, refuses to accept and questions if he heard correctly. The protagonist confirms it, explaining that Wang Simon lived here with many other people, and they consumed everything in the house. Probably because of all the women, I think it's true. However, Zhu Hao doesn't believe it, accusing Zhang Yi of hiding the good stuff from him and not sharing properly. Angry at the situation, he kicks the food backpack and says he won't accept it. He provided the information about this place and took risks for such a meager reward. Xu Hao claims Zhang Yi is lying. He advances towards the protagonist with hatred, saying that if that's the case, it's better for Zhang Yi to kill him, or Zhu Hao will spill everything about Zhang Yi to the others, the supplies and powers he possesses. If not Xu Hao himself, someone stronger will come to defeat him. In anger, Zhang Yi shoots Xu Hao in the chest. He falls to the ground, unable to react because he's stupid. Zhang Yi simply says that anger doesn't make you strong stronger, only weaker. If you don't have power, you shouldn't confront those who are stronger. Taking back the backpack, Zhang Yi says he was going to let young Xu Hao live, and even gave him the food there, so why did he seek his own death? Later, the protagonist ponders things in the living room, a thousand thoughts running through the scoundrel's mind. If Zhou Kier were here with him, it would be great. But what about Uncle Yu? Maybe he'll let Uncle stay in the apartment, and he'll move here with Zhou Kier. Now walking through the bar, he says there's only one thing missing. He promised to find a delicious girl for Uncle Yu. How is he going to do that? He can't know that now. He decides to have a drink and see if the TV works. Incredibly, there's cable TV with channels from all over the world. Investigating how this is possible, he finds a network room. The mansion has its own internet server, so he can communicate with the internet via Elon Muschin's satellite. Zhang Yi can have information from all over the world with this connection. Searching the computers, he finds many things. The main information is about reports from other countries regarding individuals who gained special abilities. While some control fire, others turn green. However, most became defined formed or gained useless characteristics. Anyway, Zhang Yi's conclusion is that if there are people with powers out there, it's another reason for him to stay here in this protected bunker. His main goal now is to immediately go get his woman and move her to this place. As he's about to start his snowmobile, a sweet voice calls out to him. His natural reaction is to pull out his gun and aim. The person in question is the redhead he saw earlier when Zhang Yi arrived. The woman says she has a favor to ask. Immediately, the protagonist recognizes her. Is she Yang Mi, the hottest girl in China in recent years? years. Every man in the country wants her. It's truly amazing, guys. The girl says she hasn't eaten properly for days and asks if she can go with him. He responds that life is indeed difficult nowadays, even for the rich. But if she wants to go with him, she must give a good reason. The girl asserts that if she receives food, she's willing to accept any condition he wants, making it clear with a mouth gesture, indicating it's really anything. At that moment, Zhang Yi blushes, then starts drooling. The scoundrel's heart is hooked. He regains his composure and tells her to come with him. The two head to the bunker, and at the door, she asks if this isn't Wang Simon's mansion. Zhang Yi says no, this place belongs to him now. Inside, it's warm, so she takes off her coat. She thanks him for letting her in and asks about his relationship with Wang Simon. Without answering, Zhang Yi asks about her relationship with Wang Simon. Do the rich know all the other rich people around? She explains that since their families are very wealthy, they bump into each other at all the fancy places and events. That's all. If that's the case, Zhang Yi says she shouldn't worry about Wang Simon. He's moved out. They have tea to warm their bodies, and then she asks if she she can take a shower before they talk more. By all means, she undresses and goes to the shower. Guys, control yourselves. Inside, she thinks the guy is quite charming. If it's to ensure her survival, she can make sacrifices. The girl's plan is to ask to stay with him for a while, just until the extreme cold is over. Imagining what she'll have to give in return, she blushes and tries to convince herself that it's for her own good. It's just a favor exchange. She needs someone to protect her. Coming out of the bathroom, she puts on a towel and goes to him in the living room. The girl asks, straight away, can I live Live here with you. It's hard for a weak woman to survive alone in such a harsh world. She uses her strongest weapon and says that if it's only for a short time, then nobody will know about their relationship. Zhang Yi takes her hand and goes to get more wine for them. He asks if she really thinks the ice will melt and the world will return to normal. She says it has to. If that's the case, he says, it's okay, but the woman has some conditions. Zhang Yi can't spread the news that she was with him after the global freeze ends, as she's famous and her career would be jeopardized. He agrees. Now Zhang Yi's first rule is for her to obey all 
all his orders. To start, the first order is to burn calories with very pleasurable couple exercises. They must spend a lot of energy together. After many deep movements, Zhang Yi shows her his power by producing a new outfit for her to wear. The girl is surprised and asks if he's a powerful magician. If so, she wants to discuss more things with him right away. She's still in a towel to not lose her natural power, so Zhang Yi, to demonstrate his power better, conjures up a complete meal table with pizza and roast chicken. If she's obedient, the beautiful girl can have this level of comfort. All she needs to do is obey his desires. The woman drools over the food. Zhang Yi tells her to be smart, just accept it already. She's thinking why, as a famous actress, she can't be discovered sleeping with just anyone. She's still worried about her reputation and says she has more conditions. Their agreement is only valid until the freezing in the world ends. Everything they do here is a secret. Gazing at the beauty in front of him, Zhang Yi says she's beautiful. The girl's second condition, which she says with embarrassment and fidgeting, is that she can't be forced to do very perverted things. He has to accept that, and then they can have a colorful friendship. Zhang Yi comes close and says she came to him for help, so she can't ask for too much. Plus, if it's enjoyable for him, it will be for her too. He opens the gates for the girl, while she's still hesitant, but in the end, she accepts everything. Zhang Yi informs that he'll go out to find someone else to come live here. But before that, he ponders and asks if many wealthy people still live in this condominium, and if she knows them. If everyone here had millions, they might have a better chance of surviving until now. What Zhang Yi really wants to know is if she knows a beautiful woman to introduce to someone. She says most of the wealthy here are older. Does his friend care about that? That's perfect. His friend is 40 years old. If that's the case, Yang Mi says she knows Zhou Haime, once considered a goddess by many. Zhang Yi tells her to call the woman right away. She calls the goddess and explains the situation for her to come. After a few minutes, the legendary Zhou Haime was here. Zhang Yi displays his power to conjure food from beyond and hands it to her. It was because of this that the woman came. He then quickly asks if things are clear to her too. We are making a deal here of food in exchange for food for his friend. They are going out now. Zhang Yi warns that if information about this place leaks out, both of them will die. Meanwhile, next to the territory of the luxury condominiums, in a province called Chu, some people are prepared to walk in the cold, and with some equipment they will dig in the snow. These people can withstand the cold, and break the ice in the right places, and fish. While they were fishing, they noticed something coming from afar. Upon closer inspection, it was a vehicle that could move on snow, and a beautiful woman. With the noise of the bike, the fisherman's wolves went after dragging the sleds. One of them clearly showed his intention by trying to hit Zhang Yi with a trident. To dodge it, Zhou Haime fell from the snowmobile. Worried about Uncle Zhang Yi's woman, he stood in front of her and pointed at them. You, are you aware that I'm armed? The confident lunatics ask how many bullets he has. Can he take them all down? In exchange for the snowmobile, they'll take the risk. Incredibly, Zhang Yi tried to argue that he doesn't need to kill everyone here, but if they did something, it would happen. One of the men says that if he leaves the snowmobile and the woman, he can leave alive. Zhou Haime behind thought this was a real possibility and got scared. However, firmly Zhang Yi asked if they were crazy. The man insisted that they couldn't let the chance of having food slip away to search for food. In this case, Zhang Yi had no choice. He grabbed his desert eagle and shot them all. <coughs> The idiot was the first to take a shot to the forehead, with the noise attracting the dogs, so Zhang Yi, using his storage skill, sucked the wolves into the dimensional space. Girl Zhou Haime climbed back onto the snowmobile, and they continued to flee. People returned, but all they found were their brother's bodies in the snow. They also noticed that the dogs were gone. The men looked around and couldn't see where the dogs were. This outsider killed their people and stole their dogs. This couldn't end like this. They would have to seek revenge. Carrying the bodies, they returned to their village. In their village there's a castle, and inside there's an otaku hugging a dakimakura pillow. Are you guys like that too? There's no point in lying, I know. The villagers defeated by Zhang Yi returned and went to talk to the otaku in his room. They were disgusted with everything here, asking if he wouldn't prefer a real woman who isn't 2D. The boy is lost in this world, so they need to pull his blanket to wake him up. The situation is so serious that he doesn't even realize there are people in his room watching him date. Wait outside, I'm dating. Sometime later, he left his wife and went to talk to the men. They tell him about a man who has a snowmobile and a beautiful three d woman. They need that snowmobile, and also need to avenge their brother's deaths. The reason they came to the chubby guy is that this outsider may have powers just like the otaku. They want him to help capture Zhang Yi and get the snowmobile for them. The otaku, who seems very important, says that God gave him this power, so he must have sent this person with powers to make him even stronger. Chun will accept the challenge and hunt down this person. The elders affirm that their tribe cannot be intimidated, and what the otaku is doing is noble. They
They rely on Yang Chun. Sometime later, Zhang Yi and Zhou Haime arrive at the building where their safe house is located. The woman seems sad about the situation. The reason for her sadness is that, in the current situation, she has no other choice. To survive, she must accept being someone else's woman, whom she doesn't even know. When they arrive, Zhou Kier will receive her unfaithful boyfriend. He has been working for so many days away, so he must be tired. Upon realizing the presence of another maiden, Zhou Kier, embarrassed, says she didn't know Zhang Yi liked older women. The protagonist tells the guest to sit down, and leaving the room, he tells Zhou Kier that this person is not for him. She came to meet Uncle Yu, but Zhang Yi asserts that there's nothing wrong with older women. Leaving that aside, how is Uncle Yu? He healed in a week. A normal person would take three months to heal. The old man is as good as new. The protagonist's orders were for Zhou Kier always to apply sedatives to restrain his uncle, but now it's time for him to leave the cage. Zhang Yi's concern is that there are others out there with powers. Building a good relationship and keeping his Uncle Yu in good condition are his interests. Together, they are stronger. Inside the room, Uncle Yu was doing very well. He said he was very happy and grateful for everything his nephew did for him. Besides saving his life, he now looks handsome. Uncle Yu feels much stronger now. To demonstrate this, he puts his hand on the bed to try to break it. However, Zhang Yi, impressed, tells him to calm down. Uncle Yu shouldn't think he's a monster. In fact, he has just awakened. He gives an example that before he was a tadpole, but now he's a frog. To help, Zhang Yi reveals his power as well, making it clear to Uncle Yu how he always had so much food. Because of his excitement, Uncle slapped the bed and broke it, causing it to fall to the ground. Zhang Yi asks if he's okay. He says yes. He just needs to get used to his strength. The protagonist asks his uncle if he wanted a wife. He has something for him. Zhang Yi takes him to the living room and shows him his gift. Immediately, he recognizes. Could you be Zhou Haimei? She says yes and asks if he's Uncle Yu. Look at how excited the old man gets. Zhang Yi says that this house will be theirs and they can get to know each other and live here together. Zhang Yi will move elsewhere with Zhou Kier. They prepare to leave. Zhang Yi tells Uncle Yu that this snowmobile will be his gift to use it and get food now. His uncle is very honest, saying that this is too much. The snowmobile is important to Zhang Yi. However, the protagonist shows his new ride, a snow-going car. Now it's no secret to anyone that he has powers, and everyone is shocked by this. The two of them go by car to their new home. Along the way, Zhou Kier asks if their new home is beautiful. He replies yes, it's very spacious and comfortable, nothing like their apartment. Along the way, Zhang Yi warns that there is another person at home. He's warning her in advance to be prepared. Zhou Kier sulks because it's obvious it must be another woman. In this way, Zhang Yi reassures his wife, saying that it's just someone who will help with housework every day. Initially, she asks if it's only for this reason, and he says yes, she is the only one in his heart. After that, Zhou Kier calms down and becomes happy. Zhang Yi is relieved because he doesn't need a disobedient woman. On the way, they face a heavy snowstorm until something stronger than the snow hits the car, a tornado. Realizing this, the tornado was pushing the car, so Zhang Yi uses his ability and sucks the entire snow tornado into another dimension. However, right after that, another different tornado threatens them. At this moment, Zhang Yi realizes that there must be another person with abilities like his uncle, so he turns around and flees. More snow tornadoes come their way, and just like before, he absorbs them with his storage power. The culprit behind this was the otaku. These attacks are very exhausting, so now he's at his limit. The others with him ask if he's okay. He says yes, but he needs to rest a bit. Now that they've confirmed the enemy's powers, they are worried. Zhang Yi stops the car and takes a rifle from his storage. He deduces that his opponent must tire out a lot with their attacks, so he must retaliate while they recover. Zhang Yi gets out of his car and shoots at the snowbank. One of them is hit in the leg and shouts for help. Only two remain. The otaku still wonders how he can see them hidden, so Zhang Yi shoots several more times. Chun attacks with tornadoes, but his attacks are easily nullified. Despite giving his all, he is completely neutralized. How can he be so powerful? With this, Zhang Yi says they must have realized the difference in power. They are not reacting anymore. However, continuing this fight here could be dangerous for Zhou Kier. Zhang Yi shouts that if they have the courage, they should come after him, but now the fight will be on his turf. Zhang Yi returns to the car, and she calms down very quickly, and asks if he has killed them all. He says no, so you'll come back for revenge later. She asks this because she already knows her boyfriend, and knows he's like that. They continue on their way, leaving the defeated ones behind, but at least everyone is alive. In the bunker, his red-haired girl was lying down until now, waiting for him to return. This happened, and as soon as the protagonist arrived, he went to inform Yang Mi that she should come and meet his new friend. She asks if the friend is engaged to him or something. It's something like that. Zhang Yi hands her new clothes to wear, and come downstairs now. And let's face it, she looks very good in that outfit. Determined to claim territory, Yang Mi dresses up and puts on makeup to meet her rival. As she descends the stairs, Zhang Yi is excited about it. Following behind is the beautiful redhead. When the two girls see each other, they are startled, and Zhou Kier approaches Yang Mi with fists clenched, hinting at a possible fight. Zhang Yi 
intervenes and asks if they already know each other. Zhou Kier confirms that she's her cousin. Surprised, Zhang Yi stands between them and asks if it's all getting a bit too serious. Yang Mi asks him not to let her cousin know about their relationship, but Zhang Yi questions if there is indeed a relationship. The shy girl wonders if their agreement isn't just a temporary arrangement. They are cousins, and their families are famous in the medical field. Zhou Kier doesn't like her cousin because according to her, Yang Mi embarrasses the family name. People in their social circles mock them because Yang Mi chose to work in the entertainment industry. Zhou Kier complains that the worst part is her cousin's poor acting skills. Zhang Yi asks why that's a problem. It's because Yang Mi uses her looks to promote herself, and that vulgarity makes others mock their family. Zhang Yi intervenes again, stating that it's all in the past, and there's no longer such a social circle. From now on, they will have to live together peacefully. He decides to show them around the new house, and their responsibilities there. When they see the cultivation room, they get excited about taking care of the plants, as these gardens are their responsibility. Yang Mi thanks the protagonist for keeping her secret. She suggests they can maintain their relationship, but keep it a secret. Zhang Yi nods in agreement, respecting her opinion. However, he wonders how he'll manage their three-way relationship now. To express her gratitude, Yang Mi offers to cook for them and heads to the kitchen. Later, while searching for ingredients, she finds there's nothing in the pantry. As she searches, Zhang Yi sneakily approaches her and whispers in her ear, making her blush as she wonders what he's up to. What are you doing, and what if your fiancé finds out? He ignores her concerns and retrieves ingredients from his dimensional storage, telling her this is how they'll eat from now on. Even though she's aware of his powers, she's impressed, as are we by other things. He pats her bottom playfully and eagerly anticipates the meal. After a while, the food is ready and they can start eating. Apprehensive about whether they'll like it, Zhou Kier tastes it first and remarks that it's too salty. Embarrassed, Yang Mi admits she couldn't concentrate with everything going on. Sensing the tension between the cousins, Zhang Yi decides to take advantage. He starts being affectionate with Zhou Kier, feeding her, and she responds by being cute and happy, showing off to her cousin. Even though she pretends not to care, she keeps up the display throughout dinner. Later, as they lie in bed, Zhou Kier asks which of them is better. Zhang Yi pets her head and says, of course you, it's her. Zhou Kier is his personal doctor, so she's more important, not to mention she's the most beautiful. Zhang Yi kisses her forehead and hugs her as they drift off to sleep. In this cute moment, the protagonist reflects that love is nonsense. Everything is about interests. In the following days, Zhang Yi practices his archery skills daily. At one point, he receives a call on his cell phone. Without caring who it might be, he declines the call and blocks the number. Nothing outside this place matters to him. However, mysteriously, the block number calls again, making him furious. How is this possible? He hangs up and blocks it again, but the number calls once more. Now he's driven crazy by it, and then the phone answers the call on its own. The person on the line asks why he won't answer their calls. Zhang Yi listens and learns that the person knows his personal information, including his date of birth, ID number, and everything that should be kept secret. Finally, the caller mentions his mansion. The caller says it's simple. This hacker wants Zhang Yi to provide food, clothing, and drinks in exchange for not spreading his information. The protagonist questions if he really thinks this information is important. However, the chubby man on the other end of the line claims to have evidence that Zhang Yi stole from the Walmart warehouse. If he spreads this, the right and powerful people from the entire city will come after him because they know he must have a lot of food. The chubby guy reveals his identity and where he used to work before the disaster. Even Zhang Yi is aware of the company this hacker works for, so if he knows all this, he might have taken control of the security systems of this mansion. Zhang Yi tries to convince the man that he doesn't have that much food, but it doesn't work. Despite Zhang Yi being furious at being blackmailed in this way, he listens to the man's demands. This mansion relies on security cameras, alarms, digital locks, and other things. The man threatens that if he disables these, at any moment he could be attacked in his bunker. The chubby guy says he must deliver everything requested to his address at Villa 302. If Zhang Yi tries anything, he will know, and he will fulfill the threat of leaking all his secrets. After hanging up the phone, he gets so angry that he goes to the living room to get some water and calm down next to his wife. Zhou Kier asks, what's going on? Why is he so nervous? Zhang Yi tells her everything. His location has been discovered and how the hacker threatened to leak his information. Now they are vulnerable. His girlfriend mentions that gossip about famous people is common and often lacks credibility, but when it's about such specific information regarding someone who isn't famous, this hacker poses a danger to them. Zhang Yi says he wanted to kill him right away, but perhaps their data will still be leaked even after defeating this guy. She tries to think of a solution. Zhou Kier mentions that in the past, technology companies would go as far as to hire people to eliminate hackers to prevent their data from being leaked, but these people always left a way for the information to leak in case something happened to them. With this, Zhang Yi is sure this person must also have such a precaution, so just killing him won't be enough. For sure, their evidence will leak out. Zhou Kier then says they've thought enough for today. It's best to relax a bit. However, he insists that this problem cannot be put 
off, Yang Mi passes through the room, heading towards the cultivation room. As she is famous, the protagonist explains the problem to her and asks for her opinion. Yang Mi says this is exactly like people spreading rumors about famous people on the internet. Then suddenly Zhang Yi has an idea. If he does something so that when the information leaks, it will be treated as just a rumor. The two confusedly ask what he intends to do. He says he'll prepare first and then explain. Going to his control room, the hacker calls him, asking if he has separated the supplies. Zhang Yi angrily says that if it weren't for the information he has, he would kill him right now. On the other end of the phone, the hacker starts laughing. If anything happens to me, your information will automatically be sent to everyone's phone in the city within 24 hours. You'd better think carefully about the consequences. At that moment, Zhang Yi is certain that he has 24 hours to act, so he says the man is tough and he will cooperate with him, and then he hangs up the phone. The protagonist's plan is to spread rumors about the Walmart theft through all media channels. By spreading rumors, he will bury the truth in a sea of lies, so no one in the city will believe it. After spreading false information, Zhang Yi stretches, grabs his backpack, and says it's time to take out the trash once again. He puts the backpack in the designated location and moves away to a considerable distance. He hides behind a tree with his rifle, aiming where his target will soon be. He sends a message to the hacker saying he has already delivered what he promised and left. However, even after a while, there is no response, and no one comes out to pick up his backpack. After waiting for a long time and seeing no sign of the person leaving to pick up the backpack, he thinks about calling the hacker or sending a message, asking if he has already picked up the supplies. However, he changes his mind. If he asks if he has picked up the supplies, it may raise more suspicion. So more time passes, perhaps hours, and finally the door opens and someone tries to pick up the backpack. Zhang Yi has never pulled a trigger with such determination in his life as he does now. In an instant, a laser pierces the man's head. He rushes to the scene and to ensure his enemy is neutralized, he shoots him a few more times. Then he enters the house to search for things and notices a notebook. His idea was to destroy it right away, but surely it must contain important information that he can access later. So he decides to store everything in his storage space. Now, everything is done, and he leaves. Zhang Yi returns home relieved, stretching in his comfortable house. This time Zhou Kier made the food. As he is served by the two girls, he asks if they received messages on their phones. They say yes, and show some messages about a Walmart warehouse theft. He tells them that's what he did. He spread dozens of messages with false information, and when the true information leaks, it will be lost amidst a bunch of lies. In the control room, he programmed these messages to be sent daily for a while. Impressed by this, Yang Mi says he's amazing. She recalls that it was common among stars, who were exposed due to some scandal to be forgotten, if another famous person was exposed for something later. He did something similar to that. The girl thinks that besides being handsome, he's very intelligent. Jokir asks, what if there's still a risk of people coming after them here? Isn't it still dangerous? Zhang Yi is silent for a while, and then Jokir says, she doesn't doubt his methods, but in Tianhui City, there are several people who deal with technology like the hacker, and others could also hack into the security system of their house. Zhang Yi agrees, and says that indeed, unless the world returns to the Stone Age, they run this risk. The two girls, upon hearing that they are constantly at risk, even behind the security system, become scared. But Zhang Yi says they can solve this in another way. However, just thinking that he might be attacked unprepared leaves a bitter taste in his mouth, so he says this safe haven will become even safer. Zhang Yi tells the girls that he is confident and can keep this place safe, but they can't just sit around. For some reason, the redhead becomes shy thinking about something. Zhang Yi, unsure if she's that mischievous, gives her a smack on the head and says they'll set traps to reinforce security, not rely on technology. Zhang Yi explains that this bunker was prepared for large-scale threats like bombs and airstrikes. However, there isn't much security against attacks by people as he would like, so they will prepare defenses against people trying to invade the place. The two beauties, excited, say they will do anything he asks. Zhang Yi takes out from his storage space a pile of nails and wood. With this, they will make traps. They'll nail nails into wood and bury them in the snow. He also explains how other traps will work. While they manufacture them, he thinks that after realizing there are traps, they might start using equipment to dig up all the traps. It was thinking about this that he had another idea. They started placing some traps, and Zhang Yi buried some explosives. If you try to dig this up, you'll be eliminated. He also hides grenades with tied lines, and people passing by dragging things to unearth the traps will be blown up too. Finally, after much effort, they made good protection in the areas around their mansion. Returning home, Yang Mi asks when invaders are coming so she can see the traps in action. Zhang Yi asks if she's crazy, it's better that they never need to use them. Sitting on his couch, he says that most people with common sense won't try to attack a fortress at a time when everyone wants to keep intruders away. Only then does she understand. It's better to have these traps as a precaution only. Before she realizes it, Zhang Yi is already making another security mechanism, even though they have digital locks. He prefers to have mechanical locks as well, so he can lock the door and no one can open it from the outside. Quickly, the front door now has three times more security.
security, Yangmi begins to be sure that joining this guy was the best thing she did. Surely she will have a much safer life than anywhere else, and also very pleasurable. <laughs> Even with these measures, Zhang Yi says it would be good to have someone who is great at internet and security with them, so they could be sure that the digital security of the house would be truly secure. Yangmi comments that if Xinxin were here, it would be great. Zhou Kier then asks if Xinxin was living in the city and if she should be alive. This girl is Yang Mi's sister and a computer prodigy. Because she is wheelchair bound, she loves computers and technology. The two girls living with him are beautiful, and it's no wonder they resemble each other. They're cousins. Interestingly, they themselves mention another cousin who's a technology expert. Perhaps she could take care of the house's security. The first thing Zhang Yi wondered is if this girl is as pretty as the other two. And you know what? She's wheelchair bound. But for him, that doesn't matter at all. What matters is being beautiful for him to engage in mischief. Hearing this, Zhang Yi asks how they can find her. Yang Mi says they haven't heard from her in a while. She doesn't answer their calls. She hopes her sister is alive and safe. Zhang Yi suggests that maybe she's too smart to want to talk to them, and that's why she hasn't responded. The girl gets angry at this. He continues, saying that perhaps everyone in her family are geniuses, and she's the only one without any qualifications. Yang Mi gets mad again at the protagonist for being mean. He says it's okay. At least she's beautiful, and that's as valuable as being smart. However, at this moment, they have more important things to worry about in the coming days. He spent the next few days training his new archery skill, and it seems now he can reinforce his projects and shoot targets with more precision. This new skill he might be able to use on his own body. Upon testing, he realizes that he might be considered invincible now. However, with the little use he made of it, his stomach growls with hunger. Apparently, the more powerful the ability, the more it consumes his body's energy. So, I wonder how much energy it takes to put things in another dimension. If energy is needed to use his powers, he who has an unlimited food supply can use as much power as he wants, while other people who don't have as much food won't be able to use their powers freely. In a secret defense location, the head of the facility is concerned about the military base's electrical energy limitation. His secretary approaches him with the reports and informs that they received the analysis of recent information. According to her, various pieces of information about a supermarket robbery that happened months ago were reported, but among the messages, one is special. She mentions a man named Zhang Yi as responsible for the theft of a large warehouse. The report regarding this Zhang Yi indicates that he was a warehouse supervisor and the main suspect in the theft of supplies. Hearing that the young supervisor was responsible for planning a robbery that even the police couldn't uncover, the man doubts and belittles the protagonist. He asserts that this information is also undoubtedly false. However, at the insistence of his employee, he decides to send people to investigate this Zhang Yi's base. Now, in another location, in the castle where the otaku who lost to Zhang Yi resides, he cries and tastes defeat. Chun thought he had godlike powers, but unfortunately, he has just discovered that he's not the protagonist of this world. He wonders if he's merely a mere supporting character, while Zhang Yi is the true protagonist, blessed by God. As he lamented, Chun also received on his phone the leaked report mentioning that Zhang Yi is responsible for the theft of goods from a large warehouse months ago. This piqued his interest. Chun conducted some research and found out that Zhang Yi is associated with a past cargo theft. So, considering how he faced him, he could have used those same powers to rob the warehouse. Chun deduces that Zhang Yi has something related to space, and that he can put things in an alternate space. Realizing how absurd this ability would be, he becomes sad again, and lies down on the bed, feeling weak compared to the protagonist. Speaking with his wife, Chun asks if Zhang Yi is the protagonist of this life, and if he's a villain or just a supporting character. Against that person, Chun absolutely couldn't win. He then thinks whether it would be better to try to befriend him instead of facing him. Content with this idea, he decides to warn the villagers. Rushing to his grandfather, he asserts that that person is very powerful, and they shouldn't confront him. He tells everything he knows, how Zhang Yi is powerful, and can nullify his abilities. Moreover, he must have an even more incredible ability. So, Chun says they should avoid Zhang Yi's area, and find ways not to confront him. The otaku Chun talks about the recent leaked news that the protagonist was a warehouse supervisor at Walmart, who stole all the goods. He has the power to keep all that under his possession, but instead of convincing the old man that Zhang Yi was too powerful to face, it only motivates him further. The old man's thought is, if they could steal what the protagonist has, they would never go hungry for a long long time. Reluctantly and with fear, Chun says they're crazy, but the old man underestimates him, saying he was just a supervisor. What could he do against the entire Shu family? Meanwhile, everything is calm in his comfortable
comfortable home. Zhang Yi is eating with his wives. While Yang Mi was saying something, she hears a noise at the window. Zhang Yi says it's okay and goes to check it out. He goes to the window to look. Using his binoculars, he notices many people approaching his house. He takes out his rifle to observe better. His intention is simply to let his traps do their job. One of them steps on the first trap and feels a lot of pain. Another person tells them to help him and take him back. The old leader of the tribe warns that there may be hidden traps. Everyone needs to find them and be careful. As the men advance with sticks searching for the traps, they finally approach Zhang Yi's house. With the sticks, they manage to track the traps and advance without problems. One of them picks up the traps, and when he crosses a grenade line, an explosion among them shocks everyone. Even those who weren't caught in the explosion directly were hit by the shrapnel. Due to the pain of these injuries, they roll on the ground, and more bombs are activated. After a series of explosions and running, many people were caught in the nail traps or explosions. Now everyone was afraid and retreating. What could they do to advance safely? The men question the tribe's leader. What can they do without his grandson? They won't be able to attack and defeat that person. Cornered, they wonder why the leader's grandson isn't here. He has superpowers and should help. Meanwhile, Zhang Yi observes everything with his rifle and other high-tech equipment to see precisely what they're doing. The old man remembers his grandson's advice not to confront the protagonist. With no choice, the leader shouts for all to hear, questioning why they can't defeat just one person. These people have grown accustomed to relying on others. They must fight with their own hands to get what they want. Together, they must secure the luxuries within that house. He hands a spyglass to the men to see the prize, along with plenty of food for them to enjoy as an extra reward. As they confirm by looking, indeed, what's inside is very tasty. Yet, even with so many rewards before them, they doubt if they can fight without the leader's grandson present. The old man angrily shouts that if they fail, they are nothing but useless. With this motivation, they decide to use tricks to disable the traps and bombs from a distance. Slowly but surely, this tactic starts working, and they edge closer to Zhang Yi's secure house. The men were confident that they were now safe. The girls watch everything apprehensively from the window. Yang Mi feels sorry for how many will die and if they'll be okay. Meanwhile, Zhou Kier says they're idiots and don't realize they're no match for her boyfriend. At the right moment, Zhang Yi remotely triggers the bombs, exploding them all at once. This destruction, unlike the grenades, was precise, and most of them were caught in the blast and remained in that state. With a somber look, Zhang Yi says they should have turned back when they realized there were traps. Now that they decided to advance, he doesn't lament the death of dozens of enemies. The devastation was so great that even Zhou Kier, who was previously excited, felt sorry for these people. Yang Mi isn't accustomed to Zhang Yi's actions. Seeing people in pieces, she vomits. Zhang Yi observes coldly and remarks that those who die instantly are lucky, those who linger in agony are unlucky. The elders who were behind are terrified. Almost all are lifeless. The leader falls backward, saying that person is a demon. He must be an evil demon to do this to them unfairly. He screams in despair. Everyone died because of his orders. He only wanted supplies for his people. This wasn't supposed to happen. Zhang Yi puts away his rifle and takes his bow and arrows that he's been practicing with. Using his new abilities, he shoots three arrows simultaneously, perfectly piercing the foreheads of three people. Triple headshot. More and more arrows are fired, and they all accurately take down the enemies. The old leader, seeing more dying, slaps himself and says it's his fault. Then he asks Zhang Yi to finish him off too. The protagonist was about to fulfill his wish, but an ice whirlwind obscures his vision and the arrows reach. Without concern, Zhang Yi retrieves his rifle. With it, he can hit anything from a distance. The otaku shouts for everyone to flee while he maintains an ice barrier. People start to retreat with the wounded, while Chun remains determined. Zhang Yi stays calm and says he has another idea. He grabs a vest and tells his wives he'll be back soon. Chun was convinced everything was fine, but a snowmobile comes quickly with a madman shooting at everyone from the window. The desperate people running have no chance. Even Chun's life is at risk now. One of them helps the otaku so he can join the retreat. Zhang Yi pursues them by car, getting close to them again and then shooting from the window once more. Chun starts to feel the fear that perhaps no one will survive. He shouts for them to abandon the bodies they're carrying to bury them later. By reducing their weight, they could be faster, though reluctantly, as burying their dead is an important tradition for them, they decide to do as he commands. They toss the bodies out. Even though Zhang Yi has to dodge the bodies, he still manages to be faster and land double headshots on several people. Chun now has to flee. He's scared. An idea crosses his mind. He realizes he could do something to stop the car. This time, he uses his power to crack the ground in the car's path, causing it to get stuck in the ice. Zhang Yi still tries to shoot more people as they flee until they're too far. He says that now these people know they're powerless against him. They'll never think of coming back. He pulls his car out of the hole, goes among the bodies, and returns to his wives. Back at his house, while Young Mi is stunned by what happened, Zhou Kier is calm and asks what happened. Did he manage to defeat the one with special abilities? Zhang Yi explains that no, that person was clever and managed to 
to escape with a few others. Chun returns to his tribe with a few survivors. The people from his own tribe start to judge him. Because he wasn't in the fight from the beginning, everyone died. If he had been with his people, they would have had the supplies from that house. One of them tells the otaku to go with him to the village chief's house. Before he enters, a girl blames the otaku. It's all his fault. If he had gone with them earlier, their husbands and children wouldn't have died. The elder tells them that this isn't the time to argue about it. He tells the otaku to come in because his grandfather is calling him. The tribe leader tells Chun to come closer. The old man says that the blame for so many injuries lies with him. The weight of the deaths of so many members of Shu village must rest on him, not on Chun. His grandson warned, but the old man was arrogant and led everyone into battle. If they're going to blame anyone, blame the old man, not his grandson. Crying, the old man says he entrusts the Shu family to his grandson and that he's ready to die now. The old man, saying he's also tired, dies. At that moment, all the residents come rushing in. The leader they loved so much has just passed away. As he leaves, Chun thinks about his grandfather asking him to take care of the family. Chun doesn't know how to take care of himself, let alone everyone else. Confused, not knowing what to do, he notices a girl leaning against the wall. Approaching her, she asks if he's the real brother Chun. He blushes and looks foolish, saying yes. And who is she? The girl says her name is Shu Lili, and thanks to him, her father survived and returned from that last battle alive. He feels embarrassed and says it's not that big of a deal. However, this makes Chun realize that he shouldn't blame himself for the deaths of other people. In fact, he's a hero and saved several people. Her father couldn't come to thank him, but she came in his place. Some people recognize his worth. He says it's all right. They're from the same village and should always help each other. She leaves, and he stays behind, his heart pounding. Has the otaku's heart been hooked by 3D for the first time? In the innocent's mind, he was already thinking about the children they will have together. Have you gone crazy? Returning home, he thinks of a way to protect his village from the protagonist. Chun now knows he's the real danger. Racking his brains over it, the otaku comes up with a plan and is about to put it into action right away to protect the village people and his future girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, boy. We go back to the protagonist preparing more traps to replace the ones already used. His thought is that as soon as he gets a chance, he'll finish off all those who came to attack him. Then, back inside, Zhang Yi is exhausted from so much work, so the two girls come to help the legendary pervert relax. I didn't understand where Joe Kier wanted to massage, but I think it should be nice. During the relaxation time, Zhang Yi sees his phone ringing. He picks up his Xiaomi and wonders who it could be this time. Hello, who's this? On the phone, the person says their name is Chun Chun Lei from Shu Town, but that doesn't matter. He explains that thanks to the protagonist, he met his beloved, so he wants a chance to reconcile with him. Zhang Yi questions if these people from Shu Town tried to attack him before. Chun says yes, so the protagonist immediately asks, now that you realize you can't beat him, you want to make peace? The otaku agrees that it's their fault. Indeed, his people were hasty and attacked him. So, as an apology, Zhang Yi can make a request to Chun, anything, and he'll do it. Only now does the protagonist ask who he is to speak on behalf of Shu Village? Does he represent the people of this village? And if he says yes, how can he prove it? Zhang Yi, confidently in the best place in the world, then says he's the person with powers who fought Zhang Yi twice already. Surprised by this, the protagonist says he now accepts to negotiate and asks again, can he make any request? Chun says yes, anything. So Zhang Yi says what he wants, I want you Chun. In the protagonist's mind, he wants to recruit the otaku and use his powers, but in the degenerate otaku's mind, he thinks Zhang Yi wants his naked body. Big brother, I don't like men. No you idiot, I'm interested in your powers. If he really wants to reconcile with Zhang Yi and prevent him from attacking his people, before that he has to prove he's qualified, so they have to meet in person. The otaku didn't want this at all, but Zhang Yi says it's either this, or he'll destroy his people. Chun doesn't want to meet the protagonist, arguing that if he leaves his people alive in the future, they can unite to face an external enemy if necessary. Please, let's make a deal without me having to come to you. Zhang Yi responds that the biggest enemy is Shu Village now. He stands up from the couch and says, if he doesn't do this, they will be my enemies. It all depends on the otaku now. Without waiting, Zhang Yi warns that he must come to his house at 2.30 this afternoon, and then he hangs up without waiting for a response. The otaku falls to his knees, thinking he's dead now. He's going to die in his prime, just when he was planning to fulfill his desires with his new love. Meanwhile, Zhang Yi thought that with the otaku's power, he has unlimited potential. He can do many things, and he never thought about it. It's certain that this power is better than Uncle Yu's power. He'll decide on the spot whether it's better to make this guy his ally, or to eliminate him. Still tired from setting up the traps earlier, he goes to his room and sleeps reading a book. Sometime later, Yang Mi goes to him, saying she's here to keep him company. Embarrassed about what he might want to do, Zhang Yi just says he needs a better pillow. He lies on her lap and says that's great, then he puts his head there and takes a sniff. He says it's much better this way. Zhang Yi tells her to wake him up at exactly 2 o'clock. Blushing, Yang Mi tries to resist from moaning, saying it's okay. <laughs>
A few fragrant hours later, Zhang Yi was at his post with his rifle. He watches Chun arriving alone. From here, he could eliminate him. However, seeing the kid slip and fall on his own, he thinks, this guy can't be so threatening. Then he falls again. Watching this behavior, Zhang Yi changes his mind and decides he'll at least talk to him. When the otaku reaches the front of the house, he calls to say he's here. He can't proceed because there are too many traps. He'll end up dying. So it's better for Zhang Yi to come to him. Arriving at the location, the otaku says he's Chun and is here to negotiate with the protagonist. As he asks, Zhang Yi makes it clear. Initially, everything started because his people attacked, so his people owe him a debt. Chun acknowledges that, yes, this is true. He's here to ask for his forgiveness. Zhang Yi wants to know who ordered the attack on him. That person must die before they start negotiating. The otaku reveals that it was his grandfather, the village leader, and he already died due to the attack. Zhang Yi, thinking this was too easy, asks if the otaku doesn't want to avenge his grandfather and the other who were killed. Chun responds that his parents died when he was a child. His grandfather was the only important person to him, and he already died as a result of his own actions. Furthermore, Chun feels no resentment or sadness for the deaths of the other villagers. Throughout his life, he was reclusive and only stayed in his room with a computer, never having contact with others. Now unable to contain his excitement, Chun says he admires Zhang Yi. It was incredible how he fought against everyone. Zhang Yi, after hearing all this, says he understands the otaku's side. However, he affirms that he has hasn't forgiven them for what they tried to do. The price of his forgiveness is the otaku working for him. Chun wanted to hug Zhang Yi, but he says not yet. He has more rules to say first. From now on, Chun must obey all his orders without questioning anything. Then the otaku's perverted mind makes him ask if Zhang Yi wants his body. Stop being stupid. Ah. Zhang Yi takes out an action figure from his storage space. This will be his reward. If you work for me, you can earn even more of these things. In addition to ensuring Chun's family's safety, he can reward him with something Chun values highly. Highly. Now they must do the first task. Inside the car, the curious otaku asks if the action figure can also control time inside his storage space. Is your power capable of that too? This question makes the protagonist think that maybe going back three months in time is part of his power. Maybe he controls time and space. After speeding through vast snowfields, they arrive at the location where the otaku's power will be put to the test. Using his snow power, he manages to, after minutes of maximum effort, clear a path to a gas station completely buried in snow. Zhang Yi immediately immediately thinks, with Chun's powers, it should be even easier to obtain resources for him to store. As a reward, he gives Chun a chocolate, knowing that the user's power depends on his energy. Zhang Yi goes into the gas station to get everything inside, and after a while in there, he comes back. Chun says he's amazing. His power is the best of all. Being able to store everything he wants is perfect for current times. Zhang Yi affirms that the chubby guy also has a great power. He never thought of using his power to dig up things buried by the snow before. Heading back to the car, Chun says he never even thought of leaving his room. He was always too busy dating his wives. To reward his work, Zhang Yi says that as long as he obeys, he'll do well. This backpack full of food is his reward for today only. Very happy, Chun didn't expect so much. He swears he'll follow him forever. On the way back, they now have a bit more intimacy. Zhang Yi asks how the otaku discovered his powers. Ashamed, Chun recounts that after his parents died, he became very sad, immersed himself in the 2D world, and masturbation. Once, after more than 26 times, he thought he was going to die, but the next day, he was alive and had his powers. Zhang Yi covers his face in embarrassment. He never thought someone would awaken after nearly dying 26 times. He says from here on, Chun should return to his village alone. The reason is that his car can't go any further because it's a frozen lake. Before leaving, Zhang Yi asks him to be careful. In the post-apocalyptic world, many things become dangerous, including his own people. While the otaku goes home, the protagonist alone in his car says the kid is a good person. Returning home, the man who is the new village leader scolds Chun for going to deal with Zhang Yi alone. Even though he said it was okay and he knew how to negotiate, the leader was not satisfied. Upon learning that the outcome of the negotiation was cooperation, rather than revenge, the old man becomes angry with him. The old leader points and says that it's Chun's fault that so many died. Now he wants to take credit by making friends with the enemy and saying he's protecting the village. The chubby guy tries to explain that he promised his grandfather he would protect the village, and this was the way he managed to prevent Zhang Yi from attacking their village in revenge. Revenge. The man says it doesn't matter. He's now the new leader of the Zhu clan, so Chun's actions must be consulted with him first. Chun can't do things on his own. The old man also says he wants what's best for everyone. He was only not expelled from the village because the old man defended him, so now he's in debt. From now on, he must pay for his sins. He yells, asking if he understood the message. Understood? Understood? Chun agrees that he did. The old man orders him to go home to recover and wait for new orders. The old leader says again not to act on his own again. Without wasting time, the old man 
once sent a message to the village residents group. Don't worry, I'm in contact with Shang Yi to ensure our safety. We're no longer in danger. The other people then praise the sixth leader, saying he's amazing. They should have made him clan leader from the beginning. With this, the old man says that such a young loser who never got any real girls can't beat him. Zhang Yi returned home and told his two girls what happened. Thanks to their agreement, Chun's people will no longer be a risk to them. Yang Mi says that this is brilliant and was a good choice. Zhou Kier asks if the girl is scared of them. Yang Mi says no, she just didn't want to see any more senseless bloodshed. If things continued, it could get dangerous. Zhou Kier, who is used to this, says that Yang Mi is fearful. She hugs Zhang Yi and says that he's incredible and can defeat whoever he wants. Yang Mi shouldn't doubt that or be afraid. Zhang Yi, on the other hand, defends the idea that it's good for them to have these people around for when new enemies appear in the future. They can be useful. Now that this problem has been resolved, Zhou Kier says they should celebrate. She goes to the bar to get some drinks. Zhang Yi says he's not used to drinking much, so just a little. Meanwhile, Yang Mi will cook for them. Zhou Kier gets the drinks, Yang Mi makes food, and sometime later, the two of them are passed out, and Zhang Yi, who doesn't usually drink much, is fine. The two of them slept, Zhang Yi with lust, saying it's great. Yang Mi opens her eyes and feels a kiss on the mouth, then on the neck. She tells him they can't. Zhou Kier is here and will see them. Zhang Yi goes down, and she holds back from making noise. The next day, the otaku sends a message to the protagonist. Check out the otaku's photo, guys. Chun says he's bored. It's been a long time since they went on a mission. He even suggests they should form a team of five people, each wearing a different color like the Power Rangers. Zhang Yi, embarrassed by this guy, starts to wonder if it's really a good idea to ally with such a crazy person. Nervously, the protagonist asks Chun if he doesn't have anything better to do all day. He says unfortunately not. It was just a bit of intimacy, and Chun started sending 200 messages a day. Zhang Yi just started ignoring everything he said and replying without much thought. While the protagonist is on his computer, he sees that Yang Mi is doing her work in the garden perfectly. It seems like everything is going well, but it crosses Zhang Yi's mind. What if they get hacked again? This problem keeps bothering his mind. How can he solve it? As he thinks about this problem, the two girls are in the room discussing. Yang Mi wants to help Xin Xin, who is wheelchair bound, but Zhou Kier says Zhang Yi wouldn't do that. He wouldn't put himself at risk for things that aren't for his benefit. Because of this, Yang Mi says that to convince Zhang Yi, who is very cautious, she will use her most powerful weapon, her body. Zhou Kier scoffs and says she just wants to seduce her boyfriend and is making up excuses. It's not for Xin Xin. It's not like that. Zhou Kier goes after the girl, saying she knows about the things they're secretly doing. She questions if her cousin isn't ashamed to do this. Suddenly, Zhang Yi appears in the room asking what's going on. Why so much excitement on the bed without him there? They even say that this is a family matter, but he sits next to them and says the three of them have no more secrets. He asks if they're worried about someone in their family. Zhou Kier responds that since the snowstorm started, she lost contact with her family and doesn't know if any of them are alive. Yang Mi says it was her family that contacted her. The protagonist asks if they contacted her to take Yang Mi with them. She says no, so she's sad because they didn't want to take her with them. Yang Mi explains that, in fact, the person who contacted her is in danger and needs to be safe, so they're secretly discussing how they're going to convince him to go save someone who has nothing to do with him. Yang Mi then begs him to help. This is the only family they have. Zhou Kier agrees that it has nothing to do with him, but it's their family, and if she dies, they'll feel guilty of the rest of their lives. Besides, his wife's family is his family too. Zhang Yi asks again to make sure. Are you asking me to go out there and risk myself for someone else? He reminds them that their information has been exposed. Many other people know that he has many resources here. So this place is a target. Leaving here means leaving it unprotected. He had decided and was leaving the room when they crawl over, begging him to change his mind and think it over. Zhou Kier says that if he does this, she can ask for anything, and she'll accept it. Whispering in his ear, she says anything at all. It can even involve her and Yang Mi together. Gentlemen, I inform you that Zhang Yi changed his mind. He asks if she's sure about this. The two, embarrassed, say they agree. Yang Mi sighs and says that in this cold weather and with so much snow, a wheelchair-bound person can't even move freely. She gets sad just thinking about it. Zhang Yi asks if they're talking about Xin Xin, the one with technology skills. The 18-year-old girl has her legs paralyzed and is a computer genius. Zhang Yi affirms that if this girl is so important to them, then she's important to him now too. Zhou Kier is impressed, so does that mean her boyfriend has a good heart? He really loves them to care about their wishes. Yang Mi thanks him happily but says they think poorly of him. He's not a bad person. He genuinely appreciates the girls he has. Impressed, they remark that he always seems like someone cold and with a frozen heart. Yang Mi remembers she'll pay off this debt to him, and gets closer, puts her hand in a place they like, and says, this is the beginning of repayment. The next day, because things got hot late yesterday, the three of them talk again. He asks about the wheelchair-bound girl. Zhou Kier says it's better for Yang Mi to say, Xin Xin is trapped in Tianqing Academy. It was the best 
best college in town. People who study there have been attending since kindergarten, so it was a place where many geniuses live. Zhang Yi's doubt is how a wheelchair-bound person survived in a college for months. Yang Mi explains that the college has its own market system, so there should be plenty of supplies in the area since the students lived there. The protagonist asks why Yang Mi only communicated with her now. She doesn't know, but she can try calling to find out more. However, the number in question is not available. Please try again later. Yang Mi has been trying to contact her several times and can't anymore. Zhou Kier jokes that Xin must have changed her mind about asking for help from her airhead sister. Zhang Yi wants to know the distance from the academy to this place they are. Perhaps because of the distance, the phone lines don't work. The academy is more than 22 kilometers from here, and because of the blizzard, it's likely that they can't call from that far. It's a miracle that she managed to call once. But still, Zhang Yi also says that Zhou Kier may be right. He tells them to go to the control room. Maybe they can get in touch over the internet. He says that this phone is the best one currently available. On the first attempt, the call is answered. But the connection is bad. They hear a lot of noise and screams saying it's dangerous. Zhang Yi asks what's so dangerous, and then they hear shouts saying, the monster, the monster. The noises coming from the phone sounded like a fierce monster, and then the call dropped. Initially, the protagonist thought it was a simple rescue mission, to go to the location and come back. However, he already knows in advance that there's something very dangerous there. Perhaps it wouldn't be a good idea to go to that place. His women insist that he doesn't change his mind. He already had his reward last night. Zhang Yi confidently says he won't change his mind. However, for that, he'll need his subordinates and their power. With Uncle Yu, the otaku, and him with their weapons, maybe it won't be dangerous. He picks up the phone and says he has a mission to rescue someone. Do you want to come with me? The otaku accepts and says he was really bored anyway. Later, while eating, Zhang Yi thinks that if he eats too much, it could affect his movements, but he also needs to eat enough to have maximum energy for his powers. In addition to preparing his physical form, he has to prepare his best weapons to face this unknown creature. He also informs his wives that for their safety, they will stay in the underground floor of the house. Yang Mi asks why, and Zhou Kier, knowing what her boyfriend is like, says she shouldn't ask stupid questions. If he ordered and didn't ask, then it's to be done. He'll go alone, and if someone invades their house during that time, he's away. His wives will be protected inside the safest place in the house. Those doors no one can open. Understanding the situation, Zhou Kier says it's okay and wishes him luck. Yang Mi says he must bring her sister home. Zhang Yi confirms that he'll make sure to bring her and all the wheels of the wheelchair here. As he leaves, he says in these dark times, he can't be careless with anything, especially with his wives. Bro, I'm here. Zhang Yi says they agreed to meet later, so why is he here already? Chun says he was afraid of being late, so he came early not to disappoint his brother Zhang Yi. They got into the car right away because it's very cold. Zhang Yi explains that they're on a mission to save a girl in a college far from here. Curious, Chun asks if she's important to him, and the protagonist says yes, it's something like that. We know what really convinced him wasn't the request from his wives that made him change his mind, but the fact that this girl knows a lot about computers at this moment when he needs someone to keep his mansion safe from hacker attacks. They speed up, and along the way, Zhang Yi gets annoyed with the otaku's conversation about a girl from the village who's in love with him, but doesn't have the courage to confess to him. Should he do it for her? To change the subject, Zhang Yi asks what the people in the village think about him cooperating with the enemy. Chun doesn't know how to respond. The situation isn't good. The protagonist clearly knows that his people don't like him having contact with those who killed half of their population, but he doesn't say anything about it. After a while, they finally meet the third member of the trio, Uncle Yu, who arrives on his snowmobile, saying it's been a long time since he's seen his nephew. He shows how healthy he is. His uncle exercises with his wife every day. Zhang Yi introduces the two who haven't met yet and tells them about each other's abilities. One of them is super strong and regenerates. The other can control snow in various ways. At first, the atmosphere is strange. A former army veteran, a recluse otaku, and a cheeky teenager who is our protagonist. This group would never have met in the normal world, but now they're going to work together on a rescue mission. Uncle asks what their mission is. Calling three awakened ones means it must be something very complex. Zhang Yi replies that it's not. It's just a simple rescue. The only complication is that there might be a fierce monster in the region where they're going now. The chubby one gets very scared and asks what kind of monster they'll face. So Zhang Yi affirms that just as they turned into mutants with powers, animals may have also turned into mutants. He doesn't know what this creature is like. Maybe they're humans in the form of monsters, or monsters in the form of humans. Uncle Yu says if Zhang Yi says they can, then they can. He agrees and says that with the three of them together, nothing can stop them. After taking the ice road and driving, we see the old location of Tianqing Academy. Soon, we see the situation of the survivors from the academy. They're trapped in a gymnasium. Other students revolt against Xinxin and ask, after so many died, how did she, being wheelchair-bound, manage to survive? She who is dragging others to death is a burden. They shout 
because they need to protect a disabled person. Others only wonder how they can live longer, while others mourn the deaths of those who have already passed away. One of the students noticed that Shin Shin didn't show sadness or remorse for those who died, and points to her asking why she's still alive. The teacher shouldn't be helping her, she's dead weight. Some students discuss whether they should sacrifice her the next time the monster attacks. The bespectacled student agrees, saying they've already protected her enough. The other student ends the discussion, saying that's not the issue. The teacher doesn't leave anyone behind, so there's no point in discussing it. She's the one who protects them. Then, one of the students goes to Shin Shin, who is far away from them. The girl approaches and coldly tells Shin Shin that she should go to hell alone if the teacher won't let her go. Everyone shouldn't have the burden of carrying her. Crying, she doesn't respond. All the students behind her agree and shout from afar that she really should do it. The only person against it is her best friend, who steps forward, saying she has nothing to do with it. No one helped her. She was the only one who carried her friend around. The rich girl's argument is that she shouldn't speak up or say anything because she's rich, and the girl in front of her is just a poor person who got into college on a scholarship. Her friend says that everyone is equal and has the same rights. However, the arrogant girl argues that no, they will never be equal. She is richer and more powerful. She is more important. Shin Shin only has any value because she comes from a highly rich and influential family, even though she is wheelchair bound. Now her position should be revoked because she is a burden to everyone. Finally, the critical girl says that she only defends the girl because she is rich and hopes that when this is over, she will have some reward for supporting this wheelchair bound person so much. Upon hearing all this argument, Shin Shin cries. After so much hatred, one of the girls leaves the crowd, walks among them, and goes to Shin Shin and says they should be friends too. This girl only thought about the advantages she could have after the apocalypse. Everyone's discussion is interrupted when a window falls in the gymnasium. Suddenly, a giant paw appears through the window and grabs one of the people and drags them out of the window. It's so big that it can fit the person's entire body in its paw. The monster is a giant cat, licking its prey. It manages to fit it entirely into its mouth. Everyone screams from inside the gym, seeing this gruesome scene as they run quickly. Shin Shin and her friend are left behind because of the wheelchair. They go to the door trying, but it's locked. The cat breaks the window and jumps inside with its prey still in its mouth, only half of it in front of everyone. It takes it out and finishes eating only the head and discards the body. It jumps in front of the other students as if it's intimidating them all. One of the students goes to Shin Shin and pushes her forward, causing her to fall defenseless in front of the cat. Her friend, scared, wonders if she should save her. Shin Shin, in front of the giant feline, is about to be the next to die. One of the students, noticing that the cat was distracted, tries to run out of the gym next to it. The cat, noticing the movement, changes its focus from Shin Shin and crushes its prey on the ground. They try to crawl back, asking for help. The cat turns its attention to the other students. Then, her friend goes after her, trying to help her. The students behind say that the cat seems to like objects that are in motion. Shin Shin seemed dead on the ground, so it ignored her. The same student shouts. The cat is distracted now. Everyone run to the exit. They look back. The first hit student is lying on the ground, asking for help. They only say that for some to survive. Others have to be sacrificed. As they run, the injured student remains motionless and says that if it depends on him, everyone will die with him. The cat turns its attention to the other students who are running and begins to crush other people. While the cat only played with its prey in its paws, its tail also managed to crush some students. One student screams in despair for help. Luckily for everyone, their teacher returns to the gym door. This is enough to get the cat's attention. That sword she feels is dangerous. The teacher tries to attack the cat, and it simply runs away. The cat knows the teacher is different and dangerous. So, the feline simply grabs one of the fallen prey and runs away. The teacher on guard duty goes to the exit and realizes that the cat really left, leaving giant tracks in the snow. It seems that the creature couldn't defeat the teacher, so something isn't normal about her. If she stayed here all the time, there would be no risk of attack, but she has to leave the gym to get food for them. And when this happens, the mutant cat attacks the gym. Among the victims and the wounded, the student who was previously arguing with Shin Shin complains again. Why didn't this wheelchair-bound girl die in the attack? Every time this wheelchair-bound girl survives, how is that possible? A boy intervenes, saying it's okay. The teacher brought food. The cat left. He tries to give food to Shin Shin, but the girl steps in, saying no. She doesn't deserve it. She's just dead weight. The teacher, tired of so much fighting and having to go outside to get food for everyone, doesn't interfere. She says that as long as they don't kill each other, she doesn't need to do anything. Let them fight. She needs to rest. Another girl, in despair, shouts, saying the world has ended. Why do they have to fight? There's no hope anymore. Everyone will die equally. Another student says no. He can save everyone. His father is an important leader of a very powerful company. Surely he will come to save them. Meanwhile, the protagonist arrived with his partners near the rescue site. Looking around, everything 
everything is covered in snow. How will they find the exact location of the academy? It seems everything is under the snow. Trying to call the girl, she doesn't answer. There's no signal. So, they'll have to search another way. The protagonist says that splitting up would be faster, but since there's a monster out there, they'll go together. This monster might be out there and defeat them separately, but not together. The girl has survived two months around here. A little longer won't be a problem. They return to the car and continue driving through the college campus until they find a building that isn't buried. Maybe they can access down there through here. According to the GPS, this is the astronomy center of the college. The dorms and cafeteria are north of here. It's not at this location, but if they enter through here, they can walk through the college. However, there's a risk of ice structures collapsing on them, so it's too dangerous to try. Before he finishes saying it's not safe, Chun was there trying to get into the place, and Uncle Yu was pushing him. Lucky for him, he's too big and couldn't get in. Zhang Yi notices a creature approaching. As he points his gun, he discovers it's a giant cat. The monster stood in front of him and didn't attack, even with him pointing a gun at it. Perhaps the creature has some kind of reasoning, said the protagonist. However, when Uncle Yu and the Chubai guy returned, the first thing they did was attack the creature. In response, the cat became aggressive and attacked them. With no choice now, Zhang Yi decided he should attack too. With his body reinforcement power, he jumped over the creature and shot it in the head. He landed with great style behind it. Even with the shot, the creature kept advancing. Uncle Yu stood in front of the chubby guy, attacking with his body reinforcement power. A yellow light covered his body. He delivered a powerful punch to the cat's head. Even the ice structures below them were destroyed by the impact. With that, the cat staggered back from the blow, and Zhang Yi watched it, asking if this is a cat that grew up. Using his more powerful precision rifle now, he shoots the cat and wounds its face. The creature, angry, now turns into a ball of fur and rolls toward him. Terrified, Zhang Yi thinks the best alternative would be to make it go into his dimensional storage space. Due to its speed, maybe it would be possible. But the cat, sensing the danger, changed its course and escaped from the dangerous trap and headed toward the snow mountain. It made a loud impact noise and disappeared. Quickly it emerged from another hole and stayed at a distance, looking at them, roaring, as if it were angry. Drawing everyone's attention, the cat showed its backside as if mocking them and left. Uncle and the chubby guy wonder if the cat seemed like it was cursing them, as if it were a human being. They don't understand how the cat could be so big and capable of creating these passages so quickly. The otaku says that if this cat is here hunting like this, there shouldn't be any survivors alive in this school. However, Zhang Yi recounts that the cat, when it approached, wasn't aggressive and didn't seem like it was going to attack. Only after Chun and Uncle Yu attacked did the cat become aggressive. Zhang Yi asserts that this creature must have undergone some kind of mutation that made it giant and somewhat intelligent because the cat seemed to be aware of its actions. They observe the tunnel it dug and decide to descend through them. If this cat attacks the academy where the students are, following its trail is likely to lead them to where its easier prey reside. At the bottom of the hole, there are several bifurcations, various other holes that lead to places they do not know. They do not know the right path to follow and also run the risk of getting lost. Zhang Yi takes something from his dimensional storage that he can use to mark the path they follow so they can find their way back. They smell blood and decide that's where they should go. Zhang Yi questions if Chun is afraid. They are three against just one feline. The cat stands no chance. Additionally, he draws his desert eagle from his dimensional storage. This will be an efficient weapon. Uncle Yu, being a former veteran, reconnaisses and appreciates this beauty. Being more experienced, Uncle Yu goes ahead to lead. Back inside the gym, the teacher stands guard, waiting to see if the monster will return. She is exhausted, having not slept for days, to stand guard and fetch food for her students. Even though the teacher seems exhausted, the children complain that the food has run out again. The teacher should go out to look for more food for them. She questions what is better. If she goes out now the creature might come back and attack. The student's response is that she should go as quickly as possible and try to come back faster with the food. The woman almost loses her patience, but keeps herself under control. She says she will go once more to fetch more food. After she leaves, they close the door, and everyone is alone again in the sports gym. The teacher outside says that if she encounters this cat, she will fight until they die together. Inside the gym, Karen asks Shin Shin if she is okay. She says yes, thanks to her friend. The rich and arrogant student again says that once again, she's being a burden to her friend. Doesn't she ever get tired of being useless? Karen, the friend, tells the arrogant girl that she pushed Shin Shin the last time the cat was here, so she owes an apology. Before they start a fight, the cat appears again at the gym window. They only see the paw coming in, and another person is crushed by the creature. The student who said before that he could save everyone runs and pushes another person back to be bait. With another swipe, another person is turned into pulp. While the desperate students flee, once again, the teacher returns to the gym and now has the chance to stick the sword up the cat's butt. But she prefers the head. The creature is wounded, and they start a fight in front of the students. 
While they were in a frenzied combat draw, the teacher sees three people arrive through the cat's escape route. Zhang Yi and his two companions arrive behind the tunnel and witness everything unfold. The teacher, noticing their presence, becomes hopeful and shouts for help against this monster. Chun was ready to attack, but Zhang Yi stops him. According to the protagonist, this woman is extremely skilled and managing to hold off the cat with just one sword. She surely is also a mutant with special powers, and at this moment, it's impossible to know if she's an ally or an enemy. So, he decides to let the two creatures face off, the cat and the woman. Zhang Yi says they won't fight, they'll take another path to find the gym. Uncle Yu, watching from afar, says that this woman is truly dangerous. It wouldn't be wise to approach her. They leave through the tunnel. The woman, not believing they're backing off, shouts for them to help. Together, they can defeat the creature, and they don't care. They go around through another tunnel and manage to enter the gym's entrance. They walk towards the students, and soon, through the wheelchair and the red hair, Zhang Yi realizes who the girl Xin is. He says it's lucky she's alive, but before he can reach Xin, the boy steps in, asking if he came from the base of the Western Mountain and is a friend of his father. Zhang Yi, serious, questions, what Western Mountain? What place is this? The boy introduces himself. He's the class representative, and his name is Sheng Yu. He's from a noble family, so he should recognize him. The protagonist simply agrees, and wants to know about this base on the Western Mountain. The clever boy asks, if they're from another base, why are they asking about the base on the Western Mountain? But that would be strange, since the Western base is closer from here. With this statement, Zhang Yi has in mind that there should be other bases around here. He then asks the boy what he knows about the other bases besides the Western Mountain, and the reality is that the boy knows nothing, only what his father said, that these shelters exist. Ignoring the boy, Zhang Yi goes to Xin Xin. The other students around, surprised, try to talk to Uncle Yu and the otaku. By the way, what could these girls and boys be asking Uncle Yu? Meanwhile, Zhang Yi finally reaches the wheelchair-bound girl, asking if she's okay and if she's indeed Xin Xin. He introduces himself as Zhang Yi and knows her sister Yang Mi very well. She asked him to come and save her and if Xin Xin is willing to go with him. Without much thought, the girl says yes. Then, Zhang Yi prepares to drag her wheelchair and take her with him. However, before going, she says, wait, she wants a favor, he must stop that fight, prevent them from continuing to fight. The protagonist's thought is, he wants this girl to owe him a favor, so making this request would be a way to put her in his debt. If that's the case, Zhang Yi calls Chun and his uncle to do a job. As they head towards this battle, Zhang Yi notices the feline claws scattered around, thinking they could be useful. He stores them in his dimensional vault. Then, following orders, Chun activates his powers and causes the ceiling to collapse on the teacher and the cat, separating them from the fight. It worked, but it leaves the teacher furious. She didn't want the fight to be interrupted, only for them to help eliminate the creature. Ironically, Zhang Yi says she should be thankful for it. However, the teacher points her sword, saying that was the first time she managed to corner the creature, and the three of them ruined it. Maybe she won't have another opportunity. Zhang Yi responds that he only wanted to help her not kill the animal, nothing more. Besides, the protagonist explains that he only did it because one of his students asked him to. Angry, the teacher curses Zhang Yi and attacks. Confidently, he jumps back and shoots her right in the forehead with a desert eagle. However, what he didn't expect was for the woman to cut the bullet from the shot. She's even more powerful than he imagined. As she was about to strike him, Zhang Yi activates his dimensional space power and sucks the woman into his dimension. After completely sucking her in, he falls back war. He is aware that this is very dangerous, telling them not to approach. He spits the woman out of his dimensional storage and is very teared of staying there for just a few seconds. The protagonist mocks her for attacking someone who just helped her and says she's very dangerous and reckless. Zhang Yi takes his sword. For now, it will stay with him. Something that can cut bullets like that is very precious. Give me back my sword. Not a chance. He tells a student to help their teacher rest. She seems very worn out. After helping their teacher, Zhang Yi explains to everyone there that he came here only to take the wheelchair-bound girl as requested for them to retrieve her. The teacher asks why he can't take all the other students as well. The students around Zhang Yi say they're all wealthy and can pay whatever he wants if he takes them safely out of here. Zhang Yi repeats, he can't be responsible for people as important as them. If their families are rich, they'll send people to rescue them. The student who is angry at Xin Xin decides this can't stand. She and other students decide to take the girl as a hostage, stating that if they are not taken together, Xin Xin will die here. The teacher, frightened, calls them all idiots and reminds them that they are all classmates. Why are they doing this when there is such great danger outside? Despite the teacher's warning, the students persist. If they are not taken together, no one will leave here. Losing patience with them, the protagonist draws his police pistols and simply shoots down all the students who were holding Xin Xin hostage. The teacher is astonished by this reaction. They are just teenagers. Zhang Yi calmly responds that young people who are capable of taking others hostage must accept the 
consequences of that as well. Zhang Yi's only surprise in this was that Xin Xin wasn't at all frightened by what just happened. He goes to her, checks if she's okay, and asks if they can go home now. She answers yes, but only if her friend Karen can go with her too. Zhang Yi thinks about having one more girl to take care of. Why should he? That's what he thought, but he didn't say anything. However, Xin Xin notices her savior's gaze and says she would be very useful to him. She is very intelligent. In this academy, there are two types of people. Those who are rich and pay to be here and are mostly incompetent, and there are those who enter with scholarships because they are extremely intelligent in their fields. Karen understands everything about mechanics, engineering. She would be perfect for building and fixing things. Curious about this explanation, the girl then pats her chest and says she can do all that indeed. Convinced, the protagonist says, it's okay. He takes Shin Shin and tells Karen to come with them too. Karen starts showing her proactivity and asserts that she can push her friend along the way herself. The other students around Zhang Yi shout that they are also very competent. They know how to drive luxury cars, manage money, and give orders to employees. The girl who tried to be friendly with Shin Shin before steps forward and says that if the monster returns, everyone will be killed here. And if Zhang Yi's group hadn't hindered the teacher earlier, she would have been able to eliminate the creature. So, it's their responsibility to secure the students. This statement makes sense, but the conflict-solving machine of a protagonist in his hand says he doesn't care. He's leaving now, even if it takes more ammunition. As they leave, Xin Xin says that among all the people, at least Teacher Lian was good to her, and so she thanks her for everything. The protagonist then proceeds on his way. The teacher decides to make all the students follow Zhang Yi's group. Chun questions what they are going to do by following them. The protagonist simply replies that if he wants, he can take care of everyone alone. With his powers, he could bring the tunnel down on everyone. The frightened otaku responds that he wouldn't do something like that. Outside, the protagonist doesn't bother hiding his powers and retrieves his car and snowmobile from the dimensional warehouse. Uncle Yu and Chun go by motorcycle, and the rest go by car. He picks the girl up and takes her to the car. With the three of them inside, Zhang Yi accelerates his car and leaves the students behind. The students ask the teacher what they should do now. Outside the giant cat could attack everyone. At this moment, the wealthy student says that his cell phone finally has a signal. Now he can contact his father. Returning to Zhang Yi and the two girls relaxing in the comfortable car, finally, a little warmth, he takes out water and food from his storage space for them to replenish their energy. Grateful, they accept the meal and say that the brother is amazing. Zhang Yi says it's actually Xin Xin who is really amazing. Not understanding this statement, she asks why this praise they just met. Furthermore, she questions how she could be amazing. She's just a burden to everyone. If it weren't for Karen protecting her, she would never be alive here today. The protagonist rebuts and says it's not quite like that. She really is very intelligent. A wheelchair user surviving for so long isn't luck. For them to have survived in that place was because Xin Xin has a secret. Karen doesn't understand this conversation and asks what they are talking about. Xin Xin changes expression and acknowledges that Zhang Yi is very smart to deduce that. The protagonist realized that there are many coincidences surrounding the girl, especially related to the monster. While Xin Xin maintains a face of admiration, Zhang Yi talks about the girl's request to separate the fight between the cat and the teacher. It was as if she was asking to protect the monster and her teacher at the same time. Why protect the monster that brought terror to everyone. The adorable wheelchair-bound girl acknowledges Zhang Yi's intelligence. He got about 60% of the situation right. However, she's not that malicious. She didn't command the cat to attack anyone. She used to take care of a stray cat before the snow apocalypse happened. Karen, surprised, asks if that little cat they used to feed, Blossom, is this giant monster? The answer is yes. Xin Xin thinks that's why the cat never attacked the two girls for real. She always fed and treated it well, so Blossom must recognize Xin Xin and her friend. Now Karen understands why they were so lucky. Zhang Yi wants to know if it's just gratitude from the cat towards Xin Xin or if there's something more. Because the cat always attacked all the students, but when it encountered the protagonist for the first time, it didn't attack. It seemed like the cat was intelligent. Xin Xin once again acknowledges Zhang Yi's intelligence. She admits that she told the cat not to attack people coming from outside the academy, as they would be people coming here to save her. With this statement, Zhang Yi asks again, did she never command the cat to kill others who were mean to her? She replies, no. She would never do such a thing. The cat simply needed to feed, and the only available food was them. But the crazy girl asks if she's too cruel for thinking like that. Mischievously, the protagonist thinks no. He thinks exactly like her. He doesn't care about what happened to the students. Only Shin Shin's and now Karen's well-being are important. In this cruel world, only those who have some value can survive. The redhead girl knows she has value to Zhang Yi, and that's why she came here and protected her from everyone. Moreover, now he knows Karen is useful to him too. The protagonist asks why Shin Shin only contacted her sister now, after a long time, as he makes a sharp turn in the car. Smiling, Xin Xin 
Jin says she never intended to contact her sister because of her. Her goal was Zhang Yi, so she contacted Yang Mi. This confuses him. How could her goal be someone she didn't know? The girl says she's the best hacker he'll ever know. Even before the apocalypse, she was curious about the Walmart robbery and researched everything about those involved. After the start of the global freeze, she was sure that stock supervisor was responsible. The recently leaked information only confirmed her theory. She used her sister to get him to come save her. Her entire plan was made just with that simple cell phone. She has all the information about what Zhang Yi did before and after the apocalypse. Now she admits she knows everything about the building's extermination. It was easy to access all the security cameras he asked to install. Someone requesting the construction of a fortress made her keep an eye on him. This revelation leaves the protagonist and me startled. This girl decided to monitor him since the news of the Walmart being robbed. She also says that if he hadn't had contact with Yang Mi or even Zhou Kier, she would have other ways to lure him here to save her. But she's glad he came on his own. Zhang Yi, in his thoughts, convinces himself that this girl is dangerous so he must be careful. Something strange now is the fact that the little cat Blossom has been following the car since they left. He thinks that if he could tame this cat, he could be even more powerful. Meanwhile, the girls watch the little cat through the window. After driving for a while, they finally reach the refuge. Chun and his uncle also arrive. He rewards the two and tells them they can go back home now. He's going back inside his house. The warm air makes the girls really comfortable. Zhang Yi says that as long as they obey and help, he will help them too. Embarrassed, Chin Chin asks if he'll need help with those things too. This question catches him off guard, so he doesn't respond. Karen doesn't even understand the underlying meaning in that question. Zhang Yi then tells the girl, she's too young, for now, she just needs to do her job as a hacker. Now everyone here is under her responsibility, and that's her only duty here. The protagonist admits that Xin Xin is really adorable, but he already has Zhou Kair and Yang Mi to satisfy his desires. However, the young Loli's thoughts are whether he's dismissing the possibility of having her as a woman because she can't move her legs. Before the conversation continues, Zhou Kier comes running to meet her. Right behind her is Yang Mi, who was very worried and didn't know if her sister was okay. Xin Xin says she was fine and not in danger. She only contacted her sister because she knew she was with Zhang Yi. It's him she's interested in. While this attention-seeking discussion goes on, the protagonist stands back, enjoying the two sisters vying for his attention. One of the most beautiful women in China and one of the smartest. How can they be so different? The girl's statement piques Zhou Kier's curiosity about how she knows Zhang Yi. She explains everything about how she knew of his existence and introduces Karen, her best friend at the special school, who is a mechanic expert. Yang Mi says she's adorable. The head of the house tells Yang Mi to prepare dinner for everyone and arrange rooms for the new girls. After a while, it was the first hearty feast for the girls after months of difficulty in college. Zhang Yi asks Karen to help in the house. Initially, she thought wrong things. Maybe she didn't mind doing things in that sense. The protagonist asks if she can make weapons and ammunition. To do that, she says she would need the correct materials and machinery. If she has everything, she can do it. Satisfied with the girl's answer, Zhang Yi stands up and tells her to accompany him. He retrieves several mechanical machines and asks her to observe. Impressed that each of these machines would be worth millions of dollars, she lists all the necessary machines. If she needs more things, he can get them. Now only the materials are missing. Zhang Yi says he can help her organize everything, but she says he doesn't need to worry. She can do everything by herself. What kind of weapons could Karen make? He retrieves the teacher's sword from his dimensional warehouse for her to evaluate if she can make others like it. She's impressed with the quality and is honored to touch it. However, she reminds him that this isn't just any weapon. It's an ancient relic and a work of art. She can't replicate it. This sword is so well made that it can even cut diamonds. She returns the sword and explains that Miss Liang was rewarded with this sword for her services as a bodyguard for a very important person in the past. She values this sword more than her own life. This information gives the protagonist ideas for later. Afterward, they return to the dinner table to finish eating. They talk more about what Karen can do in the house. Later, they'll watch television. On the news, an important piece of news is finally told to the population. It is revealed that the cold calamity has no end date and its consequences are not fully known, but it is a fact that a large part of the world's population is no longer alive. In several places around the world, a state of anarchy has been declared, laws no longer apply, and now 
now everything is based on power. Armed groups and organizations use military power to gain control of regions and resources. Meanwhile, Xin Xin feels jealous of the two girls around Zhang Yi. She wanted to be there too. Yang Mi then asks Zhang Yi's opinion if this is true. He confirms it and says that military organizations and groups will establish themselves and become his enemies, so the fight for resources will become increasingly intense. Xin Xin agrees with everything and says that soon they will enter a period of great wars for territory and resources. This place will become a target for other people sooner or later. Because of this, Zhang Yi promptly takes the girl to where the supercomputer is. With this, she can control everything here, and with unlimited access to the internet, she can make magic happen. In a few moments, she's already getting familiar with the system and starts typing like crazy on the keyboard in front of her. When she finally finishes analyzing the system, Zhang Yi asks what she thinks. The security system was the best there was 10 years ago. It is still very powerful, but very outdated. Even though it was impenetrable decades ago, today a hacker can exploit vulnerabilities in this system and gain access to it. She says that several invasions of this system have been made in recent weeks. She estimates that in just one more month, they could have taken over the entire security system of the house. With this information, Zhang Yi is certain that the best choice he made was to take risks and go after this girl. He asks if she can remove these vulnerabilities that exist in the network. She says it's easy. In just a few minutes, she can solve all these vulnerabilities. In a few minutes, Xin Xin claims it's done. Zhang Yi recognizes her talent once again and says that Xin Xin is brilliant. Satisfied, the girl says that now is the time to counterattack. She herself will hack the network of those who tried to attack the internal network of this mansion. He questions if this isn't a risk. She can't leave traces behind. Xin Xin replies that amateurs can be traced. She's not an amateur. Zhang Yi was increasingly pleased with the girl until Zhou Kier appears and says, they have a problem. A monster is at the doorstep. The giant monster is the giant cat, the protagonist. Already knowing what it is, ask Xin Xin what they should do. The cat must really like her and is here because it's concerned about Xin Xin's safety. If that's the case, Zhang Yi says their goal now is to tame this creature. He takes Jin Shin out of the security room. The protagonist calms the girls, and Jin Shin goes to the window where the little kitty is. Sensing the cat is calm, the protagonist grabs Jin Shin and says, they're going out now to feed the cat personally. They approach, and the kitty remains calm. However, when Zhang Yi gets too close, it opens its eyes with a threatening tone. He tries to negotiate with the monstrous cat, using food from his dimensional warehouse. He tries to say that if she's a good kitty, she can have this. The kitty seems to ponder this and refuses to take the food. Xin Xin reminds that the kitty is a street cat. Street cats are the most suspicious animals in the world. That's not how he's going to earn the kitty's trust. The protagonist then hands over the food and says that if the kitty promises not to attack the village on the other side, she can have the food. The smart kitty seems to understand. She agrees to eat the food and won't eat any humans from the village on the other side of the frozen lake. After this agreement is made, he returns with Xin Xin to the house, and then Zhou says something impressive happened. The little kitty simply shrank in size. This means she didn't become giant with the mutation. She gained the ability to become large with the mutation. This also helps them understand how a giant cat managed to feed by eating a few students in the academy. Obviously, she would shrink to eat. Additionally, Xin Xin says this also explains the fact that the kitty could suddenly disappear, and not even the teacher could find her. Besides appearing without anyone noticing such a large cat approaching. Zhang Yi, observing the kitty, realizes she's injured from the fight, but she doesn't seem to care. Nonetheless, he says he'll try to administer medicine to try to gain the kitty's trust later. When night falls, the two girls go to sleep in their room. Karen says it feels like a dream. This morning they were cold and hungry at college. Tonight, they're in such a comfortable place, in a very cozy bed, with their bellies full of food. Embarrassed, Xin Xin says, all this is thanks to Zhang Yi. Besides, he's very smart and resourceful. Being by his side is the safest place there is currently. She says they need more weapons and further strengthen the bunker, while they talk and brainstorm about what they could do to further improve their home. The night passes. The next day, very early in the morning, Karen goes to show her ideas to the protagonist and says she can do anything he wants. While in this mansion, everyone is happy and experiencing great pleasures, those people left behind at college. The richest student managed to get in touch with his father, but the others couldn't contact anyone. Their families probably didn't survive. At least the monster cat didn't attack again. The boy asked his father to rescue everyone, and after waiting a few hours, this really happens. They heard noise and
and ran outside to see who had arrived. A group of people in a cart pulled by wolves had appeared. The teacher recognized them as military personnel with excellent cold weather equipment. The boy asks if they came on his father's orders. The men talk among themselves until finally, one man takes off his helmet. It was the boy's father. The boy was surprised because his father, who was once fat, was now thin and haggard. He hugged his father. He asks why his father took so long to come rescue him. Before his father can explain anything, the men ask where the supplies of this school are, because they know there must be many supplies stored here. The teacher finds this strange. The first thing they ask about is the supplies in the school. The boy reveals, without hesitation, that the frozen school market has many, many supplies. But there's a giant monster lurking around. The man says that's not a problem. They'll defeat any creature that appears. But the boy has to go along to show them the way. Upon hearing this, the kid didn't think twice about passing the responsibility to the teacher. He doesn't know anything, and she can go with them. Anticipating this scenario, the teacher says she can lead the soldiers to the supply location. The soldiers all went to where the supplies were, then they returned and called the students. They had to help carry the supplies, and everyone rushed to obey the military orders. After a while, they were bringing in all the supply boxes that were stored in the market. After much effort, the students brought everything. Then the wealthiest student boasted, saying it was his father who saved everyone. However, when all the supplies were taken, the soldiers left. The students were terrified and asked how they were going to be taken together to the base. The soldiers said they would run. They complained about why there wasn't transportation for them as well. Another student said it's over 10 kilometers to the base. The soldier made it clear that whoever complains again will be treated as a deserter and will receive punishment. They must shut up and follow whoever they can. The teacher took out a bag of chocolate, gave one to each of the students who were already exhausted, and with that, they walked until nightfall and reached the base at the foot of the mountain. They were ordered to enter the base, descending the stairs. The place was very large and technological, and there was no one there. The teacher tried to keep everyone calm, and soon after, a group of soldiers in sealed suits arrived and applied gas to them. After that, a slightly greedy woman introduced herself and asked them to cooperate. This is just a disinfection to ensure that no disease will spread in the base. They lined up, and everyone went through disinfection, blood tests, and fecal tests. After all the tests were done and they waited, they were served a portion of a white yogurt. They said it was very tasty, and everyone ate it together. Would you like to try this yogurt? After a while, she quickly asked who his son was. The frightened father said this is his son. The woman ordered her team to take them to the appropriate place. However, she told the son that he must go somewhere else. Before leaving, the boy told the other students that he's not like them. He's important here because of his father. Before he left, the father warned the son to follow the rules. Don't break the rules. The woman led the boy to another place, and the other students whispered from afar that this isn't right. He's being privileged. They finally arrived where the woman wanted. The large woman told the boy to take a bath. Without thinking twice, he did it. It had been three months since he had bathed. After coming out still with a towel, the boy widened his eyes. The greedy woman was in front of him, ready to work hard. She grabbed his hand and threw him on the bed. While things happened in this room, we go back to the other students, taken to another place to wear uniforms. A woman along with other armed soldiers said they were going to the place where they would work. They arrived at a place where there were bizarre bicycles with giant gears and people pedaling. This is where you will work. In these difficult times, you will work here all day to have food and a warm place to sleep. She also explained to them that the energy of the entire base is generated here, so their work is very important. Anyone who doesn't work to generate energy will go without food. The students cry in despair. How could they, who are such important people, do this? All the students enter a panic and ask the teacher to save them. They didn't deserve to go through this. The leader of the place says they can cry while they work. The teacher agrees and advises them not to be afraid. At least here, they will have protection and food. For now, they must go to work and obey orders, including herself. In the privileged student's room, he is destroyed. After the service, the father was at the door, waiting for everything to finish. He asked if everything went well. The large woman replied, Yes, the boy is really his son. He's exactly like him. Very hardworking. In other words, his father's job was just to satisfy the needs of this large woman. That's why he's so thin and worn out. It's very tiring. She leaves and says she hopes his son continues to work hard, because it's very important for the base's prosperity. The boy lay down without believing what had happened. The father asked, asks if he's okay, and if he didn't break anything in his body, crying. He asks why his father didn't tell him before that this was how he had survived all this time. What happened to his job? The father replies that it's complicated. Things changed after the hard times came. He explains that after the beginning of the snowstorm, which they believed would last a short time, they discovered that mutant people with powers emerged. And over time, the hierarchy changed. People with powers became more relevant, and people who were only in lower political positions lost their space. For him to continue 
continue to stay safe here, it was necessary for him to work hard, very hard, with the lady who just left. And from now on, his son must take his place and work hard. Returning to the dormitory after an exhausting day of peddling, everyone had sore glutes. They asked the teacher if they would have to work like this every day from now on. For the time being, yes. And they shouldn't complain about just having to work. That's how people live in the normal world too. However, they are not normal. They are the elite. Do important people have to work too? Why do they have to suffer? They want the teacher to come up with a solution so they don't have to work. During this discussion, the most influential boy returns to the room looking very sad and downcast. They then ask him if he, being important, can change their situation. However, he says that things here aren't as he thought. Now all they can do is follow orders. Each one has their function that deserves respect here. The teacher then asked if he had returned to where he was and what he was doing. The frustrated boy said that he was now getting to know the base. Now he understands how things really work here. He held a meeting and explained to everyone that from now on, they have to rely only on themselves. As he explained the new social hierarchy, the teacher realized that she, with her position as a teacher, no longer holds any significance. But as an experienced fighter, a strong mutant, she has some value. The teacher asked him to explain the current situation of the base. He said that this place is run by Chen Xining, who with the support of the Awakened, has become the new leader of the area. And now, he controls everything. The people close to him who are important live in layer number one of this area and have a comfortable life. In total, there are four layers in the base. The leader and his family live in layer 1. In layer 2, the technicians and scientists have a comfortable life. In layer 3, the mutants with powers also have a good life. In the fourth layer are the people who have to work to generate energy for the base and have a miserable life. The boy, frightened, explains to them that he doesn't intend to rebel. The people from the third level ensure security. Here, no one has a chance to even think about going against them because they will be annihilated. After seeing all this, one of the boys grabs the guy by the neck and says, it's it's all his fault. He promised they would have a good life, that they would be saved. He retorted, saying they preferred to stay in college, die by the giant cat, or go without food. He lets go and says that if they have any chance of improving the situation, it depends on teacher Liang. The other students turn to her and say that they are her responsibility. She has to help them improve their lives. They can't work hard in life, at least let them have an easy job. After seeing so much absurdity, the woman said she was tired and would rest to work tomorrow. The next day, everyone wakes up to go to work all in a line. The local supervisor announces that today is a day to thank the savior, Chen Xining, for saving them all. From time to time, all the personnel working at the base are gathered to stand and glorify the savior who conquered the base and keeps them all safe. While everyone follows the hurt effect, the teacher is the only one who realizes what is happening here. The supervisor says over the loudspeaker that they are grateful to the supreme leader of the base. The teacher knows that this is brainwashing. Everyone is invited to step forward, take a megaphone, say their name, Name, what they like, and that they are grateful to be part of the family. In this morning meeting, they are taken to eat porridge rations. The teacher notices that the other students are already mingling with the others and seem a little happier. The boss's secretary enters the room with her escort, and over the loudspeaker asks if Liang is here. If she is, she must follow her. She goes to the woman to greet her and obey orders. Her students even think that this is a plan of the teacher to improve their situation in the base. But the secretary stares at everyone, and they understand the message. Return to your places. With the teacher, the secretary is polite, and after walking through the base, they arrive at the supreme leader's office. With great respect, he greets the teacher and tells her to sit down. The leader explains all his plans and ambitions for this base. With so much kindness, she listened to everything he has to say. His secretary will take the teacher to her new residence, there on level 2, and now she will be a military officer because she has awakened powers. Meanwhile, the most luxurious place of all is Zhang Yi's pleasure residence. After much insistence on trying to make friends with the cat, feeding her the best food he has. Gradually, the protagonist convinced the precious blossom cat to trust him. The animal watches her precious friend Xin Xin completely trust the man, so she decides to try. He thought that now he would succeed, but the cat ignores him and enters his house for the first time. She marks her territory, tears up the thousand dollar sofa, and the protagonist accepts it without complaining. Jokir says thank goodness this kitty isn't a woman, because if that were the case, she would lose her function to this cat. The kitten does everything she has to do and then curls up in an armchair and sleeps. He tries to pet her, and the kitten doesn't allow it, but after insisting, he succeeds. There, after much effort, the animal's trust is gained. After being tamed, Yang Mi bathes with her every time. Are those giant melons floating? Joe Kier and the other
other girls also approached the new pet of the house. Everything was going smoothly. Xin Xin was also mastering the house's technology with her hacking power. She discovered where the attempts to breach the house's security system were coming from, and thanks to her skills, it was straightforward to find out where they are, and they have no idea she's in their system. It was precisely from the base where Xin Xin's teacher is. Soon they should find out and try to attack this mansion. The confident protagonist says that when that time comes, he will destroy all his enemies without fear. He goes to Karen to find out about the progress in improving security. Karen says she made a silencer for him. His rifle is lethal, but it makes too much noise. Now he can be more discreet while carrying out his eliminations. She did a good job, even though the girl says that's the least she can do. She'll do anything he wants. He sits next to the girl and puts his hand on her shoulder. He asks if she knows how to manufacture grenades and explosive mines. I'm not sure if she's uncomfortable or shy. She looks at him with a questioning look and says he's underestimating her. The girl thought it was something complicated, but it's straightforward. The protagonist thought being able to do that was already incredible. She explains that people have been doing this since medieval times. She, as an expert, can do it blindfolded if she has the materials. If that's the case, Zhang Yi explains that enemies of an armed organization can attack their base, and they have mutant powers. She is concerned if they are in danger, but the protagonist reassures her and says no. He can keep everyone safe. Furthermore, the protagonist says that since the first time he saw the girl, he felt a special affinity for her. The girl questions if this is really true. He just asks when he ever lied to her. He felt something for her. It's as if she were a sister he has to protect. These words leave her deeply sad, so she also has no chance of being something more to him. Zhang Yi strokes her face and says that as long as she works for him, she will have a safe life. The girl perks up again and says she will do everything he asks, without any restriction. Now Zhang Yi leaves the girl to work. He admits that his method is to make her totally devoted to him, to try to win his approval with the best possible work. He urgently needs her to pass weapons to him, to use against his new enemies. The next step was to contact Chun and Uncle Yu. He tells them that he discovered the existence of a fortress that will be a threat to him. These soldiers are already spreading out. They shouldn't reveal to anyone that they have special abilities. Uncle Yu and the otaku agree and will be careful as he asked. After warning the two, Zhang Yi affirms that the otaku is at greater risk. His people are situated between his base and the mysterious military base, so they will soon be the first to receive a visit from these people. The protagonist warns that if Chun is in danger, he can come to his mansion as quickly as possible. The reason for this is that someone with such incredible ability like Chun, cannot be left to die. Meanwhile, Chun was sure that they would not harm his people because they are just a farming village. I don't see why any organization would be interested in them. In the base of the West Mountain, which is 27 kilometers from Chun's village, two people leave the base, and their destination is to investigate the region where our protagonist is. A man and a girl prepare to travel, so he asks her if she thinks this snowstorm will end at some point. According to her, the cold will last a long time still. She says this could be God's last act to eliminate the sins of the Earth. They hop on the sled and head toward their goal of investigating the district where the suspect Zhang Yi's base is. The condominium where the protagonist's base is located is after a frozen river. They won't go there now. They head off until they find a safe passage. Soon they are in front of Chun's village. They are impressed that behind the humble houses, there is a giant ice castle. Such a construction. They make noise at the entrance to the village, so the residents come out to see who's arriving. In these difficult times, everyone is an enemy. The woman is surprised that they are so prepared for the cold. When asked who they are, she introduces herself as government envoys on an official mission. After the village leader verifies if she is really the person she claims to be, the old man said they are welcome here. He also orders his people to treat these people very well. They are introduced to the important places in the village. One of the villagers, troubled by this, questions why the leader is welcoming these people. It's clear what they want from them. The old man counters by asking what is more important at the moment. It's not the food they have, it's the influence of the powerful people in this town. He convinces the people that providing food for them is a small price to pay to have an alliance with the military. The leader offered a banquet for the visitors. The girl says she is surprised at how well they can handle the snowstorm. They have plenty of food and can survive the cold. The leader boasts that it's all thanks to him. He ordered the snow castle to be built. The organization of the village's resources and food cultivation is all the responsibility of this old man. This makes the two soldiers admit that he is incredibly competent. One of the followers thinks their leader is a liar. He became the leader just a week ago. Everything he's talking about is the merit of the previous leader. The girl continues to extract information from the leader. She is curious about how they can produce so much food. The old man explains that before the snowstorm, their village was an agricultural one that produced 30% of the city's vegetables. Even after the snowstorm, they managed to keep the crops active. Before he finishes explaining something, it occurs to this idiotic old man that revealing all the 
those secrets to these people is not advantageous. He changes his speech, saying that it's not as easy as he made it seem. Production has been deteriorating over time. This banquet is exaggerated because they are very important people. Then he changes the subject to this ice construction that he himself ordered to be made. The government would benefit greatly from having him as an ally. The old man orders more food to be brought and says they can eat as much as they want. More food like this makes the woman certain that he is hiding secrets, and they can be used by the mountain base. The leader questions whether the government knows when this ice storm will end, if they have any plan to solve this climate problem. The woman then says that what she has to tell now is secret. As she is in a good mood, she will reveal it to him. She says the government has an elaborate plan to solve the snowstorm, and it will soon be put into action. They become extremely excited to hear this, and the woman says everything is under the government's control. Then she asks if they noticed anything different happening to any villagers lately. This time, the old man was not foolish. He pretended not to know what they were talking about. She tells them that the government is gathering these people to rebuild the country, and also says that people who know information about other mutants can tell the organization and will receive credit for it. However, the old man thinks to himself that, without any real confirmation of the benefits, he won't reveal that Chun is his mutant. But he asks for the girl's phone and says that if he learns any information, he will contact her himself to tell her. Changing her expression, the woman questions that she knows he is hiding something from his superiors. The old man, afraid, says he doesn't understand what she's talking about, and she insists that she knows something and is hiding it from them. Hiding information from the organization is a serious crime. With these threats, the old man changes his mind and goes to the woman. He just didn't tell before because his people don't know the person very well. She is curious about who he is. The old man replies that his name is Zhang Yi and that he lives on the other side of the river in a mansion. This really excites her. It's the name of the person they went out to investigate at the organization's request. She says to tell everything about this person. They will use this opportunity to get more information. The people then tell how the protagonist is a monster. They went there just to get some of his food, and he exterminated all their people. Half of the village was wiped out in the attack on his house across the lake. The old leader confirms this, and the people around him demonstrating their anger convinces the woman that this is true. Indeed, Zhang Yi is the mutant they are looking for. What she needs to know now is his face and his powers. However, they don't know this. Anyone who saw his face died. Anyone who saw his powers also died. In the end, the woman didn't get any real useful information. After talking, the two decide to leave, and they say that if the old man gets any information, he should report it immediately to her. As they move away, the first thing she does is notify the base that they found a people who have a lot of food and can be useful to them in the future. The man then questions why she lied so much to their people. She responds that it was for them to treat them as special guests. If it weren't for that, they wouldn't have the information and wouldn't have been treated well. He warns that when the people find out they will be furious, but for her, that doesn't matter. The two spot the protagonist's mansion in the gadded community on the other side of the river. The soldier says that, to keep such a large house heated and with so many supplies, he must be someone out of the ordinary. The woman then believes that he really must be behind the warehouse robbery. As that last news they received said, they prepare themselves. The man's power is to make big jumps. Carrying the woman on his back, they arrived right inside the enemy's property. They realize it's a luxury house of the highest standard. As impenetrable as a wall may be, the woman can get into anywhere. Her partner questions if it's safe for her to be alone. Wouldn't it be better to ask for reinforcements? She doesn't want to wait and says she will check first what's inside. Besides, he's just a normal person with powers. Her abilities are imperceptible to people. She crosses the bunker wall and enters the protagonist's house. Soon, she realizes everything is lit and heated. A bad feeling makes her hesitate. The person who lives here has a better life than the people in the first layer of her base. Could this Zhang Yi be more dangerous than the military base itself? He decides to go back to ask for reinforcements, but leaves a knife to signal that he's not safe, and leaves. She says the place is very strange. They should go back with reinforcements. The woman explains that the person who lives here is more prepared than they are. It would be impossible even for the elite of the mountain base to maintain such a comfortable and secure house. He must have many powers and unknown resources. Her ability is not good for combat. If she were noticed, it would be certain death. She mounts him, and they leave. While they were invading the enemy's base, inside his room, the cat noticed something and woke Zhang Yi up. He, with his weapon in hand, looks at the phone. There were no records of the security system. However, as the cat insists on leaving the room, he opens the door, and she goes straight to the knife left behind. Knowing that this came from outside, he checks the security system recordings from moments ago. Someone entered the house using a special ability. He becomes furious knowing that someone can invade his safe place and put his things at risk. Someone with this ability cannot exist. He tells the kitten that they will now go after the invaders. With his bulletproof vest and looking at the cameras, it wasn't 
long since they left here. The two soldiers on their snowmobile sled are on their way to the base to pass on the information. The woman says that what she is going to tell now is secret, but she's in a good mood and will reveal it to him. Zhang Yi is suspected of having stolen the Walmart warehouse, but no one knows how a single person could have done that. However, she suspects that he has some kind of ability that can hide things and somehow access them later, something like having access to another spatial dimension. That would explain everything he did. This type of ability is unprecedented. How can something so absurd exist? She agrees that if this is true, this is the most powerful ability for this world. For this information, they will be very well rewarded. She is eager to get to the base and tell everything to the leader. Her happiness is interrupted by a projectile that passes through her brain. Zhang Yi was as accurate as ever. Her panicked partner points in the direction the shot came from, but he was no longer there. Another shot happened, and this time he fled, taking his companion's body with him. Angry at having missed, he calms down again and knows how to dominate this situation. He jumps off the cat and says they have to kill these two no matter what happens. He orders the cat to attack in that direction. The hidden soldier, trying to get some information about who was attacking, doesn't know what to do now. A giant ball of fur comes rolling towards him. He protects his ally's body and narrowly dodges it. The trail of destruction shows how powerful this monster is. The Blossom Cat missed her attack and quickly returned to attack with her claws. The soldier took a gun out of his ass because he didn't have it with him before. During the fight, Zhang Yi fires rifle shots to hit the soldier and then he jumps high. Now in the air, the protagonist is sure that he won't be able to escape the next shot. The soldier escaped a cat attack, and when he noticed a projectile coming towards him, he did his best to dodge it too. Unfortunately, he managed to dodge a rifle, but now from the next attack of the Blossom Cat, he was not able to. He swallowed his arm and left it stuck. This opportunity was seized by Zhang Yi, who perfectly hit his skull. The two people were lying in the snow, and the Blossom Cat wanted to say something to him. Zhang Yi, not understanding what she means, then realizes that the girl's body began to emanate a yellow energy. Curious about this, he goes to her and wonders if this has to do with the girl's powers. Trying to touch the girl, this energy flows into his body. He feels that it was the girl's powers that are now part of him. Very happy with this, he kisses the Blossom Cat. He picks up the girl's body to examine and puts it inside his storage space. Now that they are not alive, there is no problem. Later, he was at home, and Shin Shin says that what he asked her to do, there is ready. From the equipment they had with the two soldiers who died, she found out that they are members of the Shishan Refuge Organization, in a base in the mountain, about 27 kilometers from here. It is an underground location divided into four layers. Several military forces and people with special abilities live there. This information with just so little makes the protagonist recognize once again that Shin Shin is amazing. Jokir goes to them to say that she has something important she has discovered. They go to the examination room. There she shows that the brain cells of the girl are different from those of a normal human being. People with special powers have their brain cells altered. Perhaps it is a brain alteration that gives powers to mutants. But unlike the woman, the man's mutation was not in the brain, but in the muscle cells of his legs. Furthermore, they were different from the woman's. Jokir believes he is an artificially created mutant. Artificial mutation was made in the leg muscles. After these discoveries, Zhang Yi went to the underground to test his new powers. Now, he can use this ability to reinforce projectiles. I thought the new power would be like the girls, like the protagonist of Charlotte, who can steal powers. But the new power he stole from the woman who passes through walls, he didn't use. At the military base, a distress call came from the agents who were investigating Zhang Yi's mansion territory. The leader of the two soldiers sent orders to send reinforcements now, but his request is denied. To do this, he has to ask for permission from the base leader. However, when he reaches the grand leader's room. His secretary is blocking the door and says he can't speak now. He is doing something very important. The mutant military personnel at the base insist it's an emergency. However, the secretary also insists that the supreme leader is also in an emergency and cannot be interrupted. They must come back later. Inside the room, the leader's emergency was an intimate meeting with the girls who came from the elite school. They make a point of praising everything the leader does and how great he is. We know this is to please the most powerful person there. After finishing playing doctor, they put on their clothes to return to their dormitories. After this important meeting, the leader asks what was the important matter of the soldiers. He explains that the captain received a maximum reinforcement request from his members who were exploring the region of that boy involved in the Walmart robbery. The leader authorizes sending reinforcements only of low ranks. This call is not important to 
waste important resources. After waiting a long time, the secretary notified that they can send their low-ranking reinforcements. The annoyed captain provided the troops. On the way back to his post, the teacher was also passing through the same place and noticed her students around here on the first layer. She didn't understand how this should be possible and asks the young girls. The two naughty ones reply that they are also surprised. The teacher is on the first floor, so she must have become important too. They boast that they also have their special abilities. They are incredible fighting in leader Chen Xining's bed. The teacher says she is disappointed with them. They seem to be aware that this is not something to be proud of. However, one of them says they can't stay here any longer. After finishing the battle, they must return to their new special dormitories on the second layer. Before they go, the teacher asks why she is not seeing the other students. They reply that while the teacher was away, many were separated from the others and never came back. One of them cries and says she thinks they must not be alive anymore and everything they accepted to do was to survive. The teacher was stunned by this information. Are there things happening here that she didn't know about? As she returned to the fourth layer, she found in the hallway the student who fights in bed with the supervisor of the fourth layer. He asks if she wants to know where the missing students are going. He takes her to a place and shows the scientists carrying bags. He affirms that those are the people who fail in the experiments secretly done here. The boy says he's telling her this because the college friends he likes are also disappearing, and his father ordered him not to question anything and just obey everything. The teacher says from now on, she will handle things. Stealthily, she finds a scientist who was alone and knocks him out. She took his special suit and with it goes unnoticed by the guards and manages to access the place where the bodies are taken. She wanted to have proof that what her student told her was true. The scientists talk among themselves about the failure of this last experiment. It didn't adapt either. Only when they removed the cover did she manage to be sure that everything was true. The people used to generate energy on the fourth layer are forcefully used in experiments and discarded like trash. They use an incinerator machine and turn a body into a white paste in another device. Not sure what that was, she overhears the scientists discussing what flavor they should put in the next meal for the fourth layer. They admit that this yogurt is very tasty and extremely nutritious. Since they don't know what it's made of, they can eat it without feeling guilty. After discovering this, she felt disgusted, so she went to the bathroom to vent. She just realized that the food she had eaten for days was other people, and in a way, her students. She changes her mind about it being better to live in this place. Here is clearly a hell and unfair to the weak on the fourth layer of the base. Teacher Liang decides that she will find a way to gather her students and get out of this place as soon as possible. But where will she take the students? Will they die of cold and hunger outside? At the same time, she wouldn't be able to keep people alive in the extreme climate outside this place. Meanwhile, that night the soldiers sent as reinforcements are in front of Zhang Yi's house. One of them was walking on the territory and triggered a trapline. Several pieces of him were scattered in the snow. The captain was furious about this and is sure that the culprit is the wretch living in that fortress. The noise of the explosion and now the gunfire made the protagonist realize they were being attacked. He ordered to activate Karen's new force field defenses. He has the strongest power, the two most incredible minds working for him. Zhang Yi watches through the window, satisfied with the result. His new opponents have finally arrived. The soldiers decide to search and disable all the traps hidden in the snow. The same thing Chun's village tried to do before, and now they met the same fate. Zhang Yi activated the remote explosives, and more soldiers went to visit Queen Elizabeth. The captain gets increasingly furious. The soldiers warn that they know nothing about the enemy. They've already lost many just in the first traps. They should ask for even more reinforcements. This would be a disaster for the captain. They are the reinforcement team that just arrived and they're asking for more reinforcements, so he ignores the advice and says they should keep advancing. Even though it's risky, he decides to continue the attack so they don't return empty-handed. As they advance, Yang Mi was worried that if they decided to continue, then did they find a loophole in security? Zhang Yi confidently says that he inspects this place almost every day and trusts Karen and Xin Xin's work. There is no security loophole. She then questions why Zhang Yi doesn't attack them while they are busy with the traps. The protagonist replies that he wants to know what they are capable of. The soldiers gather and come to the conclusion that this refuge was made precisely precisely to protect itself from human attacks. That miserable owner of this place should have known the world would descend into chaos. The captain's plan is to use explosives to make a passage into the house. A soldier manages to infiltrate and place several explosives while the homeowner watched calmly. Zhang Yi then says, it's time they had a lesson in facing their enemies. The man runs away from the house and then the explosives are activated. A strong explosion results in only a small hole that melted the snow around it. Upon investigation, they see that they hadn't even scratched the shelter 
shelter's walls. If this is as they think, the only alternative is to dig a tunnel, as the top is indestructible. They give up trying to capture Zhang Yi alive, and it's ordered that the sniper eliminates the target. The protagonist has always been watching everything through the window. The sniper fires and misses the target. Besides not hitting the right place, the window glass was the most resistant there is and didn't even scratch. Zhang Yi was disappointed with the power of the threatening mutants from the military base of the West Mountain. This reaction of his was noticed by the soldiers. The man shouts that it's not fair. How can that person have more incredible things than the government itself? The captain now accepts that unfortunately, it's impossible for them to succeed here. He orders everyone to retreat to the base immediately. Zhang Yi, upon realizing they are retreating, opens fire on them as well. The soldiers notice and fire in his direction, now that the enemy was exposed. This wasn't a mistake on Zhang Yi's part. He absorbed the projectiles into his alternate dimension and reflected the same projectiles back at them. The captain orders that they keep shooting, as it's a perfect opportunity. Everyone shoots at the same time. He absorbs all the projectiles with his left hand and shoots with the other. He was like an impossible to hit target and was quickly eliminating all the soldiers. Even with the target exposed, the captain orders everyone to forget the attack and just flee. That demon is a mutant and his powers are too mysterious. The mutants use their movement powers like the other soldier, but one of them is hit in the leg and can't continue fleeing with the others. The rest hide behind a pile of snow and order the wounded not to move. He throws a smoke grenade, which will prevent the demon from hitting them. Zhang Yi had previously absorbed a quantity of snow from an avalanche and now throws it onto the soldiers hidden in the smoke. Almost all of them are now dead. A few hours later, in the underground base, the leader received the report from the troops sent as reinforcements. They encountered a formidable enemy, and almost all the soldiers were killed. The leader, who previously disregarded the information about Zhang Yi, now has every reason to give it importance. His secretary informs him that the place where he now resides is a super protected shelter that belonged to a millionaire named Wang Simon and was built 10 years ago. The leader, considering himself a Sherlock Holmes, deduces various things about Zhang Yi, who was once just a stock supervisor in a market, but now lives alone in an impenetrable base with more resources and luxuries than they have here in the military base in the mountains. When the first two soldiers fled and radioed that they had valuable news, he pursued the two stealth specialist soldiers and managed to eliminate them. This means he has a very big secret that cannot be discovered. The base leader now believes that all the resources from Walmart are in the boy's possession, so he is a source of nearly infinite food, and surely the boy's powers are related to being able to stockpile things with him. It's possible he has many more resources than the vanished warehouse. Now the man decides it's worth focusing all military forces on capturing these resources. The secretary warns that the base's internal resources are dwindling, and the resources from that boy could provide all the base residents with an abundant life for over 10 years. As a result, hundreds of soldiers were sent from the base, and they all arrived at Chun's village. The otaku called Zhang Yi to alert him about what was happening. Before the otaku could speak, the protagonist stated that an army must have arrived in his village with the aim of attacking the shelter on the other side of the frozen lake. Upon receiving confirmation, Zhang Yi advises Chun to be cautious now. They will likely pass through the village and probably take all the food from the place to reinforce their soldiers and workforce. If Chun feels endangered, he should flee immediately to the protagonist's mansion. However, in addition to this warning, Zhang Yi sincerely tells Chun that if the military discovers Chun's powers, they will highly value him, and he could have a luxurious life working for them. This would make them enemies, but even so, Chun should think about what's best for him and not worry about Zhang Yi. After this speech, the otaku responds embarrassedly that he won't do that. He is a loyal follower of Zhang Yi and admires him greatly. Meanwhile, in the village, the villain's leader receives the allied soldiers, but he ordered Chun to stay hidden the whole time the soldiers are in the village. Chun, the chubby one, did not obey this order and went to speak to the leader, stating that hiding his identity is a mistake. They will eventually find out, and that will be a problem. Revealing it by the leader would be better. Therefore, the leader presents him as a mutant who exists in the village. The captain asks what the boy's abilities are, and he demonstrates his ability to control snow in various ways. With this kind of power, the captain tells the boy that he has a bright future in the organization. He takes Chun to talk about the benefits of working for the government's military base. Later, Zhang Yi received a call from Chun to report on the plans and powers of the soldiers he had just discovered. The protagonist thanks Chun for his loyalty and asks again if he doesn't truly want to join the military base. With the otaku's response, he is certain that Chun really is on his side, and the 
the information is reliable. Chun says his instincts tell him to trust everything to Zhang Yi. After learning the soldiers' plans, he holds a meeting with the girls in his harem. He tells them that the enemy army is about to attack, and when they do, they will hide underground for safety. The true impenetrable part of the base is underground, but they shouldn't worry. They won't be able to defeat him even if they were ten times more powerful than they are now. Afterward, he checks with Xin Xin how the house's cybersecurity is doing. She confirms that they have tried to invade countless times, but she prevented it from happening. She confirms that with her here, it's impossible for them to invade the security systems of this place. He thanks her and says he's happy to have such incredible people he can trust by his side. His next step was to visit Karen at her workplace. He greets the girl and asks her, if an external enemy were to try to invade their bunker, how would they do it? She thinks about it and says the most obvious way would be to blow up the base. They would have to use explosives in the same way they do to demolish buildings. However, she explains that to blow up this location, it would require a ton of C4. So unless they have an absurd amount of explosives, they won't have problems. Now, regarding the request he made earlier, Karen prepared the explosives he asked for earlier to make. She also adapted a bulletproof vest to mimic the high-ranking soldier's uniform from the mountain base he requested. Karen is curious about what plans he has for asking for these things. Zhang Yi says she will understand when the time comes. Meanwhile, at the village base, Chun even more mutant soldiers who will assist in the invasion of the protagonist's base. The main forces of the base are here, and they also introduce a newer mutant who will join the high-level military forces. Professor Liang is also part of the special forces here and recognizes the otaku. He is one of the people who were with the man who rescued her student Shinshin from college and stole her sword. Even though she doesn't like these people for abandoning their students, she keeps it to herself. The other soldiers ask what Chun's power is, and he says he can control ice. He made all the ice houses himself. The captain prepares the soldiers for the attack with full force. On the security cameras, the protagonist realizes that gas grenades were used around the entire mansion, so he puts on his combat uniform and tells everyone to go to the underground as he ordered before. He watches anxiously through the window to destroy everyone who's here. The soldiers crawl closer to the house and position explosives. The captain is eager, and a large explosion occurs, and all the traps in front must have been rendered useless. Now they can approach the house and start positioning tons of C4 to bring down the front walls of the place. While they stack the explosives, the protagonist was lurking, and they had thought of a plan. Before the explosives were triggered. The captain says he expected more from Zhang Yi. This time, he didn't even try to retaliate and was caught off guard. He couldn't even react to this perfect attack. He activated the detonator E, and somehow, they could see the impact of the explosion. When they activated the trigger, nothing happened. They were puzzled as they couldn't see the explosives through binoculars, only a small destruction on the ground where the explosives were stacked. Meanwhile, inside the luxury mansion, the protagonist returned to see the girls and explained that everything is fine. The underground base is the strongest part, and they are safe here. What he did was absorb the impact of the explosion into his storage, and now they have no more explosives to pose any danger for the time being. He calmed his girls down, and for some time, the situation is under his control, so now they can relax. Then he receives a message from Otaku Chun. He heard the sound of explosions and wants to know if he's okay. Zhang Yi replies that he is, and wants to know what the soldiers are doing now. They returned to the base and gave the order to send more supplies and explosives for a new attempt to invade Zhang Yi mansion. The protagonist warns Chun to always stay alert to what's happening around him. Sitting with his two beauties, Zhang Yi is sure that Chun's village will come into conflict with the soldiers due to their shortcomings. Meanwhile, in the village, one of the soldiers informed the leader that they needed food for 65 people right away. Chun begins to realize that so many people here for a longer time will consume all the village's food stocks. The leader agrees with this but asks how long it would take to destroy Zhang Yi's base. They've been there once and returned unsuccessfully. This question angers the soldier, so he doesn't answer, just says it's confidential. The old man apologizes for interfering and then orders Chun to build ice houses for all the soldiers who will stay overnight in the village. The next day, the new explosives arrived for them. A mutant with the power of Shingeki no Kyojin and the captain used their strength to hurl the explosives to fall onto Zhang Yi's base. The protagonist saw the explosive is flying, then activated his ability to release the explosion from the previous attack to reflect the crate of explosives. The impact threw back the giant square of C4 onto the soldiers. They threw themselves on the ground trying to protect themselves, and then the boom of the overwhelming explosion. Dozens of soldiers
soldiers were reduced to ashes. The protagonist was satisfied with the result. Meanwhile, the captain wonders how this was possible. Could that person's power do something like this? As he lamented, a shot almost hit the captain's heed. Luckily he dodged two shots in a row. Zhang Yi said, but he wasn't the least bit sad about it. As he gave more orders, another soldier was hit right in the middle of the forehead. Luckily his mutant power was great resistance in his body. Not even projectiles could penetrate his skull. Zhang Yi noticed the movement of other soldiers, and from two different positions, shots came in his direction. With his storage ability, he absorbed both bullets and said that this was too easy. He then repelled the bullets in the exact direction of the two shooters, and both were sent to eternal sleep with Jesus. Everything was going very well, then a very strong vibration almost knocked him out of the window. The captain, with so much hatred, decided to attack the structure of the house himself. Facing his enemy in the eyes, he knew he didn't have the strength to destroy these walls, so this battle with Zhang Yi would be postponed once again. But he promises to destroy this base even if it costs him his own life. Zhang Yi recognizes that he has incredible strength and speed. He must be a formidable enemy, but only if he can get in. Once again, the soldiers return to the village defeated. Now even more irritated, the soldier orders them to shut up and stop complaining. They need even more food to regain their strength for the next battle. This time, the captain says it needs to be the best food they have stored. The villagers are no longer in favor of supporting the military. Further ahead, the tallest soldier suggests that they should teach these inferior and petty people a lesson. However, the captain replies that he also feels like it, but until Zhang Yi is defeated, they are free labor and food suppliers for them. Furthermore, when everything is over, they will be used at the mountain base to produce energy by pedaling bicycles. Zhou Kier checks to see if his man was injured. Once again, he was victorious and had no injuries. Yang Mi brings his meal, and as he eats, the protagonist asks Karen about the damage to the structure and if she can fix it. She informs him and says that it's all a matter of having the materials. Moreover, she has to go outside to fix it, and at this moment, it's not safe. Just knowing that it's possible is enough. There's no rush for it. He drinks his beverage, and the other girls also want some. They all toast to celebrate another victory. Later, at dinner time, Xinxin informs the protagonist that Professor Liang contacted him. She hands him her phone, and the woman says by message that she intends to negotiate. Before calling the professor, the protagonist asks Xin Xin if this woman is trustworthy. She confirms that she always keeps her word. Liang insists on speaking on the phone. She reveals that she's infiltrated the military forces of the Western Mountain Base and can exchange favors with Zhang Yi. The professor says that her students at the base are in danger, so she has no choice but to cooperate. She can be useful to him inside, and all she wants in return is the safety of her students. He responds that when he has something to ask in return, he will get in touch. The protagonist hangs up the phone and tells the girls about the situation of the people in that base on the Western Mountain. Karen, upon learning the fate of her college colleagues, feels sad. Even though she wasn't friends with anyone, she also didn't wish harm upon them. Zhang Yi questions if Xin Xin's plan to create a Trojan horse is possible. The girl on four wheels says that Professor Liang could infiltrate the base and insert a flash drive so she could access the base's internal systems. Zhang Yi calls back and says that his request is for her to take a flash drive and put it into a computer at the base afterwards. She agrees and will trust his word, because risking her life to save one of his students who was important to him shows he is a man of value. Later, the captain informs all the villagers that the military is still at the base to save them from the demon that could return to destroy their people. The village should unite and cooperate to destroy the demon that lives on the other side of the lake. The captain goes to the meeting room and warns that the time until the villagers revolt is short, and some villagers would surely die seeking revenge for the death of their loved ones. This obviously sparked Liang's indignation being in favor of goodness, and she told him she couldn't bring herself to sacrifice innocent people just to achieve their desires. In response, Feng stated that if she had any other solution to avoid confrontation with the villagers, he was willing to listen. A second leader tried to calm her and explain that she should help them obtain resources from Zhang Yi so that their students could live safely. Hearing this, Professor Liang lost hope and then began pretending to be on their side, as the lives of her students were more important than those of the villagers. She agreed with Feng, as long as he he tried to avoid the death of the villagers due to overwork. Feng instructed the villagers to prepare to dig tunnels, urging them to unite to rid themselves of the demon, Zhang Yi, once and for all. However, the villagers began to oppose, fearing dialogue, even when the old village leader tried to intervene and convince them that Zhang Yi's death would bring them peace. They all refused to participate in the excavation at first because Zhang Yi had never attacked them since they made a peace agreement with him. This left Liang worried, and she called Zhang Yi to inform him about the situation. She wanted to know what his next move would be. Zhang Yi said he would let them dig 
Greg as they pleased. He had the situation under control. The teacher then asked for his home address. She needed to know, wouldn't he come to fetch her later? Zhang Yi simply said that things would happen in due time. The next morning, they attacked Zhang Yi's bunker from all sides, while he watched without concern, as if he were in a movie. However, Yang Mi had a question that intrigued her. How could Zhang Yi not care that they were digging into his base? He asked Xin Xin to explain, they have equipment that will detect the proximity of anything underground. Letting them expend energy on this is part of the strategy now. Many of them began to die from cold and exhaustion. Those who attempted to rebel would be punished, and definitively so, as he would not allow anyone to go back on their agreement. A few days later, Liang became tense and called Zhang Yi, informing him that people were dying. He replied that he would start executing his plan soon, but had some questions for her. The first was why the number of mutant attacks was decreasing every day. Liang explained that only the leaders were attacking now, while the others were in the village to prevent any rebellion from the dying villagers. Then Zhang Yi said he understood and agreed with her, preparing to act. He left through a secret passage, and with his snowmobile drove to Chun's base in his high-ranking military uniform. As soon as the soldier saw it was a superior, he showed respect. At that moment, his life was taken mercilessly. With this first one eliminated, other soldiers inside the village smelled blood and the reaction of the dogs. They went after the culprit, who was wearing the uniform of a superior. They engaged in combat and were completely eliminated by the mutant with dimensional powers and an incredibly sharp sword. When the high-ranking mutants who were away from the village noticed the alert signal, they returned as quickly as possible to the base. Zhang Yi, after eliminating hundreds of soldiers in the village, went to Chun and took him to his mansion with the snowmobile. When they returned to the village, they found the bodies of their comrades strewn around. The captain concluded that there must be a traitor for him to know they were out, and that among them, and that this person must have informed Zhang Yi about the tunnel as well. He left the village after promising himself that he would find them, no matter the cost. Meanwhile, the elderly man was distressed because he didn't know what to say to the villagers whose loved ones had died without receiving any reward. Zhang Zhang Yi, on the other hand, was showing Chun her new room. He immediately embraced his new girlfriend. After leaving the room, he went to the control room where Liang and Xin Xin were. The teacher had also been brought to the base and had become a traitor to the military base. Xin Xin began to explain how she used the information she obtained from Liang to invade the base's systems. She cut off communication from Zishan's military base with Captain Feng's team. This left our MC pleased with his super hacker Loli. He then went to Liang and promised that he would save his students once he eliminated the threat from the leaders. However, his conversation was interrupted by the arrival of troops at the emergency exit. He said he was waiting for them and that it was time for war. Within seconds, he escaped from prison and appeared before them. One of the leaders pointed out that the target was alone and exposed right there. With great anger, one of them advanced to kill Zhang Yi. Even though his colleague tried to warn him about his recklessness, he was determined to kill Zhang Yi. As he approached close enough and thought he would succeed, Zhang Yi pressed a button on the ground, which was connected to a bomb that exploded and dumped tons of snow on him. On the other side, they spotted the traitor Liang, while Feng urged her to pay the price for her betrayal. But Liang explained that she had never been one of them and began her fight with the captain, one of the leaders, even using an ice wall to defend herself was torn to pieces by the kitty flower. When this happened, Feng lost concentration upon seeing his dead companion, but quickly regained focus with Liang's next attack. Moreover, due to the explosions caused by Zhang Yi everywhere and the powerful and resilient mutants being destroyed, the protagonist with his rifle was relentless. His soldiers were all grouped between Zhang Yi and Chun, who was behind them all used their powers and unleashed an avalanche of snow on them all. Teacher Liang hurried to flee with the kitty. She grabbed the otaku on the way, and the captain couldn't do anything to stop the traitors from escaping. They were all just cornered by the snow powers of the chubby one, and now they were facing their great enemy, Zhang Yi. He said he would teach them how to use their own weapons. The fools fell for such a simple trick. The protagonist retrieves from his dimensional warehouse and shoots one of the loads of explosives towards them. This made almost all of them die. Few of them who did not lose their lives under the snow could barely recover and saw a giant avalanche over them. Everyone was now covered by meters of snow that they could not get out of. Now everyone was buried in this icy place. The protagonist calls Xin Xin to warn that the calculations she made were perfect. Their position and the avalanche were exact. Now everyone can return home victorious. The teacher suggests they should look for the captain and make sure he was dead. But Zhang Yi confirms that he will slowly turn into ice cream under that snow and die for sure. After that, they returned home. The MC joined his wives to enjoy some good wine. Zhang Yi, while enjoying the moment, told Joe Kier that she should be grateful for being one of the few people in the world to survive so 
so well. From this moment on, our heroes began to live happily ever after, and thus we have reached the end of the first season of this story of the evil Ice King. Whoever leaves a like, legends say, and will have their waifus guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, boy. Of all the elite soldiers who died in the attack against Zhang Yi, one survived, Captain Feng. He was the only one to return to the base, and their leader was furious at the loss of nearly half of their elite men. Their team consisted of 50 people with exceptional abilities, and their deaths greatly weakened the base and its ability to defend itself in the future. Feng's conscience began to trouble him when he realized that those who had died were considered his brothers, and for this reason, he knelt and apologized to the leader for his leadership failure. He was even willing to die as punishment for his failure to lead his team. However, he also expressed his desire for a second chance to prove his worth and to Avinga Zhang Yi, who had cruelly killed his followers and colleagues. Meanwhile, the leader considered whether she should kill Feng and use him as an example to others, but she knew she couldn't afford to lose her most powerful mutant. She decided to punish him by imprisoning him for an entire week to reflect on his mistakes. As Feng departed, the leader began to consider how to handle the situation and decided they needed to stop trying to attack Zhang Yi immediately and focus on replenishing the forces they lost in the previous attack. She was aware that there were other bases with similar strength to theirs, and she feared they might attack upon discovering that their army was weakened. Therefore, she summoned her secretary and inquired about the condition of the people they had brought from the village. She replied that they were still undergoing medical examinations, but so far, they were physically well and had a good chance of developing abilities. She ordered to start the experiments immediately, even if they failed to awaken abilities. They should inject Feng's cells into them, as he was their most powerful mutant. She warned that more than 90% of them would likely die if they did so, but he replied that he didn't care about the peasants' lives and was only interested in replacing the soldiers who had died. He knew he needed to bolster his forces to conquer and rule the entire city of Tianhai, but without soldiers and significant strength, it would be impossible. He realized he needed to postpone the matter of the missiles for now and try to negotiate with Zhang Yi to join Zishan's base. So, Leader Chen instructed one of her followers to prepare all the information to contact Zhang Yi. They provided him with a laptop and headphones, and before making the call, Chen decided that if Zhang Yi refused to cooperate, they would use the missiles. Zhang Yi greeted him, saying that Professor Liang had spoken highly of him and that he was impressed by his leadership ability at Shishan's base. Chen felt he was being mocked by his manner of speaking and became irritated, stating that what he was doing was not in his interest. Zhang Yi replied that he knew very well that he was just a weak man since he couldn't face him after more than 50 of his men failed to do so in the past few days. So Zhang Yi continued to taunt him and asked how he would kill him after more than 50 of his men failed to do so. It was then that he became furious. Chen explained that he would not send anyone else to his bunker but missiles with enough force to destroy the entire bunker. Surprised, Zhang Yi replied that he knew he was lying since there was no base to launch missiles in the city of Tianhai. Chen said he knew people in the neighboring city who had a military base with missiles and who were responsible for bombing their base. Although Zhang Yi was beginning to be convinced by his words, saying he didn't want to attack him with the rockets because he admired his talent and wanted to recruit him, Zhang Yi couldn't believe him on this rocket matter and therefore said he wanted proof that he had rockets, throw some nearby for him to see. The leader called him stupid, missiles aren't wasted to prove to someone that they have them. Zhang Yi began to realize by the way he spoke that he wasn't lying to him, but Zhang Yi couldn't believe his words. Our protagonist asked for a few days to think and respond. Chen agreed to give him only one day. Upon ending the call, the leader begins to pray that Zhang Yi accepts his threat and he doesn't have to waste such a precious resource. Our scoundrel protagonist wondered if he should just escape from this shelter for now. Xin Xin doubted whether the leader of the Xinxian base really had these missiles in his hands to use, as he sent so many soldiers and didn't use these missiles before. Zhang Yi said there really is a military base in the neighboring city that has these weapons. If they take that risk and get bombed, it's the end of everything. Zhou Kier then asks if they couldn't go back to where they lived before. Zhang Yi says, yes, that will be the first thing they do to protect themselves. The security of his harem is the most important thing. Chun was the saddest as she had just arrived in this warm paradise. Professor Liang reminds him that he promised to save her children. He can't forget that. Zhang Yi stares at his computer lowly and then grabs a small chip from her and hands it to Liang, telling her that the rescue of her students depends on her success. As soon as she inserts this into a computer in the central area, everything will be possible. Liang left the base without being seen by anyone, still with access keys to important parts of the base, as she was the leader there. And as she walked, she encountered two of the staff. So she stopped to listen to them, while the staff talked about her and how they didn't expect Liang to leave, while leaving her students alone. This was a betrayal, so Leader Chen decided to experiment on all her students and many of the villagers. When these 
scientists left and got into an argument, Liang finally began to speak with Zhang Yi to say that they needed to get her students out of here as quickly as possible. He then said again, she must put the chip into a computer in the central area, and then he will be able to get all the students to escape. If she succeeds, he will honor his promise to provide shelter and food for her students for a while. Of course, Liang was tense at that moment, as she knew that the computer room was one of the most closely watched, but she also knew she needed to do it if she wanted to save her students and destroy the entire base forever. She finished speaking with him and set off to fulfill the mission. Zhang Yi was in the car with his girls, heading to Building 25. He told Xin Xin that if Liang succeeds, they will devise a plan to attack the mountain military base. The lowly girl also reminded him that the information they could steal from them would be very valuable for the future. Zhang Yi says that unknown forces are indeed more worrying when they find out more about them, at least they will know how to confront them. Their optimistic conversation was interrupted by Karen. She was worried about Professor Liang and afraid they would capture her and beat her to death. As she expressed her concern for her teacher, Zhang Yi smiled and thought to himself that she was just being naive. To him, it didn't matter if she lived or died anyway. But of course, he was a hypocrite and told Karen that good people always have good luck. Karen was convinced by this and said that Liang really is a kind person and will be lucky. But in reality, our scoundrel was laughing inwardly. He didn't believe any of it. After a while, they arrived in the Yuanluo area, where Uncle Yu was waiting for them with his new wife and was willing to help them. Meanwhile, Chun was sad and crying because she left her inflatable wife behind. Zhang Yi looked around and realized there was no sound in the area, so he was confident that all the neighbors had died, but his thoughts were interrupted by his uncle's lewd voice, who was glad that Zhang Yi and his friends were still okay. When our lover's gang returned to where it all began, many memories came fluting back. Zhu Haimei told everyone to make themselves comfortable. There were many people and not so many rooms, but they wouldn't have trouble squeezing in a bit. Yang Mi was excited to have more company and said they could all play board games together. Zhang Yi went to the living room to talk to his uncle and ask how the neighborhood was, if anyone was still alive or if everyone had already died and if anyone tried to attack them and steal their resources from the neighbors, as they used to do. Uncle Yu replied that at first, they came begging for food. After they got nothing, they tried to be aggressive, so this old man taught them a lesson. However, despite all this, there is still a group of people alive so far. So Zhang Yi was surprised and looked out the window, although he knew he wouldn't see anything, which made Yu continue his conversation and clarify that the people who survived so far were the residents of building number 18. Zhang Yi was surprised by his words and asked him if he knew more details about them or about the number of people who were still alive in this building. Uncle Yu replied that he didn't have knowledge of these things because he didn't communicate with them, although sometimes he saw them coming out and moving around the streets. Zhang Yi became excited and wanted to know how they were still alive like this and decided to visit them as soon as possible. But first he explained everything about the missile threat from the leader of the Sishan mountain base. The poor guy just wanted to live a simple life with plenty of luxury and food. Why couldn't he? And when he finished speaking, he told him that he didn't believe Xinan really had rockets. Hong Sile Yu sadly replied that Hoover has many things, also attracts much attention because of it. Even he himself, who has much less than Zhang Yi, is constantly attacked by people wanting his resources. Our protagonist says he will stay out of his main base for a while until he has the strength to annihilate his new enemy. After this conversation, Uncle Yu continued to inform him that a strange group had appeared in their neighborhood recently and had not yet tried to attack them. This group calls themselves Servants of the Snow. While the girls play with Shin Shin, the uncle talks about how at the time he underestimated these people, thought they were just crazy religious fanatics, but at the time, they offered the possibility of increasing and training the uncle's powers. He was suspicious of them and refused. But this group went to another person in the neighborhood as well. As they talked, Zhang Yi looked out the window and noticed strange movements in this building. And to understand what was happening, he had to go see everything personally. And when he asked him if he needed help or something, Zhang Yi replied that it was not necessary. These people were all much weaker than him. The protagonist warned his girls that he was going to visit an old friend and they don't need to worry. He went to building 18 and without worrying about anything, he just shot up and drew Lin Jian's attention. Attention. The man seeing this demon again became terrified. This monster had returned. He went to his wife and son not knowing what to do. His son, upon learning that Persone had returned, asked why they had to fight against this man. His furious wife said they should join together now and fight against him. Lin Jian, unlike them, calmed down and replied that even if all the residents of the neighborhood joined forces, they still wouldn't stand a chance. He told his wife to hide and protect their last hope. When Zhang Yi saw him, he told him that he missed him for a long time. The residents of the building came out to see what was happening through the windows, which surprised Zhang Yi because he didn't know that all these people were still alive. He immediately approached Lin Jian and asked him how he had done it. Lin Jian replied that the credit was his and of 
the seeds that the protagonist left behind before. Surprised, Zhang Yi asked if he was serious or joking with him because he thought it was impossible for these seeds to grow and be ready for harvest in less than a month, and it was impossible for them to grow from the beginning in this atmosphere. Zhang Yi activated his abilities and said that he felt another mutant nearby, but it seems that the reason Lin Jian was tense was another, so he apologized to Zhang Yi and kill him if he wanted to punish them for their failure. The residents started coming out of the building in large numbers, and seeing their leader in this position, they began to shout that he couldn't kill him. They wouldn't let the great leader who saved them all this time die in front of them. Some people stepped forward and said that if lives needed to be taken, he could take others, but their leader should stay alive. This left Zhang Yi very surprised at this loyalty to this person he judged weak in the past. Their looks were sincere, and they were willing to give their lives. He then calmed the situation and asked why they think he wants them dead. They told him that the baby he left in their care did not survive, knowing that the reason for all this fear was Ji LeMay's child that he wanted to get rid of. The reason they were afraid is that they believe the baby was important to him. Zhang Yi then explained to everyone that a baby surviving in such a terrible time as this would be a miracle. He knows very well that the death of the child was not due to their negligence. He is here to find out how they managed to survive. He wants to see these seeds with his own eyes. Lin Jian told him to enter the building with him to show him. As they were on their way, Lin Jian began to explain that they tried to plant the seeds he gave them several times, but failed completely and all the seeds died. However, everything changed after the group of people from the snow sect appeared and offered to help them. They made it clear that they should worship the snow god in return, so Lin Jian gained his power. Although it was painful at the time, he managed to survive and get his new power, which with his help, he can make the seeds grow inside his body. So he is called the plant man. The products his body produces contain much higher nutrients than normal products and also grow quickly in any environment. Zhang Yi was surprised and asked him what he used as fertilizer to plant this because only his body couldn't produce so much food. Lin Jian replied that the site might be a bit scary for him. Of course, Zhang Yi didn't care and entered the room immediately, finding a group of corpses growing plants on them, literally. Lin Jian explained to him that they used these bodies to fertilize the seeds, as there were many bodies in all the buildings around. Curious about this, Zhang Yi asked the number of rooms where they planted seeds in this way. There were three rooms so far, and they didn't need a larger amount at the moment. This idea of self-sufficiency is good and all, but if it continues like this, Zhang Yi warned that his body will not resist and will certainly die after a while. Lin Jian seemed to know this and accept this fact. Using his power made him feel a lot of pain, but he is willing to do anything to keep his wife and son alive here. Although Zhang Yi thought the idea of sacrificing himself was irrational, he was also impressed with his courage. So he asked if he could show his power now. Our selfish protagonist wanted to know if his power was considered natural, like his, or artificial, like those of the people from the military base. Also, he wanted to make sure if Lin Jian's power was specialized only in the growth of crops, or if it had any offensive use. Lin Jian was then willing to show his ability. By making a lot of effort, one of the seeds in his arm began to grow rapidly until it sprouted completely. Completely. Seeing this disgusting thing, Zhang Yi warned that it was enough. Just this effort took a lot of energy from poor Lin Jian. He went to the door and asked for help and grabbed another new plant. Thinking about what he saw, Zhang Yi was sure that this ability is very convenient to get food at this time. And if he had seen that this ability could be dangerous against him, our cruel protagonist would have killed Lin Jian right here and all his residents if necessary. After finding out everything he wanted, he left Lin Jian and his residents alone. The leader of Building 18, seeing the great villain leaving, thinks that this improvised proof worked, but their lives continue in Zhang Yi's hands. Our MC returned home, and now all that was left was to wait and see how things would unfold with the missiles before making any moves. He could only think of attacking if Liang managed to put a spy chip into the military base's computers. The new enslaved residents of the military base were being taken to their places of work. Many residents were outraged. A father cried as he said these people ate their food, took their homes, and killed his father and daughter. They are a hundred times worse than Zhang Yi. Those who complained about the injustice of reality were punished with eternal rest. Anyone who doesn't want to meet the same fate must obey. The soldiers sent themselves as sacrifices to help. Now they must repay that with their work. Guys, I feel sorry for these people. They tried to do this to Zhang Yi before, but now they're tasting the same medicine. What do you think about this? While all this was happening, Liang was observing from afar. She knew the villagers who died would turn into yogurt. But then she decided to focus on the mission and went up to the second floor, where she explained that there were five main sections, including the food and nutrition
promotion section. However, security on the second floor was not as strict, as Leader Chen was more interested in the fourth floor. So, invading the control room seemed easy at the moment. As she approached the room, she looked around to make sure it was safe, but she was surprised by someone putting their hand on her shoulder. She was tense, ready to attack, but before she could do anything, the person began yelling at her to wait, claiming they were not an enemy. She realized it was one of her students named Tian. The boy was also surprised and asked why she had come back after fleeing. She came back to save him and his classmates. She asked how he managed to join the soldiers, and Tian explained what happened. People are taken to undergo experiments, and he was the only successful experiment among them all. People are put between life and death by methods that make him cry, just remembering. Those who survive can serve the base and have a better life, but in return, their vitality is drained when they use their powers. Liang was surprised and asked what he wanted to do. Tian said he not only wanted to leave the base, but also to get revenge on the people who tortured them and destroyed their lives. She then consoles her student and says there is hope to save those who survived and to get revenge. After agreeing on a strategy, he went to talk to the other soldiers and relayed the order that they should go ensure the protection of the control room. Meanwhile, Liang prepared to install the chip into the computers. We return to our villain at home. On this day, the period that base leader Chen Xinyan had given him to respond if he would serve him ended. When they make the discord call, Zhang Yi replies that he will not ally with him and is not afraid. Upon hearing this, Chen Xinyan becomes furious and threatens to blow him up with his bunker and his family. Zhang Yi said he can do as he pleases and just wait for the consequences and then hangs up the call. He felt that the talk about the missiles was real from Chen Xinyan's actions, but even so, it was impossible to join her. The important thing was just to find another place to live. However, all these thoughts were interrupted by a message from Liang, in which she said she had done her part of the deal and installed the spy chip in the computer. Now, all that was left was for him to fulfill his part and help her get her students out of the Zhishan base. Zhang Yi rushed to Xinxin and quickly told her that Liang managed to install the chip. This got the four-wheel girl very excited. She grabbed her car and drove to her computer. In a matter of seconds, even though she was working on a regular computer, she had accessed all the data from the enemy military base. Xinxin said no one could stop her. He approached to see what she had, and at that moment, the girl got wet. Zhang Yi wanted to know about the missiles. Could he access information about them? The girl then, accessing the conversations between the leaders of the city bases, and they were talking about sending missiles at a common enemy of the military. This scared the two of them, so Chen Xinyan's threat was real. This made Zhang Yi sad. Losing such an incredible bunker is very bad. The four-wheel girl then says she has a bold plan and asks if he's up for some fun now. The plan was to send the coordinates of the Zhixian mountain base as the target for the missiles to hit instead of their own bunker. This impressed Zhang Yi, and he asked her if she was confident they wouldn't be able to detect the change. Xin Xin confidently explained how it would be done and that it was impossible for them to find out. The coordinates would be altered by her. Chen Xinyan's allies, thinking they were attacking the right place, wouldn't know anything. After the orders were sent, the four-wheel girl would cut communication between the two bases during the missile launch. Our villain protagonist asked Karen to examine the construction plans of the base to understand if it would be possible to destroy it. The girl said it couldn't be destroyed with a missile attack because the base structure was extremely strong and extended 100 meters below the ground. This meant that not even missiles would be able to destroy it. Even hearing this, Zhang Yi was not satisfied. Not even this could destroy his enemy's base. He ordered Xin Xin to proceed with the plan to launch the missiles over Chen Xinyan's base and also wanted to know all the defense systems and weapons that the Zhishan base possessed. After making these requests and her saying she would do everything, Zhang Yi left the room without saying anything else. Karen didn't understand his intentions. Xin Xin said he intends to personally attack the military base to eliminate them, but he is very cautious and not sure if he wants to risk so much for it. He went to think about it. Zhang Yi thinks that just because he has survived Leader Chen's attack so far, he is safe. Despite the many risks, this may be the only opportunity to invade this base and eliminate his enemy. The protagonist convinces himself that even if the initial missile attack doesn't destroy the base, it will cause great panic inside. If he uses the half-ton he stole from the soldiers themselves to blow up this base from the inside, maybe he can destroy it. He is very motivated by his anger. If he can at least destroy his enemies inside that base, it will be enough for our favorite villain. He returned to his room and asked Xin Xin to show him all the information he had asked for before. He wants to know about the defenses of the place and the abilities of the mutants there. Zhang Yi says that if there is at least a small opportunity, then they should try. But, in reality, he says they should assess their strengths first. If they are too different, then this idea is crap. The wheelchair girl smiles and says that's the Zhang Yi she knows. Our ingenious lowly girl gathered the information, and now he can see it. In the base, there are a total of 521 armed regular soldiers on site, along with six team leaders who are mutants, and about 50 soldiers who are mutants 
alliance as well. And of course, there was a leader among them, Feng, whom Zhang Yi had previously defeated and was ranked S. As for the rest, only one of them had a B ranking, while the others were all ranked A, or less than Feng, with only one ranking. This made Zhang Yi not worry too much, as he knew that the issue of rankings was not entirely accurate. The information the base had about ability holders and other military bases was limited, and certainly people's rankings would change drastically in the future. So Zhang Yi gathered all the information about the strongest mutants in the base and printed it, exactly as Karen suggested. Zhang Yi was sure that his allies could handle the powers of these people. Our villain ordered everyone to gather in the living room. With everyone there, he warned that he needed their help and wanted to know their opinions on the attack. After that, he turned to Uncle Yu and asked for his opinion, as he was the oldest and also had a military background. His uncle replied that after the losses their base suffered in their last attack on Zhang Yi, it would be impossible for them to agree to make a peace deal with him or leave him alone. Therefore, he thinks Zhang Yi was right and they needed to attack Zishan instead of sitting around and waiting for them to attack them. He would agree to fight with him to the end. He was determined to fight alongside his leader Zhang Yi to the end, without regrets. The protagonist asks what Chun thinks about this attack. The chubby guy wasn't confident they could face so many mutants and an armed army as well. Zhang Yi sat down and said that he didn't need to worry about that. They are outnumbered, but he will take care of all the common soldiers and weak mutants alone. Then he asks if Chun doubts that Zhang Yi is capable of eliminating all these enemies at once, and if Chun doesn't want to avenge the villagers from his village who were all taken to this base. The embarrassed otaku says he doesn't care about those people and doesn't really know them, so he didn't want to attack. This response, without confidence, made the protagonist doubt if he was the most cautious person here. It seems this chubby guy is more. However, Chun says he will help with everything he can. Yes, thanks to his brother, Zhang Yi, he has food and a warm home and several wives in his room. If it's for his brother, he will bet everything on his decision. Zhang Yi says that's great, and the three men join forces. The otaku asks what the operation plan is, so Zhang Yi brings out a board with all the main mutants they will have to face. Uncle Yu points out which one is the best opponent for him, and Zhang Yi asks Xin Xin to take them to see the map of the military base. When the three of them left, Zhang Yi took out his phone and began texting Liang, instructing her to hide in a safe place until noon the next day, as they would evacuate the area and would need her help from the inside if necessary. Liang replied agreeing to hide and offered her assistance in any way possible as long as he informed her. Zhang Yi explained to her that for now, he couldn't provide more details as the plan was not fully elaborated yet, but he would keep her updated as things progressed. A little later, Xin Xin had successfully changed the coordinates, informing Zhang Yi that the missiles were scheduled to hit Jishan base at noon. He thanked his girl for another good job and was anxious for the start of the war. Karen then arrived and informed Zhang Yi that although the missiles wouldn't destroy the base, they would cause a strong tremor strong enough to affect everyone inside it, similar to an earthquake of magnitude 8. Zhang Yi explained that when this happened, Xin Xin would cut off the base's electricity since all their defense systems depended on it, facilitating the invasion. Xin Xin added that the power outage would be temporary, as the base likely had manual means to restore it. He then says that this is not a problem, it will be enough time for Liang and her students to escape. As usual, Chun asked what exactly they would do to destroy the base after invading the site. Everyone else listened without saying anything. Chun then asked, if they kill the leader, won't someone else take his place? The only way to neutralize the threat is to eliminate everyone inside the Xinxian military base. He said this with the certainty that it was very exaggerated. However, his leader Zhang Yi's reaction made the chubby guy fear the worst. Upon realizing that everyone was surprised and didn't understand his strategy, Zhang Yi explained that he had a large amount of explosives stored, and after they had been stored for the last time, when Feng and his men tried to blow up his palace, they had been replenished. Finally, Karen began to explain the effects of the explosion of the thousand kilograms of explosives. They realized that once detonated, the explosions would not only damage the base's oxygen systems, but also make breathing difficult, potentially killing those who didn't die in the explosion. Chun questioned how they wouldn't be recognized before entering the base. Zhang Yi instructed everyone to memorize the locations where they should plant explosives and to flee as quickly as possible. With just the scientists' lab coats, they'll disguise themselves enough. Zhang Yi reiterated the importance of placing the explosives in the exact locations to achieve the desired effect of internal base destruction. Remember, they must be fast, as the explosion's effect will be from a thousand kilograms of explosives everywhere. Zhang Yi explains how they will go to the base and how they will invade the site. Everyone must play their roles as best as possible, but keep in mind that the mission's success is the second most important thing. Their lives are the first. Inside the mountain base, Professor Liang gathered her surviving students, who will escape from this place tomorrow. Everyone must obey her orders to succeed. They all agreed to help and thanked their teacher for 
remembering them still. The next day, our elite team was maximizing their mutant energies while discussing more details of the operation. Zhang Yi reviews how Chun and Uncle Yu placed their explosives and what they should do next. The protagonist, very attentive, also fed his fighting kitty. Zhang Yi has a special plan to deal with the six mutant leaders who are the strongest. During the night, they were ready to go on the mission. Uncle with his beautiful milk, Zhang Yi with his beautiful waifus, and Chun with his obesity. Zhou Kier wanted to go with the men for this dangerous mission, and he said no. The three men were driving towards the mountain base, and from now on, they must stay totally alert. When they got close, Zhang Yi handed them adrenaline shots to make them real fighting machines. He warned that the side effects would only be felt after they finished the mission and were back home with their wives. They could already feel the power of biological hacking working. Zhang Yi, upon seeing the base entrance, could hardly wait to spring a surprise on them. The teacher was gathering her students for the mission that will save their lives. One of the girls was unsure if they were going to escape now. The student who serves the greedy lady was also there and warned not to make noise and to obey all of the teacher's orders. Liang was lurking, even though she didn't know what the plan was. She knew she should wait for the plan to start now. Chen Xian in his office was about to fulfill his threat and order the launch of missiles into Zhang Yi's bunker. He said this is a great waste of resources, but unfortunately, it is necessary to preserve his authority. Feng went to his office. The leader anticipated and stated that if the matter is about Zhang Yi, the great leader has a plan to eliminate that demon. Feng doesn't know about the launches and was impressed that the leader has a solution for that person that not even the entire army managed to defeat. Feng didn't want to doubt his leader's words, but how could he have the power to defeat that demon? Chen Xian confidently explains that no mutant is invincible. In the end, humanity's greatest strength lies in the firearms they create. He shows the map with information on the location of Zhang Yi's mansion that they have tried to invade so many times without success. He is going to turn this place to ashes using a missile. Feng acknowledges that their leader is brilliant, only he could have contacts to be able to do this. For sure Zhang Yi will die, this time. The leader says they can watch together as Zhang Yi's refuge is destroyed, so the two await the great explosion that will bring the revenge they so desire. Feng, upon seeing how incredible Zhang Yi's mansion is, says it's a waste of resources. Chen agrees, yes, but it's necessary, there will never be peace, as long as someone like Zhang Yi exists out there. The only problem is that after the destruction of this enemy, Chen Xian doesn't know if the general who is supporting him now will have reasons to need him in the future. Exactly at midnight, Xin Xin was holding her legendary weapon in her hand, preparing to execute the plan, when the great general from the neighboring city pressed the button to launch the rocket, and the launch operation from the Zhishan base began. Of course, as the missile approached the base, the members of the surveillance and control department began to panic and said they needed to inform immediately and evacuate the base. However, it happened so quickly that there was no reaction. Within seconds, the once calm place turned into a sea of flames, and no one near the site could complain about the cold, snowy weather. Zhang Yi was extremely happy at that moment and informed the hacker Xin Xin that it had worked. Then, with just one keystroke, all energy systems of the base were deactivated, and all the soldiers were in a state of panic and fear, without any of them being able to understand what caused the interruption of their communication in that manner. The most frightened of all was Chen Xian, who fell to the ground in fear and didn't know how to act, but then he received a call from the security department informing him that the base had been hit by missiles. Upon hearing this, he was filled with rage, thinking he had been betrayed by his allied general from the neighboring base. After pondering the culprit, he refocused on restoring order to the base and regaining control of all systems. He quickly got up and told Fong to gather all the super soldiers and start the operation to protect and secure the base. He explained to him that the most important area to be protected was the fourth floor where the workers were, as they might take advantage of the confusion to try to escape the location. Then they saw the guards at the south entrance communicating with the base, asking about what happened and the cause of the earthquake. But Zhang Yi didn't give them a chance to continue their conversation and swiftly attacked them with his vehicle, immediately heading towards one of the base entrances. They were just ordinary soldiers and didn't have supernatural abilities, so they were eliminated. They easily took control of the base entrance, using their powers and weapons to defeat all the guards. Now everything depended on Liang being able to bring her students out so they could move on to the second part of the plan. The teacher inside the base now understood why she should wait until midnight to leave. What happened outside would have evaporated them all. She commanded her students, telling them it was time to run. They rushed in a group towards the main hall. The power in the area was cut off, so everything was dark. 
The guards could only hear people, but couldn't do anything. If they fired, they might hit their comrades. Realizing this situation, the teacher managed to lead her students past the guards. When all of hers had passed, they heard shots coming from the direction they came from. Those who didn't stay close to her group must have been targeted by the guards. Liang reprimanded them, telling them to keep running without looking back, or they would all die. She knew the path ahead was still long until they reached the nearest exit, and that they might still encounter some soldiers along the way. And indeed, before reaching the exit, they encountered two soldiers in front of them, who couldn't see clearly, but they recognized them as enemies. These soldiers lost their heads, and the scene reminded me a lot of that. They were taken out, and then she commanded her students ahead up the stairs, while they still couldn't believe they had finally escaped. But it seems nothing is so easy in this world, as they say, and they found themselves face to face with Chen Xinan's secretary, accompanied by a large group of armed soldiers. As always, she praised her leader, saying he was right about the attempted escape. They expected that the peasants who had recently arrived might rebel and try to escape, but they didn't expect Liang to return to the base after escaping just to save these miserable students. At this moment, Liang tried to calm the woman, suggesting they should talk and negotiate, but the woman wouldn't accept any betrayal against the Xinshan base. She made it clear that a traitor would always be a traitor and there should be no forgiveness, but before that could happen, they were surprised by a shot that pierced the brain of one of her soldiers. These helmets weren't worth a damn. Zhang Yi emerged to eliminate the soldiers, while the woman ordered the soldiers to focus on Zhang Yi and kill him quickly. As for Liang, she instructed the students to stay where they were because she needed to go help Zhang Yi. The teacher with League of Legends skills ran to the guards and began to increase her elimination points. The poor soldiers were caught off guard by Zhang Yi and his elite team on one side and the teacher on the other. It didn't take long for them all to be dealing with hell. Liang thanked for the support, and Zhang Yi said she deserved it. Although Zhang Yi told her it wasn't necessary to thank him, he knew very well that getting rid of these soldiers would be very difficult if Liang wasn't attacking them from behind and eliminating them. He ordered them to quickly retreat from this location. Her students were scared by this combat and didn't know what to do. As for Secretary Julie, she pretended to be hiding with her eyes closed so no one would see her, but when she heard Liang's voice, she tried to say it wasn't her fault and that she was just a secretary following orders. Tian was nearby and stopped the woman. She tried to plead and claimed innocence, but the boy grew angry just hearing those words. To him, it was an offense for her to call herself innocent. He performed a perfect surgery on her vocal cords, all of which was witnessed by his teacher. She was proud that her student was an excellent surgeon. Now Liang could thank Zhang Yi and ask for the second part of the agreement. Our kind protagonist said the guards at the entrance were already asleep. He took food and other things from his dimensional space to help them escape from this place. Zhang Yi warned that the teacher should stay and help attack the rest of the base. Her students could go alone. Of course, the students were afraid of being without the teacher's protection outside this place. Zhang Yi explained that all the soldiers outside had died. He also told the students that the leader of this place would surely send people to go after the fugitives. Liang became nervous at the thought, but Zhang Yi's reasoning was true. This was the perfect opportunity for them to eliminate the future threat from this evil place. Liang joined the elite team that would destroy the base internally. For a moment, she stopped following the group and thought about Zhang Yi's words. He wanted to completely destroy this base, which meant condemning all the other prisoners who were here as well. Although Liang knew there were still many innocent people in the base, she agreed because there was no other solution. She asked Tian to lead the students and protect them. She would find them later. The group managed to leave the base, and now they were free. Now that she had decided to help, Zhang Yi warned that time was short. He showed the strategic locations they needed to go to place the explosives. Our group ran with helmets and passed among the soldiers without being noticed. When they reached the first location, they began to install the devices. Liang wanted to know how they could destroy such a reinforced place. Zhang Yi took dozens of these devices from his dimensional space and said he never wasted even a grain of rice. They themselves provided the explosives that would destroy their base. After finishing at this location, as they were on their way and Zhang Yi left more and more devices, Liang tried to explain to Zhang Yi that they could content themselves with killing the leader, Chen Xinyan, instead of blowing up the place and killing innocent people. She tightly gripped her sword, as she didn't like the idea of condemning the innocent. Zhang Yi paused for a moment and categorically replied that this was impossible. If they eliminated the leader, someone else would take his place. The problem was the system of this base. She acknowledged that this was true. Zhang Yi said it was better to destroy the whole place. Their conversation was interrupted by soldiers who questioned who they were. Additionally, one of them noticed the animal with the soldier in front of him and remembered that pets were not allowed in this place. Zhang Yi didn't wait for the enemy's reaction and used his power. With a cold look, he shot and hit the opponent perfectly in the forehead. The other soldiers saw the scene and tried to retaliate with shots. Zhang Yi was very calm as he defended with his power and waited for the right moment to shoot again.
again. Liang noticed this and remembered that, when she first faced him, he was very nervous and not so calm and powerful. This change gave her chills. The soldiers who arrived at the scene for reinforcements recognized the enemy as Zhang Yi, the extremely powerful mutant, and ordered everyone to scatter. Zhang Yi warned that it was too late for them. Using his power, he returned the shots he had stored in his dimensional space. The projectiles hit the targets perfectly. The few who survived, hiding behind the other soldiers, thought they could stay hidden and survive. Zhang Yi threw explosive guavas and solved the cold problem for all the soldiers. Our group resumed running through the base to fulfill their objective. This extremely handsome man was alert, thinking they couldn't take too long. While running, he noticed the lights in the place had started working again. He then warned everyone to get out of here immediately. In Chen Xinyan's office, he received the news that the electrical system had been repaired and that Zhang Yi had invaded the base along with the traitor Liang. The man put on super resistant protective gear and intends to go to the battlefield. Feng and his soldiers are also furious, thirsting for revenge against Zhang Yi. One of his soldiers pointed out that there are explosives scattered everywhere. Feng shouted to bring in a bomb defusal expert right away, and the rest should follow him behind Zhang Yi. In one of the corridors, they were cornered from two sides of the corridor. Uncle Yu said he would provide cover for everyone. The man flexed his muscles like sea bomb and then charged through the soldiers like a bull. Uncle Yu was like a tank, and not even the shots could harm this monster. He told the other three to go to the next location to place the explosives while he held off the soldiers. He assured them he would be fine. His body was super strong, and his regeneration was amazing. When a group of more powerful soldiers decided to attack with a sword, Uncle Yu spread his arms and said no one would get past him. They all tried to attack at once and were defeated as if they were insects. The attack was so powerful that they even ended up decorating the walls. What the hell? <laughs> Seeing this result, Zhang Yi was pleased and asked if they thought artificial mutants could compare to a natural mutant like Uncle Yu. The man, upon seeing the result of his attacks, was surprised. He hadn't exerted that much force. He told Zhang Yi he wished to encounter a real mutant to test his strength. Our protagonist said it would be better if that didn't happen. He even said he preferred not to have to fight anyone for the rest of his life. The three of them were caught off guard by one of the mutants who were on the list of the six mutant leaders of the base, a man with a strange mustache was alone. Zhang Yi attacked with his ability, and this person proved why he was one of the most powerful. With his firepower, he was rivaling Zhang Yi. The flames were melting the walls of the place. If they couldn't move forward, they would be trapped until the other mutants arrived. With their leader's order, the chubby one used his attack stealthily. The ice stakes nearly hit the fire mustache man. The man decided to use a special fuel he made, with which he could produce ten times more fire. As he lit the flames, he challenged everyone to withstand his attack. A fire dragon headed towards our heroes. Chun used his ice power and easily defeated the fire dragon and wounded the mustache man. Quickly, the muscular uncle would destroy the enemy, but he was surprised by a fist so strong that it threw him many meters back. To Shang Yi's surprise, this mutant was Feng, the super strong mutant he thought he had left freezing under the avalanche. Feng, upon seeing the person who destroyed his pride, was motivated to get his revenge. Upon hearing his uncle's voice, Zhang Yi created a barrier to see if he was okay. The man who wanted a real fight to test his powers now had his arm destroyed by Feng's attack. The captain was calm again. He knew the only way out for his enemies was to get past him. Feng and the fire mustache here would surely be able to hold these people. On the other side of the corridor, the otaku Chun was worried about Uncle Yu and asked if he could continue. Zhang Yi retrieved something from his storage and applied it to his uncle. According to Zhang Yi, this would give him strength to suppress the pain and keep fighting. The little flower cat began to get agitated with the danger, but her owner reassured her that the girls didn't need to worry. Feng and his friends said he was cornered, and now there's no escape. They all paid the price. He questioned if Zhang Yi had hope of passing through all these people. On the opposite side, Chun was facing the soldiers, and his uncle was holding his wrist so he wouldn't fall to the ground. Although the situation was as bad as it could be, Zhang Yi was confident he could defeat them all. His confidence was shattered by one of the mutants who has the power to cause illusions and attacked our protagonist directly. This genjutsu with Rinnegan would deeply affect the mind of our hero, but it was the girl who suffered the effects of his illusions. Something terrible made her fall, and those nearby by felt part of the effect of it. Zhang Yi said that brain waves and genjutsu are also deflectable by his ability. Flower began her transformation, and all the heroes held on to this ball of fur. They all passed through the soldiers, under the effect of hypnosis. Zhang Yi left a trail of grenades, and then when Feng managed to move, he was engulfed in flames. Chun, who was closer, could feel his butt burning too. Zhang Yi warned that as soon as they left, he would activate the explosives. It was almost time for this whole place to be destroyed. The soldiers knocked down a wall of the base to be able to to 
exit, and then they entered another part of the base. One of their mutants has an ability similar to Flowers, and could increase his size monstrously. Now, he was like a titan. He carried the soldiers behind Zhang Yi, and they were close to them again. Chun shouted for Zhang Yi to throw more grenades at them, but our hero said he wasn't that despicable of a person to do that dirty move. This response didn't make sense to his team. His uncle thought that his nephew always does whatever it takes to win. If he doesn't want to use his powers here, he must have his reasons. They jumped out of the base, and right behind them, the soldiers reached the base door. Now that they were outside, Feng was sure that this place was better to defeat Zhang Yi. His power could only defend in one direction, and now they could attack the protagonist from all sides. This worried Chun. The chubby one didn't know what they would do now. Zhang Yi, on the other hand, was calm in this situation. Feng noticed this, but he was certain that the advantage was theirs now. The captain challenged them to withstand their attacks now. Unlike before, he didn't have an impregnable fortress to hide in. Zhang Yi scoffed at the situation and said they soon wouldn't have a fortress either. He took out a button from his pocket and pressed it while looking at the soldiers. A loud noise and tremors soon made the entire region shake as if it were a real earthquake. The exits of the Sishan base exploded behind them. The reaction from the incredible explosion engulfed the soldiers in the impact. Chun even celebrated his team's victory. Shortly after the explosion, the enemies emerged from under the snow, and Feng began yelling at Zhang Yi, saying only a demon would do such a thing. Zhang Yi asked if they remembered the explosives they had used in the past, the same ones they had tried to blow up his bunker with. This took the gleam out of Feng's eyes, as the explosives that destroyed his base were taken from him by Zhang Yi. Zhang Yi made it clear that it was thanks to them that this happened. Upon seeing the destruction behind him, Feng began to feel guilty. They had wanted to do the same to Zhang Yi. Though this was true, Feng vowed that Zhang Yi would pay for it. Our protagonist asked him to stop and told Feng that the battle between them would result in many deaths among their followers. Furthermore, Zhang Yi found it inappropriate to speak of revenge, as the Zishan base was the first to attack his home. With so many witnesses, the man could not deny that this was true, so Feng admitted he was a bandit. But now there were only two paths. Either Zhang Yi stays alive, or Feng does. Zhang Yi then smiled and asked if he only wanted to kill him, and no one else. The furious man replied that was exactly it. Our protagonist then approached and said they should settle it with a fight between the leaders who hated each other and not involve their companions. At this moment, Liang, terrified, told him that Feng was stronger than her, even if he said otherwise. However, Zhang Yi insisted that this was the best thing for both sides. Without him dying, his comrades could escape with their lives, and if he won, he would preserve the safety of his few reliable allies. Upon hearing these words, Feng didn't disagree with anything, so our protagonist openly challenged him to a duel between them. Chun and Uncle Yu, hearing this, were speechless and remembered the moment they were coming for this mission. He told his followers that the battle ahead would be almost impossible for them, and that's why he plans to fight Feng, one on one. Zhang Yi also said that they don't fully know his abilities and think he's a coward who only hides behind his defenses. In the present, we see Zhang Yi boldly advancing towards Feng. On the other side, Feng's followers tried to say he was plotting something and they should all fight against him. Confident that he is stronger than Zhang Yi, however, Liang beside him could exchange blows with him. That chubby one has great destructive power and also the fierce mutant animal. He knows he must be at a disadvantage against Zhang Yi, so Feng points and says they should accept a duel only between them. Our protagonist affirms that his gang agrees. They will not intervene and must watch over each other. The men approach for the combat, and then the others move away from the scene, as it would be too dangerous. Chun wondered if brother Zhang Yi was confident he could defeat that monster, so Feng's followers began to talk to Zhang Yi's followers and said they would reveal a secret of their leader, since Zhang Yi was about to die. Then they asked if they had ever heard of mutants, where a mutant becomes stronger by eating another mutant. The girl says they seem not to know, and explains that some mutants can absorb the abilities of other carriers, and that the more they absorb, the faster their own strength increases. Their captain Feng, during his battles against rival military bases, killed three carriers of incredible ability and absorbed their strengths, making him invincible. This person called Zhang Yi is going to die, and won't even know what happened. Chun was irritated by this, and said that their leader would not die. The main reason being, that he is afraid of death. He wouldn't risk his life, if he didn't think he could win. The girl looked confused, wondering if this was a good enough reason. Meanwhile, Zhang Yi was talking to Feng. He said he was sorry, and that his powers were for support, not for fighting, so couldn't they just not fight? This angered the captain, who shouted that he couldn't change his mind now. Zhang Yi said, he only wanted a peaceful life in a post-apocalyptic world, which could be our protagonist's plan. Who would have thought Feng would be so irritated by Zhang Yi's stance? Our protagonist then asked Feng to promise to let his comrades live afterwards.
word, the captain was so furious that he decided to ignore Zhang Yi's conversation and suddenly decided to attack. Not staying still, our hero also advanced and used his abilities, and then the captain dodged. He knew Zhang Yi couldn't change the direction of the attacks. Then a cargo truck nearly crushed the captain. Zhang Yi said this was just the beginning, and dozens of cars and machines that he got in Chapter 55. I challenge you to check if I'm not mistaken. Zhang Yi didn't think the utility of these things would be for a battle. Feng wanted to avoid using this and then cut a truck in half. Zhang Yi continued firing various objects, and then the super powerful and fast man dodged all of them. With these portals, Feng couldn't hit Zhang Yi with shots. The objects kept coming out and then strange things started appearing. Suddenly clothes covered his vision, and then barrels of fuel surprised him. He couldn't cut or be hit by them. Zhang Yi brought his favorite weapon to his hand and then ignited the fuel with a shot. Feng was now feeling hot, even though surrounded by snow. As the fire increased, Feng seemed to have resistance to fire, or his clothes could be special. Although the fire didn't have the effect of hurting, he couldn't see his target and again lost emotional control. Zhang Yi began to throw even more absurd things at the soldier. His years of puberty could have produced this. Feng became even more furious and was then surprised again by piles of trash. The man suffered no injuries, but now he seemed to be having a mental breakdown of rage. Zhang Yi then threw something that this time wasn't simple. These barrels had a target that Feng immediately noticed. This smell was seafood. Our villain said that no one in the world can be invincible. Everyone has weaknesses. Zhang Yi found out thanks to Xin Xin that his file informed that Feng was allergic. Even with this, our villain continued to provoke Feng and ran from close combat. Zhang Yi threw luxury cars that I dream of having falling on my head one day. After a long time, Feng fell and didn't move anymore. Our villain looked at him and seemed not to trust it. He walked away and then set up a camp and decided to eat and warm up. After a few minutes, the Fallen Man became for use and began to pursue his opponent again. Feng couldn't reach Zhang Yi and was reaching his limit. Finally, he fell and cursed this ant. He wouldn't lose in a fight, but would he lose to such a despicable tactic. The fallen man, then Zhang Yi set up camp again and waited. Exactly 30 minutes passed, and our favorite villain was full. He decided to check if Feng was pretending again. He shot him in the head, and there was no reaction. He approached and wondered if he really defeated the arrogant captain of the Xinshan base. He did one more test and threw a truck over him. Still no reaction, but it could still be an act. In that case, he took out a sword and performed a procedure that I cannot show here. Finally, it seemed that the captain had died. Zhang Yi approached to take his trophy. He was absorbing Feng's powers as he had done before. This time his eyes were blue. Zhang Yi was absorbing the most powerful mutant of all. After finishing this process, he felt amazing. Then his right eye began to hurt, and he lost his vision for a moment. Upon regaining his senses, something completely surprised Zhang Yi. With his gaze, he could distort objects at a distance and destroy anything. He was thrilled, and soon his wickedness appeared. With this, he could face mutants who are immune to firearms. It seems that all this risk he took to face Feng had an incredible reward. However, even though he had just eaten, this consumes a lot of energy. Maybe he could only use this three times in a day. Of course, the Rinnegan would cost a lot of personal energy. Now this is more effective than being a sniper. Zhang Yi now wonders who will be his next victim. So we see one of Feng's team girls watching from afar and asking why it's taking so long. Her companion says their captain must be torturing their enemy. They just have to trust their captain's strength and wait for him to emerge victorious. Meanwhile, Zhang Yi's companions were laughing because they were confident that if the fight was taking too long, it meant their leader's strategy was working. Then the confirmation of the winner came through the earphones. He told them not to speak and just listen, as he didn't want Feng's followers to know he had won just yet. They were happy and did as he instructed. Meanwhile, Zhang Yi had arrived at the location where Feng's followers were and used the Rinnegan on the girl with hypnotic powers, as she was the most dangerous of them. She started screaming in terror, and then the girl grew a few meters taller. After defeating the mind control girl, he appeared to everyone and showed his trophy. Of course, uh, his words left all of Feng's men in shock. They simply couldn't believe their leader had been killed by someone as weak as him. And so the battle between them began. With the attack of all their powerful allies, Zhang Yi shouted that he couldn't leave any alive. In a matter of seconds, they were all completely defeated by the three warriors. At that moment, Zhang Yi began to run toward the bodies of the dead to absorb their energy, as they were all leaders of original powers, not artificial ones. But he was surprised to find that he couldn't do it at all, and he couldn't understand why, even though he had managed to absorb Feng's power recently. Then he called Chun and Yu to try to absorb these powers in his place, but this time, they both failed, and he began to tell them that it had been discovered among Feng's men that only a few people are capable of absorbing others' powers. In the midst of their conversation, they were surprised by the cat, which approached one of them, the owner of the firepower, and then had dinner. Zhang Yi was confused and asked if he could absorb his power or not.
not. It seems she couldn't either, so it was just a good appetizer for the flower. They returned to the entrance of the Shinshin base, and then Zhang Yi put a truck at the entrance of the place. Liang was curious about what he was doing. He just said she would see now. Then a huge explosion happened at the entrance of the base. The teacher now knew his intention. Now any enemy trapped in this place would have no way to escape. He withdrew cars for his whole team and quickly said they were going to another place. After driving for some time, Zhang Yi searched on his phone for information about the Shishan base. He wanted to find the secret exit that exists in that place. Soon they spotted a group of people. Liang was surprised and angry when she realized the man trying to escape in front of her was Chen Xinyan, the leader of the base himself, fleeing. He was horrified to realize that he had been found so quickly. He began to wonder why Zhang Yi had come after him. The man had left his wife and child behind to escape with his life. Zhang Yi and Liang got out of the car, and this scene gave me chills. Our villain of good approached and asked why the arrogant man was silent now. Chen Xinyan raised his hands to show he was unarmed. Besides, he's a powerful person, and if he dies now, the city's power will be unbalanced. If he does that, even more dangerous demons will come to take over this place. And indeed, his words had a slight impact on Zhang Yi, making him think and feel that there was a great possibility it was true. But even so, he snapped out of his thoughts and said no one would care about him from now on. Besides, he wasn't in a position to negotiate. At that moment, Liang began to get furious and told Chen Xinyan that she would avenge her students. The cowardly leader replied that he was forced to use every possible means to survive and help his followers survive. He spoke again to Zhang Yi and said that with Zhang Yi's incredible talents and his contacts, they could easily dominate the entire city. Our villain grew tired of hearing useless things and decided to activate his Kamui. Chen Xinyan's head was separated from the rest. His soldiers abandoned their weapons and any hope of leaving alive. Zhang Yi would show no mercy. They were willing to approach him with grenades to have a chance for all of them to confront the devil about their sins. Our villain hit their legs, and then the grenades that had been thrown at him, he absorbed into his alternate dimension. He was like an invincible god now. The men could only beg for their lives, but without mercy, he returned the grenades from earlier, and then the barbecue went too far. The other soldiers had the fortune of being sent to the death dimension faster. While Zhang Yi burned all the bodies of the defeated, Liang wanted to know if what he was doing was really necessary, he was too cautious. For Zhang Yi, this was normal, but what if people came to avenge these people? It's natural for him to eliminate all evidence. The teacher then doubted if that was possible now. He says that Chen Xinyan was an important person for the army in the city of Tianhai, and therefore, there was a good chance that someone would come to avenge him when they found out he was dead. And worst of all, there might be someone in the base who could inform the higher-ups about his identity and location. Zhang Yi says that caution is never too much. If she had thought better, she would never have taken taken her students to that place. These words hurt Liang. She thought that if she were like him, her students wouldn't have died. They were free to go home now, but Liang remembered that he needed to take her to her students. So after some time driving, our group arrived at Building 25, where this whole story began. Everyone who survived was there waiting for their teacher. Before leaving, Zhang Yi told her that he hadn't forgotten the agreement and explained that in Chun's village, which is near this place, there are many empty houses after the deaths of many villagers. She wanted him to take them all to that place. But Zhang Yi replied that their agreement didn't include that, and if she wanted something beyond the agreement, she would need to pay more. She thought they were already friends, so he could do that. Zhang Yi replied that they were friends, so she would have a discount. He made it clear that nothing comes for free, and since she had nothing to offer him now, Liang said she would take care of them alone. Zhang Yi then bid farewell to his dear friend and said they could see each other soon, because he lives near that city. As she walked away, Zhang Yi had a look that revealed his true personality. In secret, he said he didn't care about her students, but he needed to maintain maintain a good relationship with her, someone so powerful he couldn't afford to lose. He said that soon he would have her in his bed, or in his group, because that would be enough. Lang returned to building 25 where her students were, and she found them burning furniture to keep warm. She went to ask if they were okay, but all they wanted to know was why Zhang Ye had left. Wasn't he supposed to provide food and take care of them all? Lang explained to them that Zhang Ye would come back later and take them to a better place. Upon hearing that this place was a farming village with houses and fishing opportunities, the students became outraged. They wanted to know why Karen and Singson could live in the village where Zhang Yi was, and they couldn't. They all complained that the two girls could live in a much better place than them, and insisted that Leon talk to Zhang Yi so they could live in the same place too. They all complained that it was too cold and difficult to have to fish for food. At this point, Liang began to feel frustrated with her students' lack of gratitude, and shouted that the discussion was over. She was tired of trying to save them from the Zishan base. She became irritated with them, and said they were free now. Anything was better than being in that base. Leon 
Zhang sat down and told them to rest because tomorrow morning Zhang Yi would help them go to the Xeta village. The next day, we see Zhang Yai in the car telling Uncle Yu that he should pack his things and come live near him in his bunker because the place is full of luxurious houses and Zhang Yi believes it's better for them to live close to each other so they can take care of each other. His uncle agreed that this would be great and that after this great battle, he understands the power of cooperation. Additionally, the veteran also mentioned that it was scary to live alone in such a big building. The chubby one finds this strange. How can such a powerful man like his uncle be afraid of anything? Zhang Yi made it clear that his uncle's fear makes perfect sense if they analyze the words of Chen Xinian before he went to talk to the devil. Tianhai City has other military forces besides them. This is worrying, but at the same time, the three of them destroyed more than 1,000 people in one night, so they are the real danger of this city, and from now on, they will live together. So our villains got out of the car to get their things from Building 25 and go to their new home. When Zhang Yi returned home, everyone sighed with relief. He reassured them, saying he was fine and nothing had happened to him. His uncle was also welcomed by his delightful wife. Zhang Yi then noticed Karen standing silently beside him. He approached and hugged her, whispering sweet things in her ear. Thanks to her, this victory was possible. They would never have succeeded without her and her bombs. Meanwhile, Singson watched from afar, wondering why she wasn't receiving as much attention. At that moment, Zhang Yi noticed Singson standing nearby and said that the greatest credit of all belongs to her. Her hacking skills initiated this plan. Zhang Yi then gathered everyone to talk. His uncle wanted to know their leader's plans. Our protagonist decided they should return to the larger bunker. There are many mansions there that they can use. Zhao Haimi felt relieved. That place was her home, and she had worked all her life to buy a house in that condominium. Zhang Yi then said that they would all move out of this apartment and leave supplies here for this place to be an emergency base. The girls grabbed their suitcases, and then Zhang Yi was going to lock up his first base where it all started. He noticed that Li Jing was hiding at the end of the hallway. The man replied that everyone had been awake since yesterday, afraid after hearing an explosion from the west. But Zhang Yi completely ignored what he said and asked about his health and if he felt anything strange lately. Li Jing replied that he didn't feel anything strange, but his health was terrible, to the point that the doctor with them in the building told him not to use his ability, or he would become fertilizer for the seeds. Zhang Yi then said it's okay, since he's fine, he'll leave now. Shortly after, finally, all our heroes arrived at Zhang Yi's palace. He told the otaku and his uncle that they could rest today, and the next day they could choose a mansion in this condominium to live in. After that, Zhang Yi entered with his cat and locked the door behind him, saying he couldn't believe he could finally sleep and rest after a whole month of torment. In the morning, we returned to teacher Liang and her students who finally arrived at Su Village. Some residents stayed in the village and were not taken to the Xishan base, and of course the villagers who hadn't seen her since she was with Feng's gang were afraid of her and thought she was a spy. On the other hand, Liang was worried because the resources they got from Zhang Yi would soon run out, and of course she knew very well that her students were weak and couldn't fish in the Exu village's river either. The teacher thought the only alternative was to ask Zhang Yi for more food. As we returned to Zhang Yi, he was in his love nest with Zhu Kier, who was telling him that things were calm and they should consider having a child. Zhang Yi replied, saying it didn't make sense to have a baby now. They would have to take care of a child every day. He reassures the girl, saying that the times are still uncertain. As he looked at his wife's sad face, Zhang Yi thought he had no plans to have children. For him, it would just be one more life to worry about. But for his beautiful Zhu Kier, this was important. She wants to have a baby to strengthen their love. Our girl thinks that every day more girls come to live in this refuge. Having a baby is a guarantee for her to keep her place in Zhang Yi's heart. As if he could read her mind, our villain says he has a solution for her to keep her place in his heart. Zhang Yi says she must train her body and keep her body sexy and her face beautiful. She also has to work on her secret feminine technique. This response embarrassed the girl, and she tells her love that he can't say such things. Furthermore, how is she going to train her feminine technique alone? While Zhang Yi said things I can't show here, his uncle went to the door of his room to say there was something important. He was embarrassed to hear something, and said that Liang was calling for Zhang Yi. Our villain went down immediately, and told Yang Me that he was busy now. He went to Liang, and was kind, telling her to sit down. He was being very polite because he wanted something from the woman. She tells about her difficulties with her students, and Zhang Yi says that a skilled woman living such a difficult life and having to work so hard for others is sad, so she could live in this place with him. The girl, upon hearing everything, says that the agreement was for them to unite to defeat the Xishan base, and then Zhang Yi would provide food and shelter for everyone for a while. She needs more food for her students. Now that the enemy base is destroyed, he doesn't need to worry about keeping a lot of food for the future. Liang knows her students are spoiled, so it will take time for them to become independent and find their own food. Zhang Yi asked how all this was possible. Didn't they suffer a lot at the Xishan base? Liang didn't want to talk about it anymore. He can provide food for a while longer, and she will think about how to solve their problems 
Golden later. John Yai is a man of his word, and then withdrew a lot of food from his dimensional space for her. He explained that these resources would be enough for her and her students for about half a month. Liang deeply thanked him for this, and Zhang Yi just replied that she deserves it all. But he questions if it's safe for a woman to be responsible for so many young students. This makes the girl sigh. So those words had some effect on Zhang Yi. Liang remembers that since the apocalypse began, she has been working hard as a teacher and protector of these students, and above all, they are not truly grateful for her dedication. Even thinking this way, Liang responds that she cannot abandon those people, as they won't survive in this world alone. She would be unable to forgive herself for leaving them behind. Zhang Yi is saddened to know that she puts her life aside to dedicate herself to others. That's something he would never do. He then has a brilliant idea. He can help Liang to free herself from these students responsibly. Perhaps then she can leave them behind and join him, since she insists on not abandoning those useless parasites due to a good person instinct. He thought to himself that if he could find a convincing reason for her to abandon her students, then he could live comfortably and be very happy. Furthermore, he knew very well that her students would be like demons, as he still remembered how they treated Xingxin when they threatened her with death. When he snapped out of his thoughts, he questioned Liang that most of her spoiled students were over 18 and yet they only rely on her like children who aren't even hers, and when the agreement ends, how will they feed themselves? This left Liang extremely frustrated, thinking they would grow up and mature after all they went through in the Excision base, but she was wrong. Then Zhang Yi entered and told her that he knew she was having difficulties with her students and decided to help her. Liang didn't believe him and was very surprised. To understand better, she asked what he meant by that. Zhang Yi replied that, as she knew, he had many resources, and it would be very easy for him to provide for her and her students continuously. Liang knew very well that this didn't come for free, and asked directly what he wanted in return. Zhang Yi said he wanted to feed the students. The protagonist told the girl that he already has plenty of food and equipment for many years. Zhang Yi couldn't bear to see Leon work so hard like this. What he wants in exchange for giving food is for herself. He wants Leon for himself. The woman was ashamed and said out loud that she would never sell her body in this life. He's crazed to ask for something like that. Zhang Yi then says she didn't let him finish. He wants her as a martial arts teacher. How can she think of such indecent things? Our villain says he wants to know what's on her mind. Is she really a teacher? What subject then? Leon was embarrassed and apologized for her misunderstanding. Zhang Yi then decides that if she thinks so badly of him, then she doesn't deserve this help. The woman apologizes more and accepts his kindness in exchange for teaching martial arts in bed. Singson was listening to this whole conversation and asked herself if Zhang Yi also wanted to date their teacher. Leon was determined to accept this in exchange for helping her students. Our shameless protagonist says she must come every day to teach two hours a day, and then he will provide food for ten people every day. Only ten people is little. Liang has sixteen students and asks for more, but Zhang Ye is very clever and says the intention is to make her students learn to be independent. If she gives enough food all the time, they will never need to make an effort for more. Liang then accepted the situation and told him that ten people were better than nothing. After Liang left, Zhang Yi relaxed. Although he didn't show it, he was tired. However, it seemed he wouldn't be able to relax for long. Singson and Karen arrived at the location. He said they were late because their teacher had already left. Singson says they didn't come here to talk to her, and this makes him curious. Why not? They reply that if they had come here earlier, they would have disrupted the negotiation. Singson then asks if he wants to consume Liang too. <laughs> This question suddenly surprises our villain. Why do they think that? Karen jokes saying she didn't know her brother wanted their teacher, and Singson gets furious and says that throughout human history, doing favors was the most effective way to make alliances. Zhang Yi listens to Singson say that their teacher is powerful and from a female point of view, she is quite beautiful. Then the wheelchair-bound girl praises how smart he is to use her. Zhang Yi is the one most pleased. He likes that they are pragmatic and get straight to the point. He wants Liang to join his team to face future dangers. However, there's no romantic interest between them. Singson then decides she will help her brother gain Liang's trust. In this case, Karen and Singson know very well who their teacher is and how to influence her. Our villain says it's not necessary for them to help. In her current condition, it will be very easy to convince her to join his team. Besides, Singson seems to be thinking of evil things, and he doesn't want the risk of Liang turning against them. The girls left, and Singson warned that in these last few days, she would be focused on reviewing the information they obtained from the Xishan base. There was dangerous information in Xishan's database, and she explained to him that the information network of this database was very large and contained dangerous secret information as it belonged to the army. But all she could tell him now was that she discovered the existence of powerful organizations in the city of Tanhai, some of which may be even more powerful than the Xishan base. Zhang Yi replied that he already expected something like that. After all, Tanhai is a giant city, so it's impossible for there to be a single dominant force there. Then Singson began to explain that she also discovered that there are disagreements between these forces 
forces and asked Zhang Yi how they would act if all these forces united against them. He replied that they certainly aren't so unlucky for that to happen to them, not to mention that he's not afraid of anyone and is confident in his own strength and that of his team. This makes them a force to be feared, and he's confident that anyone who sees them will think twice before facing them. This speech makes Singson happy and confident too. She told him she would organize all the information and invite him to see it. He'll look forward to that. Zhang Yi called Karen because he needed her for an important conversation. When they were seated together, Zhang Yi explained that he doesn't want to be passive as before. When there's an attack, he wants to be prepared. Zhang Yi wants help to turn his three mansions into powerful fortresses so they could withstand any future attack from any enemy. Karen replied that drawing up a plan is extremely easy, but she's not sure if they'll have the materials, machinery, and manpower to execute constructions. The protagonist reminded the girl that he can transport any material. His uncle Yu has the strength of manpower of 100 men, and the chubby one can control the snow. Upon hearing this, the girl convinced herself that they are few people, but they are very competent and powerful. They can build the defenses. Karen must draw up the defense plans now. Later, Zhang Yi gathered his team and began to show them the places in the villages where they would stay and said that all of them would stay together to make it easier to fortify them all at once. Furthermore, the rest of the village whose protection is much weaker compared to his mansion, so they need to do this as quickly as possible. Chun realizes that as powerful as he is as an otaku, if an enemy invades his house and hits his head, he will die and in hell there are no waifus to Uncle Yu reminded that if they are going to build defenses and more houses, they'll need to think about making weapons for the attack too. Zhang Yi acknowledges that he hadn't thought of that yet. With such a large area, they'll need a great firepower. Zhang Yi suggests that they can go to the ruins of the Xishan base to pick up things from the wreckage. His uncle says they can dismantle the defenses left in that place and reassemble them here. After burning many neurons, our protagonist has a brilliant idea. They can use the otaku's powers to build a great wall with blocks of ice. He shows the exact locations where they can do this. With Chun's powers, they'll build a fortress surrounded by ice walls. While the battle generals discuss the defenses they will build, our two bright minds and the two bright bodies play some game. Zhang Yi says that being careful is never too much. Chun didn't know they could have other dangerous groups out there too. Zhang Yi replied that yes, and that for these groups, they aren't even considered a real force, so they have to be quick to build a more powerful base. Zhang Yi gave the order for everyone to go get the wreckage from the Xishan base right away, but to their surprise, someone unexpected appeared. Liang was at the entrance of his house. Chun was wondering if Zhang Ye had gotten another 3D girl for him, but our villain said to everyone that he's not that kind of person. He explained to everyone that she comes here every day to teach him martial arts and nothing more. His uncle was also curious if his tutor played more mischievous games with him. Our otaku began to imagine if there were he who had lessons with a private teacher. Their otaku thoughts made our villain uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, boy. Liang was invited to enter, and she was surprised to see so many people here. She found this place very comfortable, like a big family. The girl she knew were also there. It had been a while since the teacher had seen her two students. Singson and Karen said they always felt safe with Zhang Yi. Singson also said she could ask her brother Zhang Yi to let her live with them too. This was an attempt by Singson, but her teacher refuses to leave her students alone. Singson doesn't give up and responds that she can come live here and still help her students. If she doesn't, and they learn to survive on their own in this world, she'll be their slave forever. Upon hearing these words, Liang asks if Zhang Yi would accept her here. The teacher asks her former student if it wouldn't be selfish to leave the other students alone in that village. Singson says she can convince Zhang Yi to let her stay. Now as for the students, Singson thinks no matter where they live, it won't change their living conditions. Furthermore, if she lives here, she'll be able to help her students much more with food. Singson knows her teacher was tempted to accept, and then creating a way to make it seem like the best for her students can convince her. Looking around, it was natural for Liang to want to live in this cozy place. Singson knew Zhang Yi's plan is to create a way to make her stay here and lead the students outside unprotected. When that time comes, they will be eliminated. Liang says she'll think about it, and our girl will wait for her answer. After their conversation ended, Zhang Yi takes Liang to her first day of martial arts classes. He notices that her clothes are like trash, so he gets her some new clothes. These luxuries make her ashamed because she must take a bath and put on clean clothes to be able to practice. When she returned with new and clean clothes, her confidence had increased, so Zhang Yi tells them to start. Her teacher says he must be prepared like a man, and then they begin to practice. Run. Two hours later, Zhang Yi was destroyed, and his teacher hadn't even sweated her new clothes. She reminds our protagonist that becoming a master takes many years, but Zhang Yi just wants to be able to defend himself better if needed. Liang thinks that if he defeated Ling Feng, then there shouldn't be people who can face him in battle. Zhang's look turned cold, everything in this world can be unpredictable, and he must be prepared. After that, he said they should continue tomorrow and handed the food to her to take away. Liang remembers Singson's words and thinks that if it were Zhang Yi who had said all that, she would be sure 
sure he was conspiring against her students, but since it was Stinkson, such a pure girl must not have bad intentions. Little does the teacher know that Stinkson is more degenerate and terrible than our protagonist. We just need to remember that she liked people mistreating her, and then commanded the flower cat to make him her food. When her new evil student leaves the room, the teacher begins to question if she can really live here and be welcome. Leaving the hall, he met Chun, and he suggested bringing Leon with them on their trip to the Xishan base. Although they supposedly blew up the entire base, he was still tense, worried, and afraid. Uncle Yu said Chun should be braver. He has extraordinary power and looks like a scared rat. The leader says there's nothing wrong with being cautious, but that's different from being cowardly. He also says that at the right time, he will call Liang to go with them. As for Liang, on the way back, she was thinking about Zhang Yi's offer and whether she should discuss it with her students. When the students saw the resources she had, they were happy and went like zombies for the food. Now relieved, Liang wanted to know how they did on the first day they could go fishing in the river. The student who did errands for the greedy woman at the Exition base said she should know they suffered a lot pedaling bicycles every day. And now that they can have fresh air and freedom, no one wants to work outside in the cold. They only caught three fish. She didn't expect it to be different. The boys weren't satisfied with so little food and wanted more, but one of them was sensible and reminded that this food was from Liang that she got from Zhang Yi. They should be able to go after their own food with their own hands. One of them asked Liang, since she goes every day to teach martial arts to Zhang Yi, she could ask him to let everyone live in his house too. They can eat less food and help with chores if necessary. Other students insist that Karen and Xingxin can, so why can't they? The teacher then says with a serious look that they are not like those two girls. Xingxin is Zhang Yi's bride's sister, and Karen is Xingxin's best friend. Moreover, the two have great intellectual abilities that none of them can compete with. Even after hearing all this, her selfish students ask Liang to try harder to find a way for them to live in that place. And with those words, Liang is now sure she would be unable to talk to them about Zhang Yi's offer now. After three days, we see that Zhang Yi and his followers prepared to go to the Xishan base. Karen should say what materials they would need to fetch. After discussing what was needed, they head to the destination. On the way to the Xishan base, Chun began to say that the flower cat looked different, no longer the same animal. Zhang Yi understood what that meant. The others didn't know, but the flower cat has the same ability to absorb the power of other mutants. The flower cat ate many of the mutants in the battle against the base, and now she is much stronger. Zhang Yi is looking forward to seeing this monster in combat. Shortly after, Sinkson called the villain and asked if he had arrived at the base or not, as she had important information to share with him. Zhang Yi asked her to speak. Sinkson discovered that Tainhai had four military bases scattered throughout the city, each of them dominating a different area of the city. All these bases were built many years ago and militarized even more after the apocalypse, and they are no less powerful than the Xishan base, and all are underground and have weapons and war preparations. Zhang Yi replied that now they know how many bases are left in the city. Although he knows that these bases are relatively far from his home, Home, it cannot be certain that they do not want to expand their territory and may come to them. However, Xingxin interrupted Zahn's thoughts and said that there was one more special force besides these three bases, but there wasn't much information about them except that they had numerous people. Zhang Yi thanked her for all this important information, which made our four-wheeled lowly girl happy and said she will get more information for him. As for Chun, he was afraid when he heard about these other bases and was praying they wouldn't target their group. For Zhang Yi, this is something he hopes for as well. Besides, after the death of 90% of Tainhe's population, there will certainly be enough resources for the remaining 10%, so he was confident that there would be no need for conflict to exploit the city's food resources. Even though the future is uncertain, his uncle was aware that the worst situations always happen. In this case, Zhang Yi was confident that no matter the group, the four of them in this car could destroy any army. Finally, they reached the Xishan base and ran towards the goal. Near the base, two groups of people were standing, and it seemed they were from different bases because they were arguing. They agreed that the entrance to the base was blocked. They wouldn't imagine that Chen Xinian would offend the neighboring city and be destroyed by missiles. One of the leaders said that Chen Xinian had always been very arrogant and that ultimately led to his demise. The group with the red-haired man was saddened because their trip was in vain as it was not possible to enter the base. Clearing all this debris and wreckage blocking the entrance to the base will require a lot of effort and they cannot achieve it now. However, one of the base leaders is sure that there will be many resources left inside the base that will be useful to them. The red-haired man says they could use the power of the mutants to clear the way, but how will they manage to transport all these materials to their bases? The base of the man who arrived first is 200 kilometers away from this place. When asked if they can transport these resources, the red-haired man says they are in the same situation. He came to this place only to confirm the situation of the Excision base. Confirming that they are all dead is his best news. Even if the resources could not be taken away, now the men were rivaling over who would have the right to take possession of this territory. Zhang Yi and the others were watching this situation from afar. His 
uncle then recognizes that they must be the other bases Sinkson had mentioned. Our protagonist says they should just follow him and not say anything. John Yi goes to the two groups. The symbol on his chest is from the fake uniform he made from the Excision base. These people thought all the people from this base were dead and were surprised by this. As John Yi then owns this place, the red-haired man quickly says he was here just to get information. He had already got everything he wanted, so he will leave right away. In his thoughts, the representative of the King Cheng base was sure it wasn't worth getting into conflict here for something they couldn't even take. But unlike this first group, the representative of the Choyu base argued that they don't believe our group are survivors of the Excision base. Zhang Yi, on the other hand, paid no attention to the questions and only ordered that if they had gathered the information they wanted, they should return to their territories. Our protagonist and his soldiers were determined not to create conflicts, but the man shouted for them to wait. The man said they did not understand the situation. Any survivor no longer has the right to this base and territory. The soldier is a powerful mutant and will be the new owner of this place. Chun was surprised to see another mutant. The soldier showed his powers and said he was used to killing enemies as if they were ants. After these threats and displays of absolute power, he was confident they would not resist. Zhang Yi said he didn't want to cause trouble, but since it won't be possible to avoid it, he shows the true meaning of power. The fire mutant's head flies off, and the flower then turns into a demon and in seconds had the other two soldiers in her jaws. She spat out the men because they had no powers and the flower doesn't eat garbage. He tries to absorb the powers of this person, but it seems he was a newly awakened mutant, so he was very weak and could not add his powers. Chun then said that these arrogant youths consider themselves invincible when they discover their powers. As he guards the bodies, Zhang Yi says the Choyu base never faced major battles, and its members are weak. Our group of villains of good immediately went to the Excision base to fulfill their objective. Using their absurd power of dimensional space, the corridor was completely clear for them to enter. It seemed there was no danger, so Floor led the way. In the first room after entering the base, the scene was one of complete chaos. They reached the first gate, and then Chun said he was feeling chills in this place. Zhang Yi said there are neither the living nor the dead to fear. They moved further into the base and finally arrived the place with a sign indicating it's a weapons warehouse. Upon opening it, their surprise is great. It's simply more than they expected. This room contains the most powerful military equipment imaginable, including helicopters and RPG missiles. Zhang Yi says this must be the armament depot for the entire city, and they were here before the apocalypse. In Chun's eyes, these weapons must be useless to them, with all that snow outside. Zhang Yi agrees, saying that if they were useful, Ling Feng would have used them when he attacked their home. However, the goal is to use the weapons from these vehicles. Uncle Yu is immediately interested in one of the weapons in the place. Zhang Yi could take everything here to his warehouse, and then Uncle Yu could choose what he wanted. But he must remember that the purpose of these weapons is to set up the territory's defenses and not to play around. Their team steals everything inside because their dimensional space seems limitless. Moving to other locations, the path that was obstructed with debris, Uncle Yu used his strength and cleared the way for them. They continue and find computers and servers from the base. Zhang Yi says even this might have useful data for Xingxin, so it will be taken too. The fearful otaku was startled by cockroaches hidden in the base's debris. He hits a rock and confirms there are hundreds of these disgusting things here. According to Zhang Yi, this place must have been where they made proteins for the workers. Although it's gross to know that, the protagonist says Chun's courage is like that of a woman. Observing the equipment used to turn people into food for others, Zhang Yi wonders if he should take this to Karen. Despite finding it cruel, he decides that everything has its usefulness, so it will be taken. They walk through more locations of the underground base, and after some time, the flower kitty gets scared. They don't know where the potential threat is coming from, but Zhang Yi feels like he's being watched from the shadows. After some time, they reach the warehouse, a door even Uncle Yu couldn't destroy by punching with all his strength. Zhang Yi then goes to open this door in the traditional way. He says they shouldn't underestimate the equipment just because they have superpowers. Zhang Yi says Uncle Yu can go ahead. Chun thought the boss would be the one to use it, but our villain has never used this kind of thing. Uncle Yu then does his job, and with much effort, they manage to break open the warehouse door. This large space with dozens of boxes seems interesting. Uncle Yu points out that there's something about the curtains there. Upon opening them, they find resources that wouldn't catch any of their attention, but upon seeing all this, Zhang Yai is sure Karen can use it to build things. He steals everything with the utmost happiness. A room next door caught the attention of our villains. Inside were the food supplies the base found and stole on its missions. Uncle Yu thinks Zhang Yi should keep most of everything because he contributed the most to defeating the Xishan base, and that's too much for them to carry and eat alone. Zhang Yi then said he has enough food for more than one lifetime and will always share with his allies. They don't need to treat him with so much respect as if he were a stranger. For his family, they will always have the best food. While they talk, we discover that the flower kitty is actually a cat with big balls. After they made all the raids they needed, they blocked the entrance of the base again. In addition to the heavy stones Chun should reinforce, he launched tons
tons of snow and made an ice barrier as well, and then they went back home by car. At Zhang Yi's house, Liang went to do her martial arts session with the protagonist, but he hadn't returned from his mission yet. Zhu Qir warned her about this and that Zhang Yi left a message to cancel today's class. Liang was shocked by what she heard because she knew it would mean she would return today empty-handed to her hungry students. Zhu Qir then asked if she was hungry. She replied that she could come in and eat with them. Although Liang was starving, she refused and would return tomorrow. Zhu Qir was saddened to hear that she had come here in vain, but Liang told her not to worry about it because it's the student who sets the class schedule, and then the woman fled embarrassed. Sinkson then appears saying this must be a martial artist thing. Zhu Qir says she should have at least taken some food for herself. Sinkson asserts that would be worse for Liang. Those former companions of hers are selfish people and are worthless. They would fight over a little food, and that's why Liang decided not to take anything. Zhu Qir then asks if Zhang Yi did this on purpose. Did he intentionally forget to notify Liang that he would be out due to his commitment, and thus make Liang come here giving hope of food to the students, and then she returned empty-handed to make Liang realize the reality of these students? Our crazy wheelchair Loli says it must have been just that, and that Zhang Yi is amazing, with such a brilliant move, he will touch so many hearts. Sinks in his head over heels in love with our villain's wickedness, while Zhou Kier agrees that this is the kind of thing her fiancé would do. But to break our expectation, on the way back Zhang remembers that he forgot to tell Liang that he would be out today. As for Liang, when she returned to the village and saw the villagers working, she began to focus on them. At that moment, she was impressed because even the small children were working, while her students were just waiting for her to bring them food. She admits that Zhang Yi was right to let them fend for themselves a bit. When she returned to the students, they began to chase after her asking where today's food was. She replied that Zhang Yi wasn't home, so there was no food, and now they must go out and fish. They were disturbed and shouted that if Zhang Yi wasn't home, but he has plenty of food, then he should leave some reserve for them. Liang wanted to teach them not to blame others and to seek their own food. The students argued that they were not fishermen and their hands were hurt. Other students say all this is because Stinkson and Karen are cruel. They were classmates for years, and now they have a good life and don't care about them. Soon everyone starts agreeing that the girls have always been bad people. Liang is surprised to see these people blame the girls who almost died at their hands. She begins to get angry hearing everything they're saying about the girls. Liang yells ordering them to shut up. She will make an announcement right now. She tells them that from now on, she will live in the bunker with Karen and Sinkson. Liang decided she shouldn't pamper these people. They swelled with joy, thinking she would take them too. Liang then cut the happiness of these spoiled brats. It's not as they think. They all will stay here and learn to live on their own. Zhang Yi promised food for 10 people every day for her work teaching martial arts, and she will bring this food to them. Even knowing she would give up her food, her ungrateful students revolted and didn't want to accept this situation, even calling her selfish for doing so. The woman accustomed to ingratitude didn't want to listen to what they were saying and left for her new home. After 30 minutes, Liang left an environment of shouting and shitty egoism and was now in a warm place and well received. Zhu Qir was kind to her fiance's teacher and took her to see her students. Liang then talking to the two girls learns from Karen that life here is so good that Zhang Yi doesn't even let them do household chores. Karen received a studio where she can conduct the research she wants. The cheerful girl says she's happier here these days than in her entire school life. Similarly, Sinkson has a comfortable life and wants to know if the teacher returned to live like this too. The woman says Zhang Yi was right and she is letting her students learn to survive. Sinkson then gets straight to the point and asks if the teacher wants to live here. Liang didn't want to admit to herself that her desire was to leave those people behind and live her own life. So Sinkson helped her accept this desire, saying that everyone has the right to seek their own happiness. Liang then starts crying and they have a moment of catharsis. Then she asks Sinkson and Karen to speak to Zhang Yi on her behalf. Karen was convinced that Zhang Yi would not refuse Liang as she has great skills. Sinkson just warned that there is only one absolute rule in this bunker. Everyone who joins must be prepared to obey his orders. Liang feels embarrassed and asks what that really means. Does everyone in this place have to do the leader's bidding, even the darkest desires? She blushes in hopes that with four women in this house, he doesn't want a fifth in his room. Sinkson dreams of frequenting the leader's room and can't, so Liang is lamenting for nothing. Sinkson tells Liang that she must have a misunderstanding. Since Karen and she arrived here, Zhang Yi has never shown any inappropriate behavior towards them. The woman was thinking dirty things, so Sinkson makes it clear that the big brother is not a perverted predator. On the contrary, he is an honorable man, and all he needs from them is their strength. If that's the case, Liang says she is ready to follow all orders, and after a while, we see the perverted villain arrive and be welcomed home by his favorite hacker. He was curious why Liang was here at this time, so Xingxin explained the situation of why the woman was here now. The two terrible villains were talking about how Zhang Yi's plan worked. Liang was enraged with her students and decided to ask to live here. Now it's just a matter of him talking and accepting her stay. Sinkson was very involved in 
making this work, and her big brother acknowledges that she is always very clever. Our protagonist tells the men to wait in the next room because he has important matters to discuss with Leon. Karen offers them some drinks, and then the three start their meeting. Leanne is embarrassed because she doesn't know Zhang Yi's real intentions in having her in his group. The woman thinks she is here to ask a big favor from the bunker leader. Because of this, Sinkson puts on her act and asks if Liang can live with them in this house. Zhang Yi, for his part, says that doesn't make sense. Liang has her students to take care of. She wouldn't want to live here. It's not that he's against Liang living here. The teacher remembers that Zhang Yi invited her only once, and after she refused and said she should take care of her students, he never asked again. Now with a determined look, the woman thinks that if she is useful, maybe she can have a second chance to live here. Karen served a special drink to her leader and then gave her opinion. The students just take advantage of the teacher's good character. They don't deserve her dedication. Liang then makes it clear that Zhang Yi must let her help her students grow and learn to survive out there. She will follow all the orders and rules of this place, all the work and demands she will do. Our protagonist says he accepts her living here, but he's not convinced she will follow all the orders needed. She starts to tremble and says she will accept the orders, but there are limits she cannot cross. Zhang Yi then says she is sincere and kind. That's a quality, but at the same time, it's a flaw. If one day it is necessary to take the life of an innocent person to keep the base and the people here safe, would she be capable of that? She is aware that these situations can happen and says yes, but if it is a situation just to satisfy evil desires, she won't do it. Although she said this, Liang believes that Zhang Yai is a lover of peace. Sinkson says that's right, the brother doesn't kill except when provoked. She agrees with everything but emphasizes that she doesn't kill her own people. Our villain smiles and says that's obvious, of course he wouldn't be so wicked as to ask to kill people close to him. Those were his words to everyone, but with his dark expression, our villain says to himself that he does those services himself. Zhang Yai is also convinced that in a post-apocalyptic world, it's normal for people to die from accidents. Moreover, he is sure he would have the support of his girls against those who harm them so much. They seal the deal with a handshake, so she is now officially part of our protagonist's family. I think the MC won't need to lift a finger for those useless ones to die on their own. What do you think? Liang feels relieved to know that she will be able to help her ungrateful students and still live in this comfortable place. Singson, on the other hand, knows that her teacher is naive. It won't take long for those idiots to bring about their own demise. Zhu Kier and Yang Mai went to the newcomer saying they would throw a party to celebrate her joining the team. If they wanted to know if she had a favorite food for her, it could be anything. So much joy leaves the teacher adjusted in a way she can't explain. However, the reality is that the boss's two women realize that there is now one more woman in this harem. Zhang Yi's bed is becoming small for so many possibilities. Our villain warns that there will be a meeting with the other members, and then she should join. He explains that it is a war meeting where urgent matters will be decided. It's not like there's going to be a new war, but Zhang Yi explains that they found other military bases, and they are definitely enemies. Liang understands that this will happen. With a powerful base eliminated, there will be a power vacuum, and others will want to take over that region. By coincidence, Singson has new information to share about the Xishan base database. Zhang Yi calls the rest of the team, and then she can give the information to everyone. Currently, they are very comfortable with everything, but new enemies are nearby. It is imminent that there will be new conflicts, so Chin Chin should pass on the information about the other military bases that exist in the city. Chin Chin reveals that there are three other powerful bases, causing astonishment to those who did not yet know. The first of them is the Yangsheng base. This region has a lot of oil and fuels. Its leader is Xiao Honglian, who has the ability of fire, and his assistant is called Zhuge Qingtuing, who has the ability of wind. The second base is the Chouyi base, which controls all the ships in the city. Zhang Yi was curious if it was possible to navigate in this weather. She explained that only the surface layer of the sea was frozen because it was impossible for the oceans and seas themselves to freeze. Our protagonist's curiosity is about if the sea did not freeze completely, who has ships can fish. Chin Chin confirms that, and this base is the one with the greatest potential for seafood. Furthermore, the girl explains that the boats need a lot of fuel, so the people from this region need to come to their city. Seeing more information, Zhang Yi realizes that the soldiers she killed were from this base. The last of the four major refuges is King Pu, whose leader is Sing Tian, and his ability is of a strange type, as it enhances the power of people around him. However, his face is unknown, and there is not much information about his territory. Chin Chin discouraged was that in this apocalypse time, the major factions do not dare to confront each other and reveal their special abilities. Zhang Yi thought this was expected and thought to himself that these people certainly would not reveal their power until absolutely necessary. This is because, as long as there is competition for power and resources in Tanhai, all the base leaders will be cautious not to be overthrown. Chin Chin continued to speak and explained that each base had something that distinguished them, and what distinguished the Zishan base was the great power of its army. The Yangsheng base is energy, the Choi base is maritime transportation, and the Qingsheng base 
is metal manufacturing. The other bases do not have large armies at their disposal, only individuals with special abilities. Among them, the Excision base they defeated was the strongest of all. When Chinchin finished speaking, everyone was relieved that the risk from these enemies was less than what they had already faced. Even Zhang Yi, who was cautious, became more relaxed. However, the teacher was curious about the fourth force that Chinchin mentioned. She really mentioned only three. The wheelchair-bound girl says there is a group called Snow Worshippers. The religious leader has the ability to turn people into mutants. She realized that there was a fourth base, but it was not a military base. In fact, this base was a religious sect called the Ice Servants. The sect's leader called himself the Reincarnation of Ice and still insisted that everyone join him to be saved, as he was the chosen one. The influence of this group has grown a lot, so the Isishin base considered these people their greatest opponent. Then Zhang Yi began to think about the growth of a religious army, all with mutant powers, which would be a big problem. Our protagonist wanted their opinion on this. As no one knew what to say, Zhang Yi decided that the first to speak would be his own uncle since he is the major of this place. The veteran then said that they should always prepare for the greatest possible danger. The first step would be to build the most powerful defenses here. Using the weapons they obtained, they can prepare to face any attack. Indeed, Zhang Ye agreed that they should focus their efforts on building defenses. Chun is also very afraid that they may be attacked and also supports focusing on making defenses. Zhang Ye also asked Karen about it. The girl said they should continue focusing on getting even stronger materials to build a defense. If they leave now while the other territories do not advance, they will not encounter enemies from other bases. Zhang Yi agreed with her point of view that they should leave as soon as possible to get more materials. Chin Chin then wanted to know her teacher's opinion, as she seemed very nervous about it. The girl tells the teacher not to panic and take the Excision base as an example. Even with the most powerful base being here, they could not explore and dominate the entire territory. So these other bases also cannot expand their territories and risk their forces as they have fewer armies. Based on this, they have plenty of time to explore and accumulate more resources available in the city. She explains that building defenses is important, but they should first take advantage of this time to gather more resources available in the city. Chin Chin wants to know if her teacher agrees. She said she is worried about her students if there is an attack. Won't they be in danger in the village? The girl admits that she cannot protect them forever. If there is an attack, she will not be able to do anything. However, she should not worry because the enemies have not reached this region for a while. The protagonist soon thinks that if there is an attack, the first place to be destroyed will be the village where her students are. Lian wants to know if her students could help build defenses, but Zhang Yi then asks, if people who cannot even fish in a place where there is only fishing to be done, what could they help with? This is a fact that not even she could deny. Shin Shin then says again that it is likely they will never come here. To comfort their new member, our protagonist says that if something happens, he will think of a solution for her. His response surprises everyone. John said that if danger appears, he will allow his students to stay in this refuge for a while. What everyone did made a mask. Why is everyone looking like that? In the past, they were not companions, but now now Lang is part of his family, and if she wants to help her students, then he will protect her students. These words make the teacher cry with emotion. He said she does not need to thank him. It is the least he should do. Liang then thinks she has been misinterpreting things all along. Zhang Yi is a good person, even if he may seem ruthless when threatened by strangers. The result of the meeting is that the local leader said that the priority will be to build defenses. While they do that, Zhang Yi and Karen will go out to look for more specialized materials for construction. After the meeting, Zhu Kier announces that Liang's celebration dinner is ready. Chichen smiles to see her teacher so excited. The woman devours the dish as if she were a beggar. She ate so quickly that her stomach couldn't handle it. Zhu Kier says she has spent so long eating poorly that her stomach cannot handle so much meat. Liang was taken to rest because the food was too much for her to handle. This good life is like a paradise for the lady teacher. After dinner, Zhang Yi asks Karen to come closer and said that he noticed she wasn't happy at the meeting. The girl replied that it's nothing much, but Zhang Yi flicks her head and says she shouldn't hide anything from him as they are a family now. The girl then gathers courage and asks why he should take in those evil students. He must know how they treated Chin Chin and her at the academy. Zhang Yi then reassures the girl and tells her that this is part of his plan. Before any attack happens, those demons will come together and die of hunger. Her eyes shine knowing that her brother is brilliant and never disappoints. Zhang Yi then says that this should be kept a secret and they should not discuss this at home. When they go out tomorrow to look for more materials, they can discuss it further. Karen now seems happier than ever and then goes to get the list of materials they need for construction. Zhang Yi knows he can only control the members of his group. Now it remains to be seen how the opponents will do. The next day, Karen pointed out where she wanted the materials, our villain transported the ice stones, and then Liang was able to cut a perfect block of ice. Uncle Yu, with his strength, could lift the blocks and metal walls. While they worked hard, Zhang Yi saw from afar in the village two people hiding in one of the abandoned houses. Realizing this opportunity, he was very pleased. Chen was curious about what he was seeing, but our protagonist didn't tell him anything. He just went to Liang, told her she should know something 
crying and apologized. He always said her students were selfish, but now he had just seen one of them helping another person. Zhang Yi says a few things, and then the teacher rushes to the house to see what was going on. In this house, the student was locking the door the best way he could. This girl is one of the villagers, and they were about to make a trade. He would give her food, and in return, she would help him with certain things that you should understand. As the room temperature rose, Liang arrived outside the room, and upon hearing the noises, broke down the door. Then she caught the two helping each other, the sight of her furious. If the student says he's already an adult, and he also has needs, then she has to understand what was happening here. He didn't force anyone to do this, and the girl agreed that this was true. Liang then took the food she had given them, and crushed it in her hands. Was this what she worked so hard to feed them for? The girl then gets angry, and says she should just be obedient and give them food. She shouldn't interfere with the rest. The boy then made it clear that she doesn't have any say here. Although Liang was furious, her former student asked him to leave and not interfere with his business. The woman then gave up and just left the room. Zhang Yi was already waiting for her, and said that reality can be cruel. Liang wanted to know if he thought she was stupid. She becomes sad and says she must be. Zhang Yi then says that she should not hold a grudge against him for showing the truth. He will not judge her actions even if he disagrees. The woman becomes very sad and says she needs some time alone. Chun became curious about what happened, and then Zhang Yi tells him, leaving the chubby guy surprised. Liang locked herself in her room, thinking about how she had been an idiot all this time, and everything she did lost its meaning. Soon, Zhang Yi knocks on the door of the room, and comes to ask if she is okay. She said she just needs a moment, and she will be back to work soon. However, our hero says that nothing is as urgent as her well-being. He came here because he was worried. Hearing that he was worried about her made her cheeks blush. Zhang Yi asked if he could come in for a chat, and she agreed. He sat on the bed, and said he understands that this was a heavy blow for her, but he hopes she can move on, as there is a long way to go. Zhang Yi also said that if she has more problems in the future, she can talk to him, and that he will always be willing to listen. The woman then asks if he thinks she is an encourager idiot. John Yai is sincere, says a little, but knows that she has her reasons for being so hopeful in those people. Liang opens up and tells about her past. She had been practicing martial arts since she was a child. All her life she devoted herself to it, and dreamed of being a TV star or something very important. But being a woman was always an obstacle for her to stand out in the world of martial arts. So one day she decided to leave the martial arts path and work as a bodyguard. She says that was the most glorious time of her life. After a few years, she became very well known for her work, and then and the academy hired her to be a physical education teacher and protect the rich and noble students of the academy. She becomes sad, saying that all her happiness was in the past. When the end times came, she lost everyone she had, and the only thing left was the responsibility to protect the students she had. That was the only thing that kept her going, and now she considers herself a fool. Liang says she can't live a selfish life like Jean, who thinks of himself first and then others. The one cries as she opens her heart. She just lost her last hope and faith that kept her going. In this cold and cruel world, she no longer sees a point in continuing to live just for herself. Our hero then says that she's putting too much pressure on herself. And besides, if before she was alone, now she has companions she can consider as family. Everyone in their refuge is different from the students she protected until now. He takes her hand and says she will need a new motivation. Liang can make him her new motivation. Thinking about his words, she becomes even more embarrassed, and her head feels hot. This person in front of her was saying she should rebuild a new life and has the people of this place as her support. Additionally, he says he couldn't see her so sad. The embarrassed woman lets go of his hand and says she already feels better. Johnny asks, does she really feel better? Lane responds yes, but she's still disappointed with her students and they need to mature. He gets up and leaves, leaving the woman behind. He was pensive about what happened. When he found Chin Chin in the living room, now he asked if he had eaten the teacher. John Yi, already knowing his hacker's provocations, simply replied that he has no interest in his teacher's body. Chin Chin refuses to believe and says that Liang is very beautiful. John agrees that she is beautiful beautiful, but very troublesome, and her problems are what he hates the most. The protagonist whispers in his ear that at least now Liang won't see his students as she did before. He tells him what happened and what she witnessed in the cabin. This information makes Chin Chin say that they are truly repulsive. John then says that the best thing to do is to convince Liang to abandon those people, and then he can eliminate all of them without worries. Chin Chin openly hurt her brother's intentions and said she will help him with that. These events leave our villain very satisfied. The next day, they were getting ready to go in search of materials. Karen was dressed in military clothes from the excision base that they supposedly belonged to. Her uncle Yu wanted to go to help however, Jean replied that only the little flower kitty would be enough. Karen was eager for her commander's orders. He gave her a little squeeze on her nose, saying she is very naughty. Karen thinks she looks very pretty in this uniform, and Jean Yi says he agrees, which makes the girl very embarrassed. He hands her something she can use to defend herself and asks if she knows how to use it. She says yes, so they set off on their mission. In the car, Karen wanted to know about the problem with Lan. 
Yangi then wanted to know why Karen hates the other students so much. She replies that she doesn't want those people near her and Chin Chin. She doesn't want to live near them or even see them from afar. Zhang Yi then says that he also doesn't like that kind of person, and soon they will stop bothering her. Our hero tells Karen that they will even let them into the base in case of an attack just to satisfy Liang. But before that happens, they must make Liang give up her desire to protect those people. Karen then says that Liang has such a soft heart that she could bring them into her refuge even against her will. He then says that things depend on her and Chin Chin now. Zhang Yi says that Liang has more love for the two of them than for those other students. Karen then excitedly asks if she and Chin Chin should capture Liang's heart. He says yes, if they make an effort, they will manage to take up all the space in their teacher's heart and dry out those students. They approach the factories and realize that a group of cars is ahead. He observes with his binoculars and sees cars adapted to drive in the snow with weapons on the roof. Karen is curious about what he saw and then observes with her own eyes. They underestimated the efficiency of the other bases. They are already in the vicinity exploring the resources that belong to the Excision base. He tried to analyze the situation, trying to confront them without knowing the danger they represent and who they are would be very dangerous. While he was thinking, Karen says that those are normal vehicles modified to drive in the snow, so their performance is very low. They can barely reach 20 kilometers per hour, and they consume five times more fuel than normal because of the weight. This information surprised our hero, and he questioned if what she was saying was true. She confirmed that it was, so Zhang Yi soon realized it is very difficult to get fuel in these times, and they came from so far with such bad cars because they are thirsty for fuel. Jen deduces that they must be from the Yangsheng base. Karen then questions why their base is very far from this place. Our hero then says that a fight may happen, so she should prepare herself. Zhang goes to the group of cars until he is noticed by the strangers. Karen must wait in the car, and then Zhang gets out with his hands up, affirming that he came in peace, saying that he was not a threat. The men did not attack, and then they saw the symbol on his uniform, they know is the symbol of the destroyed excision base. They ask among themselves how someone could have survived in that place. Furthermore, they say he has a nice uniform, so he must have a high rank. Another says that if he survived, it is because he has extraordinary power. He doesn't even seem scared in front of armed enemies. Because of this information, one of the men says that he should talk to the captain of the group when he returns. He can wait here. Zhang Ye agrees with this option. Soon he observes on the top of the warehouse that they entered through the roof, just as he does, descending by ropes from the ceiling. Then the supposed captain of this group appears. Zhang Yi immediately resumes that if this man is not a mutant, then he must be a very formidable person. Dear readers, the upcoming chapters are in Chinese, and I can't translate them quickly. If you leave many comments and likes on this video, I will make an effort to translate the new chapters directly from Chinese. I'm counting on you for more than 10,000 likes. A big hug from behind, and may everyone sleep warmly.